What's up guys? It's yo boy on this sensei. Welcome to the remastered version of What if I was reborn as White Hunter Smoker? Path to True Justice. Part 5. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. That day, after the live transmission of the situation in the impelled down was abruptly cut, the entire world fell into panic. What happened after? Did Smoker survive? What of the others the marine legends who decided to side with him? What happened? People enraged. That once again ones above were trying to hide the truth from them. They raised their weapons up and roared, until when must we be fooled by the world government? My five-year-old son just because the sound of his stomach growling reached the celestial dragon's ears. He was shot 16 times. The torches were lit aflame and held up, brightening up the night. Perhaps it was the sense of hope brought by the miraculous victory that Smoker brought against the seemingly invincible Blaze. They, with the previous helplessness nowhere to be found, united all together and brazenly charged at the castles, government-affiliated buildings, and many other wrongdoers with authority. Many world nobles will be forced to run, eventually settling in the tightly guarded Meriagewar. Many kingdoms will fall into that of anarchy. However, the civilians will be granted temporary peace and freedom rather than chaos, because what a day. There was Monkey D, Dragon and his self-proclaimed revolutionary army in the middle of all these uproars, ensuring that the civilians' hostility doesn't go to a self-destructive extent. I have never seen someone as insane as you, Smoker. To think father will be willing to side with you, Dragon, sitting at the intact wall of one ruined castle said as he sternly observed the Lelouja kingdom laid out all around him. Eventually, his eyes landed on one area that was inhibited by the current king of Lelouja, and the past traitor of the revolutionary army Siki. He, with countless spears impaled all over his body, was hollowly gazing at the thin air, dead. Dragon, back in the past, shouted at Garp, filled with immense disappointment at his father. And back then, Garp replied with a grim expression, so, you changed, father, along with many changes brought by him. In the end, Dragon came to smile. Deep in the sea, there was one strange-looking submarine with two propellers at the back seemingly made out of stones and bar-like metals was traveling through. It was quite large, and considering how the excessively heavy stones were by no means ideal for creating a submarine. And as such, its speed being astonishingly fast didn't make any sense. And inside this absurd submarine, she was found sitting and leaning against one wall hopelessly, desperately clinging to his life. In his sight, there were two people in prisoner's uniform. To think I'd be holding hands with the likes of you. First was Burndy World, the man of huge arms, comparatively thin legs, and a W-shaped moustache. And, shut your mouth, weakling, standing with an oppressive conqueror's haki was Douglas Bullet, glaring at World with a frown. World grimaced in response of how strong his observation haki perceived Bullet as. Bullet proceeded to speak. If not for your more and more fruit being needed to speed up this thing, I would have left you dead in that place. Bullet then grinned in a crazed manner, having the veins popped out of his forehead. He leaned in at World and said, Kahaha, that look of terror in you remember that feeling. The day you forget the fear will be the day of your death. World glared back at Bullet with all his might, however, was forced to retract as soon as he came to sight the latter's psychotic eyes. From the middle of the ongoing situation in the impelled down, Bullet, Shiyu, and well the three of them safely managed to get away to who knows where. In a dark room, Achoku was found looking at a messy chessboard filled with all the necessary pieces. The black pieces and white pieces were mixed all over the board, indicating that the game was ongoing. However, there was no one sitting across, and this man, humming in thought, moved a white knight taking one black pawn out. So far, everything has been going according to the plan, with the exclusion of the attempt to gain the op-op fruit. Garp's appearance back in the North Blue, and managing to cite Shiki it was one ridiculous coincidence, but a reality nonetheless. He gripped on one black rook and lifted it up, as expected. Kaidu that war maniac moved after receiving the information regarding Whitebeard. 
Kaidu's movement was then anonymously informed to Big Mom by us, and she personally traveled to Wano for the purpose of stealing the road poneglyph. Black Rook took down the White Knight. This way, even if Shaiki was also present, writing down a copy of said road poneglyph, Kaidu will likely attack Lin, Lin prior to Shaiki whose whereabouts will be unknown unlike her. Lifting one white pawn, Echoku moved it by one space. Meanwhile, while Lin, Lin is out, John is to invade the whole cake island and steal a copy of her road poneglyph. Though that category seems to have gotten quite strong from what I heard, it should be of no problem for him. Lin, Lin won't have time to process what exactly happened or track John down, for she'll be busy dealing with Kaidu. Then, Achoku looked at the Black Queen that hasn't moved a single space yet, coupled with the copy of the Road Poneglyph from Fishman Island, which I attained years ago. There only leaves one more for us to find, as well as a tool that can decipher the ancient language. He reached for the Black Queen, and slowly lifted it up. And speaking of ancient language, there was the Ahara incident, wasn't there? The Tree of Knowledge was burnt down, and the slip of information information that I managed to get is that of course, of course, he may have gained nothing, but I'm a curious man in that size of a brain. Just what kind of knowledge is he hiding? Within this dark, the Black Queen was laid two spaces away from the White King, putting the white side in check. Achoku grinned, and the new island egghead from what I heard is in the process of being constructed to conduct researches. That may be conflicting with one's ongoing and punk hazard. In the underworld, this man is known as the Enigmatic Id, the most influential broker among the criminals. In the East Blue, there lies a huge island that goes by the name Dawn. This island, harboring countless people ranging from average civilians, world nobles, vile criminals, and more, was Garp's hometown. Gold D. Roger. You mean Gold Roger? You asked if we know him. And here, in one hoodlum of the Dawn Island, stood one four-year-old boy. He, possessing the characteristics of black hair, similarly black-colored eyes, and freckles on his cheeks, was standing across many adults, ones who seemed to be full of dissatisfaction and anger for the world. Yes, of course we do. The so-called Pirate King. Oh, the filthy criminal who's been executed in front of the whole world, claiming that a stupid thing like One Piece exists. The boy listened with a plain expression on his face of how much hatred they had for the Pirate King. Do you not have any idea how much trouble pirates are causing around the whole world right now? All of that is Gold Roger's fault. Listen, all right. We'd all be better off if that man was never born. He's the worst kind of scum there ever can be. A pain in the ass when he was alive, and even more now that he's dead. If there is a child of his, that one better keep hiding forever and die early HMPH. Since the father didn't fully pay for his sin, the next generation must do so. A strange surge of anger rose in his heart. Hearing the negative words from the adults one by one, the plain expression on him slowly broke. Hum, what's that face for? What are you getting all mad for? Boy, the boy jumped, engaging himself in a feud against them all of a sudden. Ah, W-H-O the hell are you? Runt. As the blood spilled, sprinkling all over the boy as he threw punch after punch, pouring out all his anger, the voices from the past spoke in his mind being surrounded by the mountain bandits and other criminals learning vulgar words before all else, and coming to learn just how hated his biological and now deceased father was from the birth itself, the life has been a hell to this boy. After punching all over his surroundings without any rationality whatsoever, the boy came to stop, huffing rapidly. The adults, with multiple having fell down and few still standing, gritted their teeth and glared at the boy murderously. Finally, one man, whose nose is bleeding, charged and punched forth, freaking devil child. Died before his fist was casually caught by someone one who suddenly appeared in front of the boy, and shielded him from the hostile glares of the adults. A towering over the nose bleeding man with a height much taller. This white-haired man silently stared at the former lazily. Thud. Then, thud. 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 One by one, the adults all around suddenly fell unconscious sending the boy into a deep confusion. The lousy town abruptly became a silent and ghost-like toe, for no one was able to combat the unfathomable willpower of this mysterious white-haired man. And in this state, this man, in front of the boy, spoke, Is Goldie Roger a pirate? Yes, 
Did he commit wrongdoings that ultimately caused many to suffer? Yes, those are facts that can't be denied. However, the man then turned, meeting the boy's eyes with his hazel-colored ones. Child shouldn't be responsible for bearing all punishments that his father deserves. Anyone who curses upon an innocent child is a scum as malevolent as the pirate king himself. Hey, in the first place, you shouldn't be asking questions like that to these brain-dead fools. Leaning down, the man held his hand out at the boy, your ace, right? The boy, gulping in nervousness, took a step back and asked out of caution, W who are you? The man, not bothered by the boy's antics, chuckled, your gramps disciple. The name's Smoker. The boy, ace, frowned. So, you smoke? What? No. Then why introduce yourself as Smoker? My name's Smoker, and I don't smoke. So you're a non-smoker then? Yeah, and your name is Smoker. Okay, kid, can we get this over with? Smoker who doesn't smoke. What the hell that's like? Ugh, hey, kinda like that one dude whose name is Al, but gets drunk from one sip of ale. Or that other girl named Barbie, who tries to act like she's in 20s, but is in 60s in reality. Or you. That guy over there's peeing all of a sudden. What the hell? Disgusting. Ha, Smoker, grabbing Ace by the back of his shirt, lifted him up. With the previous anger and depression forgotten, Ace began to chatter all that he could think of, leaving Smoker to grumble as they casually walked away from the ghost-like hoodlum. So, where are we going? Then Ace asked, new home, and Smoker replied. Why? Long story short, your gramps and I are wanted now. What? Four years later, May 11th, 1510 fuck. Sitting in the office of Fleet Admiral, one that previously belonged to Sengoku, was Sakazuki, cursing in distress. In front of him, there was a mountain of paperwork, all of which being the urgent reports sent from all around the world. 34th branch partially destroyed by the assault from the Amagus pirates. Estimated time of restoration is anticipated to take long, and will require two, Big Mom and Kaidu clash for the 154th time in the Lala Island. As many civilians as possible were evacuated, but at least thousands were calculated to have been caught in the crossfire. Fuck. Fuck. Fucking fuck fuck. Fuck this shit. Sakazuki, usually the man of cold and calm demeanor, was currently losing his mind. And sitting at some distance away was Borsalino, relaxing in his seat and watching Sakazuki's endeavor with amusement. How S-C-A-R-Y told her then, Borsalino's eyes, drifting away from Sakazuki, landed on one bounty poster attached on one wall, White Hunter Smoker. Wanted dead or alive. 3 billion 700 million Beely. Hum, till the shrugging, Borsalino then proceeded to take a sip from a cup full of coffee, seemingly unbothered. The past four years, since the traitor's successful escape, the world's been in a turmoil. Even more, after the shocking raid of Marriage by one fish man named Fisher Tiger, and subsequent establishment of the Sun Pirates, the nervousness among the celestial dragons and distrust in Marine has consistently been rising. Smoker, now branded as one of the world's worst criminals, was amusingly hailed by the public as a hero, with him having disclosed the true face of the world government. Though the world government still stands, the tide of the world began to flow in a strange direction way, in which no one is able to predict what will be happening next. However, did Borsalino care? The answer was no, because he got a pay raise last M-O-N-T-H till the 24 years ago. From the current year 1510, a world shocking incident occurred. Zahahaha. Burn, filthy cattles. There is no place for you in my new world. The pirate whose strength seemed to have no bound. One who was daring to take over the world and rule it as its sole king. Behemoth Rocks D. Zebek. Wanted dead or alive for 5,353,000,000 Beely. With Whitebeard Edward Newgate, Golden Lion Shiki, Big Mom Charlotte Linlin, Beast Kaidu, Captain John, Strategist Achoku, and many more of notable strengths in his crew. He was perceived as the doom of the world. This man, abruptly showing up in God Valley and non-world government affiliated kingdom situated in West Blue began to wreak havoc for the purpose of attaining the treasures under the grasps of celestial dragons. Roger, show yourself and on that day, Monkey D. Gart was present, roaring in enthusiasm. Today's the day that you're going down. Gar, get out of my way. Gart, I'm here to see Zebek, not you. 
And also, there was the man who will be hailed as the king of the pirates, Goldie Roger. Don't interrupt Roger, Garp. The vice captain of the Roger pirates, Rayleigh, frowned as he unsheathed his sword. I'll be your opponent if you dare to come in his way. Wahahaha. Be gentle to him, K. Rayleigh. Laughed Roger as he excitedly ran past them, much to Garp's annoyance. Be gentle my ass roared Garp. On this day, the marine, joining hands with Roger pirates, miraculously defeated the rocks pirates. With Zebek's defeat, the crew dissociated into numerous pieces, spreading throughout every corner of the unexplored new world. God Valley, in the end, was erased from the surface of the world, and the prideful celestial dragons who joined the human hunting game in this God Valley had to retreat in panic. And as they did so, many slaves caught pirates, and many more were brought along including a two-year-old boy slave who was alone since his birth. And there only lied more suffering ahead for this boy. Ha ha ha. Look how ugly you are, boy. That brand mark on your head hair, it fits you well. A young boy slave with no name how poor. Well, not my concern T-H-O-U-G-H tilde. Give me that bread it's mine, you filthy child from all around. There was hostility only. Surrounded by them since his birth, the boy learned from the overflowing negative emotions of what a cold and harsh place this world was. Teach. You want to learn. Ha 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 ha. Listen. Education is a privilege in its own right. An idiotic and useless slave like you only deserves the brain of a calf. Therefore, he taught himself. Name. Name things I don't have a name he wished to learn. He wished to know more. He named himself as the word that resonated with him the best teach. One day, this boy named Teach accidentally dropped a stack of plates that he was supposed to carry. It was by no means a task meant for a small and malnourished child like him. But nonetheless, the celestial dragons only expressed anger, useless slave. Throw it in the dungeon and let it rot till its death. Roughly handled by the burly adults, Teach was thrown into a dark, underground dungeon that he's never seen throughout his life in Marijua. There was no food, no water, no warmth, no item for use. The only thing that Teach could do was to crouch and preserve his heat as much as he could waiting for a slow, agonizing death. Z ha ha ha, how long has it been since I got? A visitor then, a hoarse voice from his back. Teach slowly turned, finding his body shaking in front of the embodiment of immense willpower. With his eyes having adjusted to the dark, he came to see man. Of horrifying and monster-like appearance, with multiple knives stabbed through his bald skull with the skin missing on his face revealing the red layer of muscles underneath, and with his body, where all four limbs were severed, being fully coiled by bloody chains of sea stone. What's your name kiddo somehow still alive in this state? The man mumbled. Teach, filled with the fear for the man, found himself answering, T Teach. Teach the man grinned, what a fine name it is ha. Huh? Huff, huff dark in the night, Teach found himself breathing rapidly as he massaged his temple. Huff, huff. Currently sitting on the crow's nest of his ship, Saber of Zebek, he lifted up his free right hand and found a bottle of liquor in it. Zeha ha ha, it was a close one. Teach, wiping the sweat on him, laughed weakly. I almost let you loose there. Teach, so you still haven't given up yet, have you? Why was Marshal D. Teach able to convince Shaiki, Achoku, and John? Why was this no-name fellow able to gain the support of powerhouses once? Who were objectively stronger than this man back then? The answer was simple. Back then, when you were thrown into the dungeon I was in bliss. After barely surviving through years with the slightest drops of water from the ceiling, and the maximum operation of Seimei Kaiken, I was standing in the path of agonizing and inevitable death. Back then, if celestial dragons didn't make a mistake as idiotic as letting you within my presence, I wouldn't have attained this second chance. Dark dark fruit absorbs anything in its path. And funnily enough, it is capable of doing the exact opposite, expelling anything that it has absorbed including a human soul. That's right, rocks D. Zebek he, momentarily overcoming the effect of sea stone with his devilish will pushed his soul into Teacher's consciousness. In the process of doing so, his soul settled in Teacher's body, and with his body having physically died, the dark dark fruit was no more at his disposal. Then, through the operation of Conqueror's Haki, 
Zebek's been suppressing the original teacher's will. If he were to sleep, the latter's consciousness would resurface, which may give rise to many complications. The existence of two souls in one body induced many abnormal shifts in the growth of this body. And this man, teach and at the same time, Zebek chuckled as he placed his hand over his chest, vanishing twin syndrome. Upon the inspection, I came to learn of how you've been a killer in your own right, killing your very own brother in your mother's womb and engulfing his heart for your greed. You've taken over the soul of your brother and I did exactly the same to you. Oh. The irony perhaps it was meant to be this way. Teach. Finishing the bottle of liquor, Teach threw it away into the sea. Standing up from the crow's nest, he gazed at the crescent moon ahead of him. Regardless, stay happy, boy. After all, your body will soon be hailed as the one and sole god of the world. And the omniscience that you wished for shall also be attained. Dark in the night, the ship continued to sail to who knows where. Zahahaha. From the start to the end, the story of one individual named Teach was that of tragedy. May 13th, 1510. This was the day in which the nomad city of Century Island, located in Paradise, was abruptly invaded by the recently rising nightshade pirates. Kill all men. Capture all women and children. If you see anything of worth, take it. Their captain, Nightshade Remian, was the super rookie whose bounty reached 250 million Beely. Marines and pirates clashed against one another. Rounds of gunshots flew back and forth, blood sprayed all around, and corpses helplessly fell one after the other. The noises of metals clanging against one another filled the battlefield and the weak civilians. All that they could do here was to run or hide, praying that pirates wouldn't find them. The world government took everything away from us one civilian. Having given up, Hololi stared at the trembling bodies of his family, and pirates you've dealt a finishing blow. Slowly, the tears fell out of the man's bloodshot eyes. W what what the hell of a world that we're living in click. The man halted his breathing as someone pointed a pistol right at his head. Shifting his shaky eyes to the side, he saw one dangerous looking pirate with spiky blonde hair and sharp eyes returning the man's gaze with one filled with perversion. E dandy lock the bullseye the man said with a pale expression and in return, the pirate grinned widely. Blood kill or be killed. Bang. Damn you in the middle of this disarray battlefield, Maynard, wearing a white justice coat that was stained by blood, was on his knees, with his hands clenching onto a katana sword that had its blade embedded in the ground. His body, suffering numerous cuts and wounds all over, clearly wasn't in a condition to continue the fight. In contrast, Remyan, standing in a calm and collected state, lifted up a handkerchief to wipe a sprinkle of blood on his cheek. He, being the man of long and straight purple hair that reached all the way to his waist, adjusted the round glasses laid on top of his sharp nose. Vice Admiral Maynard, so I heard that you've been chasing after us for months, said Remyan, and I must comment of what a disappointment you are. Nightshade, Maynard struggled to stand back up, but to no avail. I, Huff, I haven't lost yet. So do you dare get cocky in front of me? Shut his mouth, leg day. Clang, clang. One bald man of gigantic size aside Remyan, Armstrong leg day the vice captain of Nightshade Pirates, clashed his metallic gauntlets against one another. With a deep frown on his face, he walked toward Maynard for the purpose of following his captain's command. Huh, leg day let out a faint growl. No hard feelings, fella. ECH. Maynard's face darkened, knowing that he simply wasn't strong enough. No matter how much he tried to exert his strength, his body didn't budge no. His will simply wasn't strong enough. After all, what was he currently fighting for? After contemplating the meaningless deaths of his colleagues, what he managed to reach wasn't that of a determination, but rather, a resignation instead. Having given up his free will to the oppressive world government, he's become their mindless pawn. Even today, his purpose wasn't to save those in need of help, but to carry out the order from the above. Leg Day's shadow loomed over Maynard. The former raised his right gauntlet up, intending to inflict a strong down blow onto the latter. Maynard, at this moment, closed his eyes helplessly. The civilians who were looking at him in hopes felt a wave of despair rushing over them. A pitiful life and now a pitiful death. The only thing I can grant you, Leg Day said sternly, is one without a pain. Then the gauntlet descended. Few marines, realizing what was about to happen to Maynard, shouted which quickly became muffled. Clang. However, the blow didn't come. 
Instead, the noise of heavy collision was heard from Maynard's above. He, slowly opening his eyes in confusion, raised his head up and saw, long time no see, Maynard Dara. Bastille, his former colleague, blocking Leg Day's gauntlet with his bare hand. With the metallic mask over his face and a huge greatsword on his shoulder, he stood at a height even greater than that of Leg Day's. B. Bastille Maynard whispered with a cold sweat. What, what are you doing here? Boom. Ugh, and just then, Dandelok, with his arms crossed, was found to be blasted back from one side of the battlefield. He, with a grimace, observed the deep bruises on his forearms. Ha, you got Hina's suit dirty. As the smoke cleared, Hina, wearing a clean red suit over her, was standing in front of the cowering civilians. Crackling her knuckles, she casually approached the nervous-filled Dandelok. They kill her the pirates, seeing as how Hina ignored their existence and walked toward the troubled Dandelok, kicked marines away and launched themselves at her boom. Dash only for her to counter them with her iron hard punches, causing others' eyes to pop out in shock. Rimyan, standing in the middle of this development, adjusted his glasses in silence. Then, he spoke, Black Cage Hina and Steel Mask Bastille. Why are the traitors of Marine helping their foes? I wonder. Foes? Hina raised her eyebrow. Who decided that? The public, the world government, or whoever it may be. Choose your favorite. Rimyan's shadow. Having extended out from his feet, suddenly morphed and expanded into the abnormal size. Rising up from the ground and manifesting into a physical entity, it stared at Hina and Bastille with maliciousness one, in which none among the two were phased of. Sadly, I've long finished my deduction. Rimyan then stated, If your strengths amount to that of Maynard over there, then even the three of you aren't capable of taking me down. Then, Maynard scowled. He whispered, He's here, isn't he? It wasn't Rimyan's words that got Maynard emotional, it seemed. As Rimyan narrowed his eyes, wondering who he may be, Bastille answered, yes, he is. Plop. Rain. Leg Day raised his head up and saw that the sky was gloomy. One by one, the rain began to drop onto the battlefield. One that brought many to a surprise. Hey, one muttered, wasn't it sunny just minutes ago? He. Rimyan mumbled, who may this man be plop plop plop? The light rain poured down to the ground. Feeling confused about the weather's abrupt behavior, Rimyan's eyes slowly narrowed bar bump. All of a sudden, Rimyan found his heart stopping from the wave of invisible force one that completely engulfed his fragile mind and filled it with fear. Welcome to the Grand Line, rookie, said Hina as she placed her hands in her pockets and turned around, knowing that the battle was already over, in goodbye. This is where your vile adventure ends. One white-haired man, wearing a casual green jacket and navy jean, walked across the still crowd. Uug, splash. What even is splash? Splash. As he walked through them, the pirates fell down to the wet ground without any resistance, with their eyes completely hollowed out. Splash! And Leg Day and Dandelok was of no exception. Their bodies stiffened up before falling face first on the drenched ground. Are you what Leg Day? Dandelok. The physical form of shadow behind Rimyan, reflecting his state of mind, retracted back into its original self, as if afraid of something. He, unable to process what was going on, called out the names of his unconscious crewmates thought, that had no effect on them. Hey, this man, one who looked calm just a moment ago, was now akin to a child looking at his worst nightmare. At this moment, Maynard muttered, Smoker, you look awful, Maynard. Smoker, walking past Maynard, Hina, and Bastille, stood right in front of the petrified Rimyan impassively. Then, without any further words, swept his hand horizontally. Swoosh. Instantly severing the criminal's head in one go. Splash. As Rumian's severed head fell with a splash and rolled to Maynard's front, Maynard's body shook in humiliation. Gritting his teeth, he shouted, Why are you here, Smoker? That's none of your business. Smoker, not even bothering to face Maynard for once, then continued walking, leaving Maynard dumbfounded. Hina, silently glancing at Maynard and sighing, then turned and proceeded to follow Smoker. Until next time, Buddy Dara. Bastille, leaving one statement for Maynard, chased after the two. The Marines, witnessing the march of three individuals away from the resolved scenery, couldn't do anything but shiver. Smoker in this state, Maynard screamed, Wait there, White Hunter. I'll arrest you in 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 the name of Justice Splash. Maynard, ending up falling on his back, 
Hololi looked at the sky that began to clear up. Damn it, he didn't know anymore. He simply whispered once again, There you are, saving thousands lives as if it's nothing creek. Meanwhile, Smoker, along with Hina and Bastille, entered one store in the city. Looking at the owner of the store who was curled up with his eyes shut tight, Smoker spoke up. Hey, owner. Ignoring the man's terrified state, Smoker ordered impassively. You got an eternal pose for the full shout island. Disastrous. To the five elders. Such a word was an adequate way of summarizing the events that occurred in the span of four years. Four years ago, the world met a disaster named White Hunter Smoker. Facing the transparent window with his hands held together behind his back was Saint Jagaisha Saturn, one of the five elders. Awakening the devil fruit of an equal standing as human human fruit model. Nika, we were ordered to eradicate the man and failed to do so. Reminiscing the horrendous event, Saint Athambran v. Nasturo, the man with bald hair and round glasses, grimaced. It did and still invokes the emotion of guilt and shame in me. To fail Imusama's absolute decree was one thing. But to have him revoke his order to save our lives, Saint Topman Valkyrie turned his head away from the Sturo, hiding his frustration from the rest. Saturn, after a short period of pause, stated, Ultimately, we brought this calamity upon our hands. White Hunter took the loyalties of numerous marines, and weakened the control that the world government has over the sea. Saint Marcus Mars directed his sharp eyes at the map of the world, one that lied in the middle of a grand table nearby. In four blues and paradise of the Grand Line, the number of criminal cases have been rising at an astounding pace as if Goldie Roger was killed for the second time. Coupled with the allocation of force to chase after White Hunter's group, the quality of protection for the civilians decreased even further. Although the problem isn't as imminent in harsh environment, creatures tend to decide against breeding. The trick up until now was to have those cattle believe that they were indeed living a peaceful life, however, one by one, they have begun going insane, said St. Jew Peter, as he placed his huge hands on the map. With his teeth gritted, Valkyrie snarled, rebellious dragon monkey D-Dragon, expanding his influence throughout the world as well as contributing in the revolts and the eventual falls of multiple government-affiliated kingdoms. It is due to him that this storm caused by White Hunter has been bulked up by many folds to an extent where the balance of the world was brought to the verge of its decimation. Well aware of how detrimental the current circumstance was, Saturn closed his eyes tight. Then, he sighed, and what of the new world? The whereabouts of Douglas Bullet is unknown. Our latest report indicated that Whitebeard appeared abruptly ill, and that his influence over the sea has been reduced which brought forth the negative impact upon the stability. With Big Mom and Kaido continuing the self-destructive war against one another for years, their controls over territories too have been weakening. The three catastrophes, overall, were notably weakened just as us. Subsequently, at the end of his words, Saturn's voice trembled. Pausing for a brief moment, he finally resumed speaking, strategist Achoku. It was confirmed that Caesar's sudden disappearance in Punk Hazard was his doing that he managed to coax the scientist to leave the R order to work for him. Slowly, this man, he took over the lands that the three catastrophes lost the control of. And when looking at how much he's grown the title of fourth catastrophe, may no longer be an exaggeration. The sea was changing. The old system of marine and world government versus three catastrophes was slowly collapsing. And in return, the revolutionary army and those speculated to be a Chocupiritus were rising at a rapid pace. However, even such matters aren't of our primary concern currently. Saturn, as he opened his eyes back up, he was met with the busily moving scene of Marriagewar. Unlike its usually glorious state, the current holy land was in process of reparation, with seemingly exhausted slaves carrying over the heavy-looking stones and other objects over their shoulders. A year ago one fish man invaded our land. In a span of five minutes, he freed the entire slaves and smoothly escaped as if he knew the ins and outs of our system. Thinking of said event, Saturn's eyes flashed dangerously. Afterwards, he formed the accursed sun pirates hiding the brand, with that hideous attempt to mimic the appearance of the sun. Turning and looking at Valkyrie, Saturn asked, What does Sakazuki say regarding the whereabouts of the sun pirates? 
Shifting his eyes, Valkyrie looked at one silent Den Den Mushi that sat by. The found evidences indicated that the Sun Pirates have been chasing after the traces of White Hunter. And from the report that Sakazuki gave us, White Hunter was last found in Century Island a week ago, in order to attain the eternal pose of Full Shout Island. Full Shout. Ma's eyes narrowed, and Valkyrie said in response, Borsalino and Tensei two of the three admirals were swiftly dispatched. Although White Hunter once defeated Blaze, he won't be capable of facing two by himself. In the end, both White Hunter and some pirates will meet their end. Saturn seemed unconvinced, frowning in concern as he said, What of Tokakik? Valkyrie shook his head away with the case of Revolutionary Army. Two Saturns frown deepened, before speaking, immediately dispatched the available CP0 members as reinforcements. Justice is flawed. Such was the conclusion that I reached years ago. But then, what about the righteousness? Let's say that one one side pirates are attacking thousands of strangers. On another, your acquaintances are on a verge of getting dying by the hands of world government. In this situation, you don't have adequate strength to save both. Huffing in front of me with her arms crossed was Hina, asking a question with seriousness written on her face. This thought has been harvesting in Hina's head for a while. To you who seeks for the righteousness, any choice in this case will equal to going against your ideal. Tell Hina, smoker, of what choice you will make here. Righteousness. This word was the term that I strictly adhered to over the years. I was busily sailing here and there, making decisions and doing what I could do to better the daily lives of many people. While doing so, I came to realize that righteousness was far too perfect for an imperfect human like me to follow. This year, I turned 22 while you turned 20. And as time passed on, I learned many things. Relaxing in a comfortable wooden chair, I said thoughtfully, Though I seek for righteousness, I myself am not really a good man. I am well aware that at some instances, my acts of killing may have been excessive and vile. Rocking back and forth in the chair, I then broke a chuckle. Hina raised her eyebrow as I continued to an extent. I deduce that righteousness may not be the most accurate word to represent my mindset. So I thought, thought more, and had some chats with old peeps up there right now. Directing my eyes away from Hina, I saw Bastille taking care of the ever wild cola. She, seeming very excited to be reunited with her family, laughed as she ran all around the deck which caused the huge man to sweat drop. Absolute justice sucks. Thorough justice is stupid. Unclear justice what the hell is that even? Lazy justice can that even be considered a justice? And burning justice eh? That's so Kuzan, alright? Hina squinted her eyes at me. What's with you listing and dissing them all of a sudden? I simply grinned back while spreading my arms out wide. Nothing is absolute in this world. In other words, if I'm not some saint whose existence alone screams righteousness, I may as well change the definition of justice as I see fit. Ah, uh, what? So I decided on a cooler name. From today on, say hi to the embracing justice one that admits that a human being can never fully be right. Hina confused. Hina deadpanned. Hina asked you one question, and all of a sudden you say this stuff. Just tell Hina the answer, smoker. Stoic as always. Huh? Standing up and staring at the far horizon where the distant island has become viewable by sight I muttered, Fine, here's my answer to your question. Sorry to the thousands, but I'm going to save my acquaintances first. And what's your reasoning behind that? Because, splash. Just then, the shaking of the ship intensified as one gigantic sea king revealed itself from the side. With its sharp fangs revealed, it hungrily glared at the ship containing the four of us. With my hands stuffed in my pockets, I casually stared back at the Sea King. Slightly irked, A-A-W-W-W-R, fuck off. Boom. One burst of Conqueror's Haki, and the Sea King collapsed back into the water with a magnificent splash while foaming at its mouth. Rubbing the back of my head lazily right after, I turned back and looked at Hina, because saving those close to me is a more right thing to do. Hina is more confused now, but smiling in the end, Hina replied, fair enough. Then, hey, the island's on sight Dara. Standing on the deck of the shaky ship, Bastille cried with binoculars held in front of his eyes. Hina and I both rolled our eyes, duh. It was time to get a feel of Kola's hometown, I suppose. It's been a while, Neptune San. In the majestic Ryugu Palace of the Fishman Island, those bearing a Jolly Roger amicably mingled with the merfolks. 
In contrast to most of the hostile pirates who went through this island with malevolency, this pirate crew in particular seemed to be friends, ones with jovial emotions upon encountering fellow humans. On the majestic throne, there sat one gigantic merman who had a golden crown atop his head. Further characterized by bountiful orange hair and a similarly colored beard, this man the king of the Fishman Island went by the name Neptune. Raising up the glass of ale as a sign of respect, Neptune spoke, When I close my eyes, I still see Roger's crew partying with us like there was no tomorrow. And today, here you are, standing proud as a full-grown adult who follows his former captain's footsteps shanks. Across Neptune, one red-haired young man with a straw hat grinned, raising up a huge plate filled with the same kind of ale. He drained the entire thing down like nothing. Red hair shanks, wanted dead or alive. 200 million Beely. Though he was considered a super rookie in the past, as time passed by and his absence in the Blue Sea continued, he was slowly forgotten among the people, especially considering how much the sea changed over the years. Such a phenomenon was of no surprise. Man, it sure feels weird to think how I was drinking from up there just a month ago. Gently placing the plate down, Shanks remarked, shifting his eyes at one huge silhouette behind a pillar. He smiled gently, and that must be Neptune. Directing his eyes at where Shanks' gaze headed, called out softly, Shirahoshi, why don't you meet our guests? From behind a pillar, one pink-haired girl, Shirahoshi, poked her face out. Right after, she retracted herself, nervous to comply with her father's words. She surely is a shy one. Commenting, Shanks thanked a mermaid who refilled his plate before coarsely lifting it up once more. I are you a Shirahoshi? Taking a few steps out to reveal her abnormally huge form, whimpered timidly. Amused by her antics, Shanks laughed, Dahahaha. Though this laugh wasn't out of mockery for this poor girl, but rather out of nostalgia from reminiscing his deceased captain in the past. Oh, how desperate he was to hear the answer that he wanted. But the only response he got from his captain during that day was him personally passing down his straw hat to Shanks. That day, Shanks learned that one piece cannot solve everything. It was not a perfect key to all the problems that existed in this world. And upon the realization, he wondered be it too early or not, what really was the point of going for it then? Buggy, I sometimes wish that my perspective was as simplistic as yours. Thriving to become rich and famous how enjoyable the life must be that way. Or, Yuta, come say hi to a friend over here, in Ryugu Kingdom. Shanks continued to enjoy his momentary peace. But little did he know that this peace was not going to last for a long time. Taking a first step onto the grassy land of Foreshout Island, Cola gulped. Hesitant and nervous, she was filled with the irony of receiving that of familiarity and unfamiliarity at the same time. The small caravel ship one in which we used to travel was floating next to the shore of the island. Smoker, sitting by the rail of it, said with his eyes locked onto Cola's back, Say hi to your home. Cola nodded slowly, MHM. Leaving the ship, Smoker, along with Cola, Hina, and Bastille, walked across the grassy plain in silence. Cola ran across the vast field, feeling the cool breeze that swept across the island. Cola, Hina asked, Do you still remember your life on this island? Cola replied brightly, Yeah. Pointing at one huge cactus, she said, Oh, that's Mr. Cactus. In the middle, there was a hole where one boy was keeping all his stashed beely in a. Running up to said cactus, she grabbed one particular needle and pulled it back. However, much to her devastation, the needle didn't budge, indicating that there wasn't a hole as she claimed. Come on, K-O-A-L-A tilde. Grinning from the back, Bastille said casually, Mr. Cactus is that pet plant that Luffy and Ace have been growing up there, remember Dara? Cola perked up in realization, A-R. Hina, turning to look at Smoker, sweat dropped. Chuckling, he looked back at her and shrugged. Continuing the walk, they eventually came to see one small town that lied right in the middle of this grassy plain. The buildings were poorly built, but the civilians in contrast, seemed to be healthy and well-fed presumably, thanks to the abundance of these enormous cacti all around. A cola. Standing at the front of the crowd was one orange-haired woman of short height. Judging by her nuance of it, and reflecting on his manga knowledge from a long time ago, Smoker assumed that that woman was Cola's biological mother. Cola, 
Cola froze on her spot. Her eyes widened before her body shivered upon remembering that she had a mother she was taken away from years ago. Mom. Whispering, Cola hesitantly took one step, then stopped. Turning her head, she then looked at Smoker as if asking for approval. Go, Cola, Smoker said with a smile. And that was enough for her to begin sprinting. The family reunited after years of separation. Though they were away for a long period of time, there wasn't a sense of awkwardness between the two. What? If, Hina asked in a serious manner, what if the world government tries to interrogate Kola for the information? Hina can no longer trust them by even a single bit. For the past four years, they've conducted many gruesome methods to gain insight into our whereabouts. When Hina also thinks of how Kola almost became a slave, it doesn't feel right to leave Kola here without speaking a word, Smoker smiled knowingly. Hina, looking right into my eyes, came to widen hers in realization. Have you seen into the future, Smoker? Guess you can say that shifting my eyes. I gazed at my back through the corner of my eyes looking at the path we've walked through. The steel, frowning lightly in a questioning manner, asked, what's happening over there, Daraboom? The steel's statement was cut with the sudden flash of light, one that was followed by the noise of an explosion. Light must be the Admiral Borsalino, muttered Hina. The steel laughed Dara Dara Dara. It's funny how everyone chases after you these days, Smoker. Two, Smoker stated gleefully, success, I suppose. The villagers, along with Kola, seemed shaken by the sudden phenomenon. Without turning to look at them, Smoker said to Hina and Bastille, stay here and make sure that Kola remains safe, won't you? Yes, S.I.R. Tilda said Hina, jokingly. The steel laughed once more lightly, to which Smoker reciprocated with a chuckle of his own. Then, Smoker disappeared from their sight in silence, as if he was a ghost. Marines standing on top of one pirate ship that swayed on top of the violent current of the sea. A sore-nosed fishman on top of the ship's deck growled, Damn it. I told you that it's not worth going after that human, be it Queen Atovam's request or not. Shut your mouth, Alom. Grimacing next to this sore-nosed fishman, Along was Jim, with his entire body tensed up, and his eyes headed up at the sky. On the sky, there stood one admiral whose justice coat fluttered against the wind. Casual and unfazed, he, Borsalino or Kazaru, was found biting on a cigar. From a distance, numerous marine ships were found lined up, pointing their loaded cannons at the pirate ship. Hum, Borsalino, scratching his chin in thought, looked at the nearby Foreshaw Island on his sight. There sat a casual expression on his face, but a drip of cold sweat advocated that his mind wasn't at ease. Clang. Grah. Simultaneously, on top of the churning sea, a large saber clashed against a katana. The wielder of the saber, the pink-skinned sea bream fish man, was knocked back from it. His strength was clearly lacking in comparison to his foe. This fish man was Fisher Targa, the leader and captain of the Sun Pirates. Unexpected by this grim development of circumstance, Fisher Tiger was gritting his teeth as he continuously clashed his saber against the wielder of the katana, Admiral Kurama or Tensei. Rankyaku. Clang. Barely reacting to Tensei's speed, Fisher Tiger was knocked back once more, skidding across the body of water before sinking into it. Splash. Brother T. Jin, calling out Fisher Tiger in panic, jumped out of the ship, attempting to come to Fisher Tiger's aid. However, Ah, uh, can't let you do that. Borsalino, flashing right above Jim with his hands in his pocket, landed a clean kick onto the latter's cheek. Boom. The deck was destroyed as Jim was blasted right onto it, causing many other members of Sun Pirates to lose their balance and fall down helplessly. Jim, you idiot Arlong barked. What are you doing? Getting yourself handled like that to the inferior trash inferior. Borsalino, acting surprised, pointed a finger at himself. Are you referring to me? Huff huff. On the other hand, Fisher Tiger was found to have made his way out of the water. Glaring at Tensei he calmly flicked his katana. I don't believe it, said Tensei as he adjusted his sunglasses. How did someone as weak as you manage to infiltrate Meriajwa? Are you perhaps hiding your full strength, or that? Lowering his face, Tensei's eyes underneath the sunglasses. Met Fisher Tiger's own. There perhaps was an involvement from the Revolutionary Army clan. Not giving Tensei the time to finish his words, Fisher Tiger brazenly slammed his blade against the former. Splash. The water erupted as Fisher Tiger slammed his right foot. His cheek bellowed, before the dense stream of water burst out of his mouth, engulfing Tensei's form in an instant. Fishman Karate. There, 
Fisher Tiger dropped his saber and punched his right fist forth, 5,000 brick fist bomb. The mix of water and gust of air dominated the area ahead of Fisher Tiger's outstretched fist, generating a gigantic effect that raised the pride in the minds of some pirates. However, they then saw, I suppose that the interrogation can come later. For now, Tensei appearing right behind Fisher Tiger, attempting to slash his armament Haki imbued katana through the latter's exposed back. Fisher Tiger's eyes widened, but it was far too late to react by then. You'll need to fall asleep, pirate. The sound of a steel tearing through the flesh didn't come by. Tensei's blade didn't manage to reach its target. Under the whooshing noises of wind and rushing waves of sea, the blade was stopped by the white-haired man's index finger, one who was suddenly found standing between Tensei and Fisher Tiger. I'd appreciate if you don't. This man, Smoker, spoke. Tensei, Grimacing, immediately retracted his katana and took a few steps back. You're as scary as ever, S-M-O-K-E-R tilde, and right by Smoker's side, Borsalino was present with his extended index finger lightened up, ready to fire at Smoker's temple at any moment. Fisher Tiger, sweating profusely, mumbled, White Hunter. It's the first time we're seeing face to face, if I'm not wrong. But unfortunately, there's no time for us to chit chat. Smoker pointed his thumb at numerous marine ships. Go help your crew out in dealing with them. Tensei frowned. If you think we're going to let him go, you're mistaken. Tensei couldn't continue his words, suddenly oppressed by the silent yet dense oppression of Conqueror's Haki. With goosebumps over his skin, his grip on his katana tightened, and Smoker said in this state, how did this trash become an admiral, Borsalino-san? Swoosh. Tilting his head, Smoker dodged point-blank range of Borsalino's laser beam without trouble. Borsalino, lowering his hand, scratched his cheek. Eh, that wasn't nice, you know. Boom. The light flashed as it blasted onto the water, giving rise to a massive volume of steam, along with the blasting noise. Smoker, briefly staring at that, said eventually, Hey, I don't think you're being any nicer. As the sea wildly churned, splashing over the feet of one former vice admiral and two admirals, Fisher Tiger slowly rolled his eyes to the side. In this intense atmosphere, he's seen that the cannons would be fired from the marine warships at any second. Though Jim was a capable fellow, he alone wouldn't be enough to deal with all those by himself, Fisher Tiger had to admit Smoker was right. Splash. Giving a silent nod of gratitude to Smoker, Fisher Tiger immediately dove into the water. Tensei, flinching and frowning upon sighting Fisher Tiger's disappearance, briefly locked his eyes with Borsalino, before attempting to chase after the latter. You aren't going anywhere, Tensei. Smoker, in a relaxed position and unfazed by Borsalino's finger that began to brighten up yet again, casually said to the black suit wearing admiral. Tensei, as if the fear itself had been engraved in his soul, became stiff. Oh, are you sure about that? Borsalino raised his eyebrow questioningly, to which Smoker muttered, want to test it out. Swoosh. Tensei, gritting his teeth, blasted himself toward Fisher Tiger who resurfaced on the ocean, combining Geppo with Soru. The former was rapidly closing the gap with the fish man who was running on top of the ocean boom. Tensei was forced to shield his face for a brilliant explosion of smoke, and light occurred right in front of him. As the vision returned to him, he saw that Smoker was guarding Borsalino's kick with his hand. Smoker dryly remarked, You really are fast. Huh? At the next moment, Borsalino was found at a far distance away from the site, having traveled at the speed of light. Smoker, not having moved a step, watched as Borsalino's form glowed in a bright yellow. Yasakani Sacred Jewel. Holding his hands up such that his thumbs and indexes formed O shapes, Borsalino blasted numerous beams of light that rapidly flew towards Smoker. In such a process, his own form dispersed into pieces of light that were immersed in this frightening wave of light rain. Borsalino Tensei, still standing at the back, mumbled with a cold sweat, how am I supposed to get past when you throw in stuffs like this? Smoker, with his eyes gazing at the beams of light, had his right palm facing the sea below. Black wave. In an instant, the huge volume of black smoke swelled out of his palm, thinly spreading over the surface of the churning ocean. Then, the ignition of said smoke mingled with the body of water and produced a sufficient amount of white steam. ESSS. Simultaneously, each beam of light, phasing through the rising volume of steam, transformed into a hundreds of smokers' own clones, made out of white steam, revealed themselves and intercepted the incoming attacks. Transmutation. Black. Then, upon smokers' will, 
His clones suddenly inflated abnormally, boom, before all of them simultaneously exploded in a magnificent manner, taking Borsalino's clones along with them. Grey smoke arose from the explosions, mingling with the steam that was generated from the heat of the explosion, and enveloping the area of collision between Smoker and Borsalino. Bizarrely, this cloud of smoke and steam began to close in, as if trying to grasp onto something. Subsequently, there was a bright light that burst out from the cloud of smoke and steam, effectively dispelling them away. Then, it became visible in Tensei's sight, boom. Smoker clashing Borsalino's light made sword with his smoke made club. Order the marines to retreat and leave, said Smoker in a serious manner. This isn't where your efforts should be wasted. The lives lost here right now will simply be the meaningless ones. What is it that drives you forward, Smoker? Smoker found his eyes narrowing as Borsalino's eyes gleamed beyond his sunglasses. You claim that the Marine's justice is flawed, that the world government is in the wrong. However, just as you once said before, this world is ambiguous. This world is grey, dictated by the strongest among all. In comparison to us, are you able to call yourself one who disrupted the balance of the world and invoked the second surge of pirates, the Righteous One. Boom, boom, boom. Smoker and Borsalino's forms flickered from one area to another, causing various explosions that brought forth wild eruptions of water. Fire. Then, the voice from one of the Vice Admirals standing on the Marine warships. The cannonballs filled the sky, and Jimb, at the deck of the Sun Pirate's ship, readied himself with a grimace tap. At the next moment, Smoker was found right in front of Airborne Tensei, holding the latter's haki-imbued sword with his bare hand. He then tilted his head back, avoiding an arc of intense light that scorched through the air and brilliantly exploded. Borsalino, floating right above Smoker, then slammed a kick down at him, which he blocked by crossing his haki-imbued arms. Boom. There was the noise screeching throughout the air, but Smoker wasn't knocked back by a single step. Simultaneously, Borsalino was forced to retract his brightening up index finger, for it was pointing right at Tensei's forehead instead of Smoker's. In the end, Huff, you are nothing but a criminal full of excuses, snarled Tensei as he choked from Smoker's crushing grip on his neck, your violence is excessive, and you curd your ideal is maniacal. With bloodshot eyes, Tensei turned his head and glared at Smoker, where is the so-called morality in your actions? How come slavery isn't righteous, yet killing is fine? If you truly seek to correct the justice, why did you resort to such excessive means? Staring back at Tensei's eyes, Smoker frowned questioningly. What's wrong with killing the scums of the sea? They kill, steal, rape, and genuinely feel pleasure in harming others. The world does better without them. Then, much to Borsalino and Tensei's surprise, he loosened his grip over Tensei's neck and eventually let go of it. And why must the innocents be enslaved by those monsters? You speak as if the savage animals are of equal standing as humans. What is it that you're trying to say? Tensei shouted, before holding his bruised neck with his powerless hands and huffing heavily. Smoker replied, that your words mean nothing, I suppose. In silence, Borsalino observed Smoker before his form flickered. Swoosh. The sword made out of scorching yellow light, cut through the air just after Smoker leaned back. In Borsalino's sight, it seemed as if Smoker's eyes gave off a faint red hue. Future sight. Swoosh, swoosh, swoosh. Borsalino's speed rapidly accelerated as he flashed back and forth all around Smoker, slashing and stabbing his light made sword numerous times in a split second. The sky was filled with countless rays of light that appeared lethal in the eyes of some pirates and marines down below. In Jet, Smoker was fluidly weaving around them like a ghost as if he was seeing into the future. Boom. Then, a punch right on Borsalino's cheek. Borsalino was put into a state of shock before he was sent flying through the air from the sheer pressure behind Smoker's fist. One sword style, Huff, Rankyaki, while Borsalino was briefly knocked away. Tensei, gritting his teeth, was found holding his sword sideways with both hands, before he pushed his feet against the empty air and dashed at Smoker, gallop of the pitch black horse. As Tensei swung his sword with all his might, the pitch black and haki imbued wave of gigantic size was blasted right towards Smoker, attempting to engulf and shred him apart. In this state, Smoker looked at his back through the corner of his eyes and found that Borsalino was pointing his index and middle fingers at him, Amaterasu. In the front, Tensei's sharp air wave 
At the back, Borsellino's potent burst of laser beam, standing sandwiched between the rapidly approaching attacks, Smoker clenched his fist and dashed at the approaching sharp wave, Black Blow, punching through the airwave and simultaneously opening a gap right on his chest, such that the beam of light passed through him without inflicting any harm. Smoker successfully defended himself against two attacks at once. Then, the vast volume of black smoke pushed its way out of his extended fist, and boom. Tensei and Borsalino, who immediately crossed their arms to shield their faces, were knocked away from the sight of the explosion. Swu dissipating his body into that of a bright yellow light, Borsalino evaded an incoming blast of white smoke on his way. Said blast left a trail of white smoke to which the numerous white snakes grew out of and began chasing after Borsalino. Swu. Borsalino grimaced as he realized that the sky was getting darker at a notable rate. Quickly flashing to a far distance away from the snakes of white smoke, Borsalino fired a huge beam of yellow light to erase them in an instance, and proceeded to look upward right after. This is beyond the sunglasses. Borsalino's eyes trembled, the same as back then Blaze was. How could he have forgotten? Blaze, the admiral whose strength was known to be equal to Sakazuki, was utterly defeated at the hands of the white-haired man above him. Borsalino? He did years of working as a corporate slave, dull out his ability to think. Swoo the sky, full of rumbling clouds, was swirling in an abnormal manner, placing every human below in that of fright. Right below those clouds was Smoker, holding the bleeding and defeated Tensei by the neck once again. This is the second time that I have you subdued, said Smoker as he glared at Tensei. How much more must I do for you to leave peacefully? Uug Tensei, groaning in pain and gasping for the air, wasn't in a condition to reply. Growling in frustration, Smoker threw the former down at the dumbfounded Borsalino. Swoo the swirling clouds began to condense, becoming a dense ball of crackling grey smoke right above his palm. As Borsalino caught Tensei and held the latter by his shoulder, Smoker stated, Since when have all of you stopped dreaming dreams that brought you to the ranks of Marine? What was it that made you become such subservient people? Borsalino couldn't speak anything as the dark skies suddenly became blue and sunny once more. Smoker sighed, more or less, I can't be bothered. But if you're one of those who accepted the world government's hypocrisy, tilting his hand, Smoker let the dense ball of grey smoke fall freely. Know that I won't give a damn to your talks of justice. Widening his eyes in a panic, Borsalino placed both his hands forward. His hands, glowing in an extremely intense light, readied themselves to retaliate against the incoming disaster PSSSHHH. Before said ball abruptly dispersed all across the sky without reaching Borsalino and Tensei. W hat. Borsalino mumbled to himself and Smoker said, Leave. If you have the time to chase after me, focus on helping those who call for your help. Borsalino's breathing stopped as Smoker's eyes exhibited a cold anger from within. There won't be a third time. For the first minute, Borsalino stood still, trying to process what Smoker said. Then, watching as Smoker descended towards the Sun Pirate's ship, he came to wipe a sweat on his forehead. Retreat. This mission is a failure. Finally, Borsalino spoke into the mini Den Den Mushi, and Tensei expressed his helplessness by clenching his fists tight. The Vice Admirals below, flabbergasted by Borsalino's order, were left speechless. What the fuck Arlong? Shocked by the battle that he just witnessed unconsciously cursed. It's been a while since I saw you smoking, commented Tensei as he gazed at Borsalino, who was sitting at the edge of one marine warship, while by it was a bizarre scene for numerous marine warships, containing multiple vice admirals and two admirals, to sail back with no casualty or achievement whatsoever. With Tensei being the sole one with notable signs of injury, the marines generally seemed confused about what happened. Thought I should at least find something enjoyable before confronting Sakazuki, said Borsalino, with his eyes staring at the vast sky and sea ahead. Did you notice, Tensei? That smoker, he's become I hate to admit it, but monster, yes. Mumbling, Tensei looked back at where the full shout lied and frowned. If he were to remain in Marine four years ago TCH, the one sitting in the title of an admiral would have been him, and not me. During the first loss against Smoker four years ago, Tensei was humiliated. Then, upon hearing what happened in the Impel Down in hospital, he was shocked that Blaze, the powerhouse whose strength was thought of to rival Sakazuki's, was defeated by Smoker. Finally, upon the encounter against him for the second time today, 
Tensei felt nothing but a dread the feeling that he only attained against someone like Kaido of the Beast. Justice, justice is wrong, he said. Immersed in his thoughts, Borsalino whispered. Turning around, Borsalino then gazed over the Marines who were heeding their roles and relived demeanors. Money, yes. Money is important as a human being, but justice. Borsalino raised his head up and stared at the blue sky. Why did I join the Marine in the first place again? During the Rocks Pirates era, crimes were thrilling just as ever as today. The difference, however, is that if today's pirates are aspired by Goldie Rogers' One Piece, those in the past were fueled by pure hatred against the world government. Just as Shaiki once said, pirates back then were unlike the ones today, viewing them as threats. The world government forcibly conscripted numerous individuals into the marine to strengthen their military force, and said conscriptions were done mostly in countries not a part of the world government. By giving strong soldiers to the world government, those countries were to become a member of the world government, and attain the right to join Leavely the seven-day long conference. That dictates the future direction of the world. In addition, being a member of the world government meant gaining human rights. Human rights are. Borsalino's eyes widened as if he remembered something that he shouldn't have forgotten. To be a human. I had to join the cigarette, currently held between his fingers. Fell into the ocean, as his grip loosened though he didn't notice this, being far too occupied with his thoughts. Borsalino, Tensei, confused by the fellow admiral's antics, called him though no response came back. He then watched as Borsalino slowly took off his glasses and placed his hand over his face. Tensei sighed, so even you are capable of feeling tired. Reaching up to Borsalino, he took out a cigarette of his own and lit it a flame. I, on the other hand, am confused at this moment. Additional support from the world government was supposed to come for this mission. However, even now, we haven't received any information regarding them. A Admiral Kazaru Admiral Kurama then. One Marine officer whose eyes are hidden by his Marine cap, hurriedly ran to where Tensei and Borsalino were, holding onto a Den Den Mushi. It's a call from Vice Admiral Maynard Maynard. Reporting in here, standing on top of the deck of one Marine warship, Maynard said as his eyes glazed over the disastrous scene in front of him. I am currently seeing the destroyed bits of world government ships all over the sea. Cough, cough. Sitting by the side were wet and injured Sifopol agents. Huffing heavily as their eyes trembled in horror, a, a huge ship-like thing. It was bubble-coated when we saw it. Abruptly, he, he came out from that and proceeded to attack us by himself alone Maynard. After briefly looking at their state stoically, said toward the Den Den Mushi, Demon Air Douglas Bullet they say. I can't believe that we agreed on this. Look at how many troubles we had to go through for this this. Angrily barking in the middle of the ocean was Arlon. Glaring at one envelope that Fisher Tiger passed on to Smoker. It's from Queen Atohom of our Fishman Island. After hearing how you helped our kind out in the past, she's been wanting to see you ever since, said Fisher Tiger. Dolly, I was holding on to that letter for a year. After all, up until recently, we weren't even able to hear news about you. Raising his eyebrow, Smoker accepted the envelope. A year. Can this even be considered valid then? No, of course not. Snorted Arlong. Why the hell did Atovum decide to use that precious paper even, for a mere human like you? Keep your mouth shut, Arlong. Annoyed by Arlong's remark, Jim growled. Can't you understand that the only reason why we managed to drive those marines away, is thanks to this man over here. Arlong glared back at Jin. No, how about you shut up instead? Huh, why must we, the superior race, bow down to a human and invite him to our homeland? Ignoring Arlong's demeanor, Fisher Tiger simply huffed while crossing his arms, whether it's valid or not is for you to decide, White Hunter. After all, that letter is nothing but a simple invitation. Opening up the envelope, Smoker read through it, Dear benefactor of our kind, I, Atohim, sincerely thank you as the queen of my kingdom. I was wondering if you would be willing to take the time to visit us and give support to my campaign. Smoker paused, campaign. This is ha yes. One to unite Fishman and Human together, she said quite hopeful isn't she, remarked Fisher Tiger, dryly, frankly speaking, I am reluctant, especially after getting a glimpse of your strength. With a cold sweat on his back, Fisher Tiger stared at Smoker seriously, I cannot trust you, White Hunter, I find that there is no guarantee that your hospitality is genuine, 
And if you were to secretly harbor a malicious intent to our kind, there would be nothing that can do to stop you. Jim's eyes slightly widened as he looked at Fisher Tiger. Big bro T exactly. Nodded along as he clenched his hands. With his eyes locked on the letter, Smoker said, then why deliver this letter to me in the first place? In response, Fisher Tiger sighed, because I made a promise to Queen Atohum that I will have that letter read by you. Folding the letter back in the envelope, Smoker scratched the back of his head. Giving a light chuckle, his eyes swept through the tensed up some pirates. Before he spoke to Fisher Tiger, you've had one hell of an experience against fellow humans, didn't you? Fisher's tiger's face darkened as he looked down. Folding the envelope and placing it in his pocket, Smoker stated with a grin, Well then, tell Queen Atohum that I currently am too busy to attend, unfortunately. However, do tell her that I sincerely appreciate her invite and that I definitely will come in the future to hear more about that campaign of hers. Che, pretty smart for a human, muttered Arlong as he made a forcible grin. Upon hearing Arlong's statement, Smoker's grin died down. And you, pointing his finger at Arlong, Smoker bickered, human this, human that, what are you even? A celestial dragon went up. What? Arlong growled, don't compare me to those. Your captain is called a hero, due to his courageous act of rescuing thousands of slaves in Meriagwa, for his act of rebellion against celestial dragons. And you, talking about how your folks is superior than others and all that shit reminds me of celestial dragons advocating themselves as gods. With narrowed eyes, Smoker leaned in toward Arlong and said, I think if that's how you'll be in the future, I might as well just kill you here. Numerous fishmen pirates stopped breathing. All of a sudden, the tension began to arise in the atmosphere. Ayu Arlong, whose body began trembling from the sheer pressure onto his consciousness, stuttered his speech. Just then, boom. Jin, who was standing next to Arlong, punched the latter to an extent where the latter was blasted into the ocean. Huffing, Jin said, we apologize for his idiocy. But I can promise you that he isn't as bad as you think just foul mouth. Is it? Wondered Smoker, knowing that Arlong will become a terror that befalls unto the Kokoyasi village. Aunt, you being excessive, White Hunter, Fisher Tiger then stepped in, glaring at Smoker in caution and subtle fear, resorting to killing, simply because of a future that you haven't even seen yet. Do you believe that you are the justice? Is everything that you do correct, even if you were to shed countless blood of others? Standing still, Smoker closed his eyes and took in a deep breath, before scratching the back of his head for the second time. Then, opening his eyes back up, he responded, My apologies. Smoker loosened up his facial expression, giving up on the thought of killing Arlong for the time being at least. I simply wish for a world where no one has to be enslaved, the world where everyone can get food, shelter, clothes, and all necessities that they need to live without a problem. That world includes your folks also, the fellow humans. And to achieve that righteousness, I will gladly kill be it thousands, millions, or more. Splash! As Arlong revealed his bruised face from the surface of the ocean, Smoker gazed at the former and continued, I'm not necessarily against the hatred, for it is your right to seek revenge for discrimination that you faced in the past. However, Smoker pointed his finger up at the sky. The targets of your hatred must strictly be placed on that world government, and not the innocents who have been suffering just as much as you. If you fail to adhere to this, you are no different than the celestial dragons in my eyes. The entire Sun Pirates were silent as Smoker's words ended. Among them, Fisher Tiger looked shaken, with his eyes hovering on the empty air. Without further ado, Smoker waved at them and turned around. With that said, I'll be going now. Until next time then, some pirates. His form began to fade in white smoke that dispersed and slowly flew into the air. Watching Smoker's transformation into smoke, Fisher Tiger finally muttered, Thank you for your help, White Hunter. There is no doubt Demon Air must be heading to the Fishman Island for whatever reason. Having lost his calmness, Maynard was found shouting into the dial of Den Den Mushi. It will be a disaster without a doubt. You know that for the past four years, there were at least five identified cases where countries being destroyed were identified all caused by that madman. Don't you remember that in the first place? I was chasing after Nightshade to check any potential connection with him with Douglas Bullet. So how come we aren't going to from the other end, Tensei said coldly. 
In frustration, Maynard bit his lips. His clenched up fists shook violently, showing just how livid Maynard was. But eventually, he mustered a word out. Yes, sir. The call was then cut, and the Den Den Mushi closed its eyes. Maynard, with his legs losing strength, fell on his butt, uncaring of the fact that his subordinates were watching him. I, until when must I keep on submitting like this, damn it. And for some reason, the only thing he could think of at this moment was Smoker. New world in the middle of the sea, one pirate ship that resembles a whale. Moby Dick was found sailing through. The water was calm, and the weather was sunny, which was considered unusual for the harsh and unpredictable climate in the New World. Aboarding Moby Dick, naturally, were the Whitebeard pirates. And Whitebeard himself, Edward Newgate, was currently frowning upon a letter in his grasp as his eyes ran down through its context. Is this true, Marco? What used to be his long, wavy, unblonde colored hair has now reduced to that of a thin and withering white. Having suffered from a poison that even the doctors on the ship couldn't find a cure for years, Newgate's condition has worsened by a comparative amount to an extent where it began to affect his combat capability. Teach he dared to attack Sphinx. Currently, Newgate seemed enraged. Veins popped out on his forehead, and his letter holding hand trembling. He growled. Not only did he betray us and capture Whitey Bay, but also invade that place of all possibilities. Marco? who was standing nearby Newgate, closed his eyes shut, knowing full well what was about to come. Marco, all of you, my son's pop, hasn't healed sufficiently, and I wonder if that will even be possible at this rate, thought Marco. In New World, we were busy trying to limit damages brought upon by the war between Big Mom and Kaidu, and now Newgate's eyes open wide, glaring at the horizon where his enemy, Marshall D. Teach the Blackbeard must be in. We're going to a war, and thus, the New World faces yet another uprise of catastrophe, and due to this, they fail to receive a notice that Fishman Island, one under their protection, has been attacked. Fishman Island in the Ryugu Palace, where the welcome party for the Red Hair Pirates was still ongoing. One goldfish mermaid of thin and frail-looking physique Queen Atoum, the wife of King Neptune and mother to three mermen princes and mermaid princess Shirahoshi was found giddily collecting the slips of paper from the grasps of red hair pirates. Thank you so much for your support, said Atohem. With this, we are now one step closer to achieving a world where fish men and humans can coexist. Aren't you a hopeful one, remarked Ben Beckman, the vice captain of red hair pirates. Shanks, on the other hand, laughed, that or one piece, I wonder which is harder, Dahaha. One piece has once been discovered and temporarily attained by the Pirate King, replied Beckman, in that of seriousness. But a piece that has never properly been established, you know very well, Shanks. Atoem smiled. Well, you aren't the first one who said that. Beckman sighed with a smile of his own, stubborn also, I see. Yes, however, that's what I love about her. Ha ho ho commented Neptune as he laughed amiably. Meantime, Shirahoshi was found struggling to deal with a much smaller girl whose hair exhibited half red and half white colors. This girl, lively circling around Shirahoshi and observing her in curiosity, then spoke, Wow, how come you are so big? Ah, um, eh. Fidgeting in nervousness, Shirahoshi couldn't muster enough courage to reply to the girl. Noticing her hardship, Shanks called out, Oh, you to quit bullying the princess. The small girl, named Yuta, barks back. Hey, I'm not bullying her. Okay, in fact, I think I'm being super nice. Ha 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 ha. Why are you laughing? Shouted Yuta at the red hair pirates who snickered at her antics. It seemed as if the party, along with this comfortable atmosphere, would last for days. However, sharing toasts, conversing about nonsense, K King Neptune, it didn't take much for said atmosphere to break as a merman soldier came into the palace and panically shouted, Oh, our island below. I it. The palace instantly fell into silence. With everyone frozen trying to process what was going on, the merman soldier swallowed his saliva before continuing his report at Neptune, who had stood up from his throne with a grim expression. I it's him the one who was with the pirate king years ago. Demon air Shanks' pupils shrank as he silently stood up from his seat. Young Shirahoshi nervously looked to her left and right before hiding her huge form behind one pillar nearby. Yuta too, 
quickly ran to the red-haired pirates, noticing that something was going wrong. He dug us bullet he's begun to rampage upon our fishman island, demanding that we hand over Princess Shirahoshi to him. What? Outraged, the eldest son of Neptune and Shark Merman, Prince Fukuboshi, growled as he furiously grabbed his trident. He said what again bullet, muttered Shanks, knowing full well that the party was over. So in the end, Captain Roger failed to change you, it seems. In a darkened expression, Neptune calmly stated, and where may he be at right now? Fishman's meeting hall, the soldier responded. The fishmen situated there are putting up their best fight, but to no avail. Neptune silently processed the thought for a brief moment, before stating, order the nearby citizens to evacuate to here, the Ryugu Palace. Meantime, we will head down and fend him off. Taking a hold of his own trident, Neptune called Fukuboshi, Ryaboshi, Manboshi. Prepare the soldiers, for we are going for a fight. Yes, we will have it done right away, said Fukuboshi as he bowed his head. Shanks. Simultaneously, Beckman gazed at Shanks who seemed in a complex state of emotion. If it's that Douglas Bullet whom you've mentioned before, then yes. With a cold sweat dripping on his back, Shanks made a light grin. This will be a good chance to check how strong we've become since four years ago. Then, he said, Yasep and Hongo, stay and protect this palace. But Shanks, muttered Lucky Roo, wasn't he your crewmate in the past? And therefore, replied Shanks, it's my responsibility to correct his wrongdoings. Shanks then took off his straw hat and placed it on Yuta's head, stay here with them, Yuta. Got it. Yuta nodded vigorously. All right then, Shanks finally said in seriousness, the rest of you, let's go. We are going down to stop Bullet. The red-haired pirates grinned confidently, ready to battle at any moment. Eat big bro tea. Screaming into a den den mushy was one beaten up fish man, whose posture screamed of fear. Oh our home is under attack. That guy that guy isn't anything like those weaklings big bro tyu. Have to come back fastborn. The wall that separated this fish man named Shai Likey from the outside abruptly collapsed, and from beyond the cloud of dust entered one muscular fellow. Kahaha it's been a while since I've been here. Took a while for me to remember the way. But alas, here I am are the old memories. This man, characterized by slicked back blonde hair and nigh red colored skin, was the infamous demon heir Douglas Bullet, one who's arrived to wreak havoc on the Fishman Island. From the still sitting den den mushy exited the voice of Fisher Tiger, but no one responded. After all, said Shawayaki was now having his neck strangled by Bullet's violent grip. How much more of you must I kill for that disgraceful king to show his face in front of me? In annoyance, Bullet's eyes twitched. His grip over Shawayaki's neck tightened every second and eventually Puck. The head, detached from the crushed neck, dropped to the floor with a horrifying sound. Anyhow, unbothered by the gruesome scene that he made, Bullet shifted his eyes to another huge man, Burndy World, who seemed quite entertained by the ongoing chaos. Fishman Island isn't as strong as what's been spoken by the public. What a disappointment. World, in return, grinned maniacally. Barororo, this is only natural. After all, a fish, no matter how hard it tries to be a human, is still a fish in the end. Just after World said so, Bullet's eyes widened as his eyes briefly gleamed in crimson. He then grinned in excitement, this strength, this haki, this sense of familiarity. Bullet hurriedly turned his body and broke through another intact wall. Beyond the ruined wall stood the man of red hair. Brat for once, Bullet seemed jovial, as he spread his arms wide open. Kahahaha, it's been a long time since Roger's death. Hasn't it Shanks, glaring back at Bullet cautiously, said, What have you done on this island, Bullet? Have you forgotten Captain Roger's words forgotten? Bullet stiffened up. Then, his eyes twitched, ached by Shanks' statement, Does it matter any longer he died, Bullet roared, having completely gone furious. That bastard he died before I got to beat him, Kahahaha. Why must I keep the promise when he decided to destroy my dream with his own bare hands? Have you got no sense of morality? Bullet even for pirates. There are rules Shanks unsheathed his prized sword, Griffin. At the same time, his crew members at the back drew their own weapons. In addition, King Neptune, who was seen with his three sons and soldiers, held his trident tight with both hands. As he did so, he ordered to soldiers, locate the injured ones, and help them out of here. Yes, your highness. And so, calming down, Bullet growled. Where is Posidon? Far away, I'd say, replied Shanks, as he pointed the tip of Griffin at Bullet, away from your reach at the very least. Bullet frowned, and his fists tightened. 
The intensity of the atmosphere has reached its peak, and at the next moment, boom. The battle began as Shanks' Haki-imbued Griffin met Bullet's similarly Haki-imbued Fist P-A-Z-Z-Z, along with the flash of Black Lightning, which indicated the clash between two conquerors Haki. Click. Black Cage Hina and Steel Mask Bastille. In accordance with the law, you will be arrested. Surrounding Hina and Bastille, in the middle of the grassy plain of Forshout Island, were the world government agents in black suits CP9 agents. They, having arrived on the island in advance to the main world government units, were given a mission to strike Hina and Bastille, while Smoker's attention was diverted onto Marine. Therefore, they managed to avoid the ruination brought upon by the sudden appearance of Douglas Bullet. However, they at the same time were unaware of the current situation. Currently, a CP9 holding a pistol that was directly aimed at Hina's forehead was a man with long pink hair and a mask that covered his eyes and nose. Aunt, you a famous one, mumbled Hina. Who's who? One who was considered the prodigy of Cipherpol. Prior to the appearance of then, she shifted her gaze to a young-looking boy with a curly black hair, Rob Lucci. Darada, is this all of you? The steel, unafraid of the enemies, bickered ten members only to face the two of us. Provoked by his words, the boy named Rob Lucci asked coldly, permission to kill. Jaya it's already been granted by Spandam said another member of CP9 named Jabra. Ha! Huh. Sighing, Hina slowly put on the black gloves over her hands. Then, she spoke, make this quick. Hina's time is precious. Puck. And as Hina's fist proceeded to smash into the face of one sneak attacking CP9 agent, the battle in Fullshout Island began. A trail of blood paints the sky as Hina's gloved fist leaves the face of one CP9 agent. Another one attempts to seize the gap he thought to be open. However, is blocked by Bastille's greatsword one, that was swung in a surprisingly quick manner, given its huge size. Shigen. As Rob Lucci vanishes from his spot, indicating the use of Soru, who's who, who does not deem the current situation as tricky to deal with, simply fires a Shigen from his spot. Hina simultaneously sees at the corners of her eyes, that there is a CP9 agent transformed into a wolf. Gazing at the approaching hostiles up ahead, Hina narrows her eyes. Flashback, sometime around 1508 stand back up. Lying on top of a cloud-like platform with a soft texture was Hina, completely wasted. Standing in front of them, the figure of an old woman, Suru, stood, sighing at the weakness of the future generation. To truly be considered someone capable, strength is a must in this sea. After all, justice or whatnot there exists no better evidence than the strength to back up your ideals. Frustrated by her incompetency, Hina bit her lips in Logue Town's training camp. Hina was considered a prodigy. Quick to learn and adapt, people spoke of how she's received the blood of her grandfather. Hina, although she didn't admit, held some degree of pride in her that she indeed was special. And that probably wasn't wrong. However, the experience in the Grand Line was something else. Bastille, Maynard, Dalmatian, Dolshi was surrounded by monsters whom she had no idea where they came from. And above all, Smoker. How are you so strong, Smoker? Such was a thought that Hina, although she did not speak out loud, always wondered, is it because you are unafraid? Is it because you are crazy? Where does your power stem from? How do I become as strong as you? Suru-san, Hina muttered, how do I get strong? Suru closed her eyes, huffing. She replied, I too was like you in the past, surrounded by Garp and Sengoku, the strongest marines of my generation. I used to complain of why they improved so quickly, yet I am stuck in the same place. Then I saw one night, when I saw how the two of them, instead of sleeping, were pounding their fists on the past fleet Admiral Kong's warship. Hina was dumbfounded. What? They had one goal in mind. To wreck Kong's ship so that he and his division won't steal their mission. They're crazy. Suru nodded and said, The point is, what drives us to become stronger is a motivation, a desire so strong that we may appear crazy in the eyes of others. That burning passion that I saw in the eyes of those sorts they are absent in you. Hina my girl. Desire a dream. Hina stared at her open hands. But Hina does have a dream. Which is to change this world for that Suru narrowed her eyes. That sounds like someone else's dream, doesn't it? Hina, with her mouth open, mumbled. Huh? Three CP9 agents Rob Lucci, who's who, and the wolf CP9, Jabra, were rapidly closing in at Hina and Bastille. 
Swinging his broadsword in a circular motion, Bastille prevented the further approach of three CP9 agents. Shen, Bastille eyed the other CP9 agents were recovering, before confidently dashing at who's who. There's a saying that to win a war, you need to defeat a leader da. ECK, who's who, whose approach toward Hina was prevented by Bastille, clicked his tongue. However, Rob Lucci and Jabra were now at the front and back of Hina, Shigen. Rob Lucci and Jabra blasted their respective techniques at Hina's head. However, Hina, instead of dodging, grinned Hina's victory. The index fingers of Rob Lucci and Jabra, instead of puncturing a grotesque hole, sank into Hina's head and then phased through it as if passing by a ghost. Lock. Rob Lucci and Jabra's right hands were now tied together by steel-like metal cuff. W what Jabra exclaimed in surprise before his cheek was blasted by Hina's backheel kick. Ugh, Rob Lucci, as Jabra was sent flying, was pulled alone due to the existence of the cuff. Annoyed, he attempted to break the cuff, however, didn't see that Bastille was waiting for the two of them at the back. Who's who, to prevent Bastille from hitting the two, tried to propel himself from the ground below however, found his feet stuck. Ha frowning, who's who stared down and saw that his ankles were tied in a steel-like cuff that was connected to the ground below. Raising his head up in panic, he saw Hina smirking as she raised her index finger and pointed its tip at him. Bang, boom. The blood splashed as Bastille's greatsword slammed right onto Jabra and Rob Lucci, and Hina's Tobu Shigen struck onto who's who's forehead. Three most competent CP9 agents fell down. Having gone unconscious, and the rest of CP9 agents who stood back up, having recovered, swallowed their saliva, evidently shocked by this turnout of a circumstance. WE. We were never informed that they will be this strong. One agent cried, who's who is someone who's won against a former vice admiral before. So how come he's defeated so quick swoosh? At the next moment all the remaining CP9 agents felt a sensation of something passing through them. Behind them stood Hina, who operated Sorrow in a split second. Lock. On the bodies of CP9 agents, there existed numerous metal rings that confined them. Unable to maintain their balance any longer, they fell to the ground. Is this really the CP9 Dara? Bastille questioned, seems a lot weaker than what I heard. Hina did hear that the chief of CP9 changed recently, said Hina, but that's not the concern currently. Turning around, Hina stared at the foreshout island behind. We need to join back with Smoko and get out of here. Ho! Oh. Then, one of the confined agents shouted, Where do you think you're going? Hina, growing a tick mark on her forehead, snapped her fingers. In response, the metal rings around said agent's body became tighter, G-A-H-H-H-H, earning a pain-filled scream out of him. Hina, after a thorough thought, learned what Hina truly wishes for. Hina's smirk softened into a light smile as she thought, Hina wants to spectate how you change the world, smoker. And to do that, Hina has to become strong strong enough to survive through the turmoil. Hina and Bastille then proceeded to walk out of the scene, and it had only been five minutes or so, since the fight had begun. Why did I join the Marine in the first place? Hollowly, Maynard thought, sitting by the rock at the edge of the Fallshout Island. Who is Demon Air Douglas Bullet? The past crew member of the Pirate King's crew. The warmonger whom Garp and Sengoku had to collaborate to capture and imprison. The violent yet surprisingly keen fellow who loves violence above all. There will be deaths, Maynard thought. W what? Maynard was shocked back then. Borsalino and Tensei, they ordered him to fall back even with all this evidence. Ha! Huh, Maynard chuckled, pained by the harsh reality. And I thought I already gave that up before. It was the same in the past. He, along with Bastille, Dalmatian, and Masterson, were on the way back to Marineford after the successful capture of overflowing Sasaki. Then came an abrupt attack by Martini Hook, and by the time he woke up, Dalmatian and Masterson were dead and Hook had become a warlord. Out of fury, Maynard thrashed. He roared directly at Fleet Admiral Sengoku, screaming that this wasn't right. However, nothing changed in the end, and there was nothing he could do, and he realized that he wasn't strong enough. So he entered Sakazuki's division one that was well known in Marine, for being the harshest and strongest above all soldiers. He joined the harsh journey in the new world, and while fighting alongside Sakazuki, got to see the man's incredible strength. Then, when he saw that even Sakazuki complied and obeyed the words from the world government, he learned that it is futile to fight against them, for the world government is the world itself. I thought it was over for you, muttered Maynard, 
when you successfully escaped with many others. I snorted, wondering how long you would manage to last until they catch up on you. And, it has been four years, and you are still alive. Maynard turned around and faced Smoker, who was staring far into the island where Cola was found, firmly shaking her head. An orange-haired woman presumably her biological mother looked crestfallen. I am lost. When I think of why I joined the Marine in the first place, Smoker, I can't I can't remember. Then I ask myself what goal am I chasing after in today's world? Why do I serve as a vice admiral in this organization? I, I couldn't find an answer for this either. Placing his hand over his face, Maynard quivered. Smoker, what should I do? It's, it's the Douglas fucking bullet we're talking about here. Smoker's eyes turned serious, knowing full well what that name meant. He will kill everyone there. And if admirals don't head there themselves then you came to the right person. Maynard's breathing stopped as Smoker spoke. As Smoker saw Cola running out of the village, he grinned for once, you were courageous. To quit the organization you've been in for a lifetime and give up your status just to give me this message. Turning to Maynard, Smoker reached his hand out to the former. You have no idea how many lives you managed to save just now. Maynard hesitated, but gathering his mind, he gritted his teeth and held Smoker's hand with his own. He wanted to know if he made the right decision or not. And where will you be at? Sabaudi Archipelago? It's been four years since I last came here, muttered Smoker as he took a step onto the first grove of the archipelago. And looking to his left and right, Smoker noticed that the place had reverted to what it used to be before his influence. Human auctioning house it's back. Again. It's been. Ugh. Like this since last Y year Maynard. Found on Smoker's right. Was on his knees trying to calm the dizziness in him. 30 minutes ago. Maynard clearly remembered that they were in the Full Shout Island. The fact that Smoker's Nimbus Cloud was capable of traveling at such speed the more he thought about it. The more flabbergasted he was. No wonder we couldn't catch up to him for years. Like how boom. At the next moment Maynard found his eyes popping out of his sockets. As he saw the human auctioning house abruptly exploding into pieces. Slowly turning his eyes to his left Maynard found Smoker standing with his index finger extended along with a smile of satisfaction on his face. Gah. A, a building suddenly exploded people nearby most being the nobles fell into a frenzy. The guards who stood with them quickly checked their surroundings in court. What the fuck are you doing? As all this was happening, Maynard grabbed Smoker by the collar of the latter's shirt and yanked it back and forth. Smoker, not phased by it, simply looked back at Maynard plainly. What's wrong? Out of genuine confusion, Smoker asked. I mean, might as well do this since I'm wanted anyway. W wait then. One man presumably a guard judging by his outfit pointed his shaky finger at Smoker. He, he is, Iowa IT's white hunter smoker over the years. Smoker, with his high mobility, managed to roam throughout the world at an astoundingly quick pace. Marine and world government were incapable of capturing him, and the only information they always received upon arriving late to the scene, were the deaths or heavy injuries of nobilities considered corrupt in the eyes of the public. Thanks to this, run. Those who sighted Smoker today were busy scrambling their way out, while shedding a tear of sorrow that their entertainment was no more. We're found now, sighed Maynard, world government will definitely respond to this. Ugh, how are we going to reach the Fishman Island? If we are forced to deal with them however, Smoker didn't seem interested in listening to Maynard. Instead, he was found at the nearby stand away from Maynard. Hey, how much is this rice cracker? Listen to me, you knucklehead. Maynard screamed, causing Smoker to turn back and blink his eyes. Maynard, you idiot. Eventually, Smoker sighed. Why are we here in the first place? To get a ship coated and start sailing down. Obviously Smoker nodded. And do we have a ship? Maynard froze. The only ship that Smoker had was given for Hina. The steel and Cola's travel, and the two of them, on the other hand, traveled on Smoker's cloud. Then why are we here? Maynard eventually said, if we need a ship, we should go somewhere and buy. A good ship enough to survive an insane degree of water pressure is what we need, Smoker interrupted. There is one ship that I'm waiting for in particular. This place sells ships, since when? Smoker raised an eyebrow. Since when did I say that I'm going to buy a ship Oh, Turning away from Maynard and gazing at the distant sea, Smoker grinned. There it is. Smoker then vanished, leaving Maynard by himself. Maynard turned around to the direction that Smoker traveled at. 
and found himself at the loss of words. E that's, long time no see. Smoker, casually sitting on the biggest of numerous marine warships, spoke to Borsalino and Tensei two admirals whom he faced just an hour ago. I need this ship, so get out. The surrounding marine soldiers stood confused, having never come across a scene like this before. Borsalino and Tensei, also confused by what they heard, squinted their eyes at Smoker. Say that again. Borsalino's left eye twitched as he asked. Get out, repeated Smoker, pointing his thumb at the sea. And in an instant, countless firearms, along with cannons attached to other warships, were pointed at Smoker. Tensei exclaimed, How, how are you here even? Didn't we leave Forshout before you, White Hunter? Vice Admiral Doberman on the adjacent warship growled as he unsheathed his sword. There isn't a second time thud. Smoker's burst of conqueror's haki was sufficient to selectively knock Vice Admiral unconscious, causing the nearby marine soldiers to panic. I only need one, Smoker stared into the eyes of Borsalino. So, do we fight or not? Borsalino kept his mouth shut. The wind began to pick up as Smoker narrowed his eyes, and within the wind was a sliver of white smoke getting more and more intense as time passed by. As the atmosphere grew intense, a cold sweat left Borsalino's body, knowing full well that the last fight against Smoker didn't involve the latter using his full strength. A-O-W-A-I-N-E tilde. Eventually, Borsalino raised his hands up as a sign of yield and sighed, take it. What? Tensei, who thought they would be fighting, shouted at Borsalino. Borsalino, shrugging, said, my working hour is O-V-E-R tilde. No one expected such an answer out of Borsalino. Comically, they slipped and fell head first to the wooden deck. Thanks Borsalino. Smoker nodded, before saying, now get out of my ship. I'm in a hurry. It is your ship already shouted the marines, to which Smoker exhibited an annoyance. From a far distance away at the edge of Grove 1 of Sabaudi Archipelago, Maynard stood with a confused frown on his face. As he watched the ongoing conversation between Smoker and Marines though, he couldn't get a sense of what they were talking of. Then, a masculine voice was spoken from someone behind him. Gentlemen, I heard previously that you plan on going to the Fishman Island. Maynard, shaking his head to lose the dazed expression, turned around and was met with the sight of a muscular man with long and wavy white silver-colored hair, a matching colored beard, and round glasses on his face. Said man smiled and said, I was at the edge of becoming a slave, having been stuck in that human auctioning house just before. Since your friend saved me, how about I give you a discount? Who are you? Oh my, forgive my forgetfulness. I'm the coding mechanic Ray, nice to meet you. Maynard, looking at the self-proclaimed Ray's outstretched hand, reached for it and shook it. And the discount, you say? Why, yes. How much exactly? Hum, one 0.5%, actually 0.25%. Fuck off. So we're going to where, you say? Asked Maynard. Smoker and Maynard were found walking side by side, with Smoker carrying a huge marine warship on a floating white cloud he formed through the use of his fruit ability. People whom they went through looked at the floating ship with their jaws dropped open, but Smoker didn't care in the first place, and Maynard had gotten far too tired to care. There, said Smoker, pointing a finger at Dash Shaggy's rip-off bar Maynard groaned, that's a bar mate. A legendary coating mechanic lives in here. I heard, Smoker said confidently, before placing down the warship on a flat ground, and opening the door into the bar. Creak. Ha ha ha. Listen, Shaggy, after that, I was going to a. Sitting at one seat in the bar was the coating mechanic Ray. Maynard, upon following Smoker, turned stoic as his eyes met Ray's. Not feeling the atmosphere, Smoker walked up to Ray and said, You are the coating mechanic, Ray, right? I'm here to request a quick coating. We're in a hurry. So Ray stared at Smoker plainly, before saying, One million beerly. Smoker nodded. Sure, but in return, do it in an hour ten million. Smoker's eyes sharpened. Ray stared back at Smoker in an equal seriousness and the surrounding wooden constructs began to vibrate as two opposing conquerors' haki began to surface. Brujuom then, a woman's voice interrupted, If you're going to fight, do it outside. The unspoken struggle of haki between the two men ended. Haha. <laughs> I guess I was being a little childish there, eh shaggy? Ray laughed as he placed his elbow on a table. Smoker sighed. 
before taking out 10 million Beely from his jacket and placing it in front of Ray. As Ray expressed a surprise, not having expected such an amount of money to actually be given to him, Smoker said seriously, Demon Air Douglas Bullet is in Fishman Island. Every second counts. Maynard frowned and said to Smoker, Oh, Smoker, why tell him that? He's just a commoner anyway. What did you say? Maynard stopped upon seeing a deep, concerned frown on Ray's face. Shaggy behind the bar also was found grimacing. Standing up, Ray exited the bar through the door. You want me to coat this in an hour? Before coming back in with a deadpan, sighing, Ray then reached to the back of the bar and brought out a small boat. Use this instead. I can do it in 15 minutes. Are you trying to kill us? Maynard refuted in disbelief. That thing's going to break for sure. It's made out of Adam Wood. I. it's made out of what? Maynard's head was in a chaos. Who the hell wastes Adam Wood like that? May look simple, but it's one of the masterpieces that Tom made himself. E. Tom as in the one who made Oro Jackson of the Pirate King Maynard screamed, unable to believe what was spoken by the man. Smoker, walking up to the boat that Ray held, placed his hand and felt the texture of it. Eventually, he grinned, deal. And it has only been around an hour or so since they left the Foreshout Island. Through the thick bubble layer that encases the entire Fishman Island, one ship one that belongs to the Sun Pirates entered. Hurriedly, Fisher Tiger jumped out of his ship and took a quick glance around. What is happening? The mesmerizing coral reef that mermaids love to dwell in was no more. The distant smokes and dusts along with unpleasant noises indicated that an intense battle was ongoing. Grimacing. Fisher Tiger lifted his head up and gazed at Ryugu Kingdom that lied outside the bubble dome. That contained the Fishman Island. Jin, get to Ryugu Kingdom and ensure the safety of Queen Atowum and Princess Shirahoshi. Turning around, Fisher Tiger called, rest of you. Locate any injured personnel nearby and evacuate them to safety. But what about you, big bro T? Shouted Jin. Fisher Tiger clenched his fists, isn't it obvious? Yes, big bro. Arlong laughed maniacally. How about I join you as well? To those puny humans who dared to attack our homeland, his rage-filled bloodshot eyes widened in glee. They shall no pain. Let me come with you, big bro T. Jim refuted, ignoring Arlong. It's demon air that we're talking about here, boom. Cutting off Jim's words was the sight of the red-haired man crashing right onto the ground in front of the Sun Pirates. Shanks Jim cried as the red-haired man, Red Hair Shanks, lifted his wounded body back up by supporting his weight with his sword. Ha ha! Dehaha Shanks then grinned as he wiped the blood off of his cheek and said, It's been a while Fisher Tiger and Jin. Boom. And then, the calamity itself demon air Douglas bullets at his full glory landed right in front of Shanks, grinning ominously. Just from the sheer conqueror's haki that phased through their spines, the Sun Pirates were rendered immobile unable to overcome the oppressiveness of Bullet's will. In response to this, Shank's eyes narrowed before he released his very own conqueror's haki vruvuum. The majority of the Sun Pirates had to shield their faces, as the pure pressure generated from the clash between two wills threatened to blow them away from the sight. A few weak ones ended up losing their consciousness, and fell with foams in their open mouths. Jin, feeling a cold sweat on his back, unconsciously gulped. Humans. Arlong was found gritting his teeth in a supposed rage, but in contrast to such an expression, his body was trembling. Fisher Tiger, glaring at the demonic giant ahead of them, encased his fists in armament haki, ready to fight any time. Simultaneously, he said, Jinb, do what I said. Although there existed a sense of humiliation in him, Jinb ended up nodding, knowing that there was no place for him in this battle. Arlong, Jin called while lifting the unconscious crew members. We're getting out of here. ERR Arlong slammed his fist on a nearby wall out of anger, but nonetheless complied, running away together with the rest of the Sun Pirates. Then, Fisher Tiger's form blurred, boom, meeting his right fist against the fist of a giant man with a green beard. Burndy World, ECK, Barororo a newcomer. I see, newcomer. Fisher Tiger bickered, I am a homelander. Swoo. And at last, the clash of wills between Shanks and Bullet ended. And as Fisher Tiger and Burndy whirled backed away from each other, Bullet stated, You've got an entertaining kid. Bullet's eyes gleamed as he cracked his neck casually. Then, he lazily lifted his armament hockey coated arm up, clang, parrying a bullet that was coming in his way. 
In annoyance, Bullet frowned and diverted his attention to the direction in which the bullet came from. Hair surprised. It was Lucky Roo, bleeding from head to toe. Regardless, he chuckled while taking a bite out of dusty meat as he held his smoking flintlock with his other hand. I give up, Bullet. Shanks then stated calmly, causing Bullet to raise his eyebrow. I give up trying to convince you. You seem to have truly forgotten the values that we attained throughout years of sailing on Captain Roger's ship. The sword held by Shanks, Griffin, glowed in a vibrant red as Shanks operated armament Harky. Emission. Such process was finally done, as the sword has become sturdier, but at the same time, sharper. Kahahaha. That's it. Bullet shouted jovially. Fight me with all you got and prove that you are worthy if not for the sake of fighting until our very end. Why does humanity exist anyway? Subsequently, the noise of a bullet being fired was heard from Bullet's back. He raised his hand up once more to block against it, and, splash. Bullet found his eyes widened as he realized that the bullet wasn't the usual metal, but instead, a bag of oil. The oil splashed all over Bullet, and the one who did this was Beckman. Shanks smiled before he began dashing toward Bullet, while skidding his harky coated Griffin against the ground. Griffin blaze. The friction generated from the skidding of Haki against the ground was converted into combustion energy that ignited into a hot red flame. Shanks slashed the blazing sword against Bullet, who dashed back to evade the attack from colliding into his oil-covered form. However, Shanks' attack wasn't a simple slash. It produced a flame-covered sword arc that continued flying toward Bullet at a rapid pace, and, whoosh, blew up into a gigantic flame upon coming in contact with Bullet. Lucky Roo said to himself, did it work? Kahahaha. And then, something unbelievable happened. Boom. Bullet, with his enormous strength, clapped his hands together. An incredible pressure of air was generated, in an attempt to blow away the flame that covered his body. Beckman, from a far distance away, thought in disbelief, what a monster. Boom. Boom. Bullet clapped his hands at a blinding speed. The flame grew larger and larger, as it ate the incoming oxygen. However, it successfully separated from the man's body in the end as the sprinkles of oil left his body. As the flaming oil fell to the ground and continued burning all across the battlefield, Shanks grimaced for there was no sign of injury on Bullet's body. Your armament Haki has gotten even stronger. I see, whispered Shanks, before he raised his sword once more. What's with you relying on a petty trick like this, kid? Bullet snorted. Why are you resorting to the way of weaklings? Shanks and Bullet blasted from their spots simultaneously, and a pawn clash between the blade and the fist pairs. The intense black lightning occurred, indicating that the battle wouldn't be over for a while. Usually, the Sabaudi Archipelago is the final place that the travelers visit before entering Fishman Island. With Fishman Island technically being the government-approved island that pays heavenly tribulations, it wasn't illegal to sell an eternal pose, meant for the Fishman Island. That would be a hundred thousand beerly. Spoke a stoic looking store owner as Smoker placed the eternal pose of Fishman Island on the counter. Paying the appropriate sum, Smoker took the eternal pose and quickly rushed back to where Shaki's rip off bar was located, Grove 13. There, he saw that Maynard was standing, dissatisfied, as he looked at the huge marine warship that was sitting by on the ground. You are paying this plus 10 million for the sake of Maynard growled, one small boat. Smoker replied seriously, I'd rather not think about what I lost right now. Focus on reaching the Fishman Island. Just when Smoker said so, Ray walked up to him and pointed at the boat that was sitting at the edge of the grove. Done. I've placed an extra thick layer. So the safety is guaranteed it should last at least 10 times longer than the usual coating on the usual sized ship. What's the maximum speed that that boat can tolerate? Asked Smoker. I cannot give you a specific number. Ray shook his head negatively. But if the bubble layer begins to fluctuate violently, it means that the layer cannot sustain against the pressure any longer and that you must slow down, noted. Smoker, entering the bubble layer, sat down on the boat and motioned his hand to Maynard, you coming or not? Fuck, I have a bad feeling about this. Maynard cursed before entering and sitting behind Smoker. Due to his huge size, he was forced to bring his legs close to his chest and crouch in an uncomfortable pose. In a serious manner, Ray crossed his arms and conducted a quick inspection to ensure that there was no mistake in his work. Then, as Smoker spoke, Ray took a step back, take the eternal pose. You're my navigator today. Maynard exclaimed, what? I'd consider that as yes. Now, hold tight. 
Wa b a t. Then the back of the boat began farting out the white smoke, bringing Ray and Maynard to a surprise. And W, wait, give me a second to splash. With the huge wave of water, the boat disappeared into its depths. Ray, upon witnessing such a scene, let out a light chuckle. Oh boy, Gray, Maynard was utilizing all muscles in his body to prevent himself from falling out of the boat. Turning his eyes to the side, Maynard saw that the bubble layer was violently trembling and shouted in fear as slow down slow down smoker this thing's going to burst no it won't said smoker focus on looking at that damn eternal pose and make sure that i'm going the right way while traveling at an incredibly fast speed maynard raised up the eternal pose in his hand and attempted his best to stare it however he ended up saying i can't see smoker it's too dark in here try this said smoker as he snapped his fingers boom a small explosion ensued, granting Maynard a faint source of light for a brief moment. Ah, I think I managed to get a glimpse of it now, cough cough. What the hell is this? Smoker replied impassively, smoke, duh. And so, the small boat containing two men descended recklessly into the dark underwater full of danger. So, Cola, why didn't you stay? In a calm setting, as the ship containing Hina, the steel and Kola sailed toward its destination. Hina softly asked Kola, Weren't you anticipating your reunion with everyone? Kola, with a wistful smile, said, I was happy. I wish I could have spent more time with them. But Kola recalled the night before the departure of eavesdropping on the conversation between Smoker and Robin. In response to Robin's words, Smoker said back then, the start of this journey was full of recklessness. Simply for the sake of Kola, Smoker threw away the advantage of staying hidden against the world government. And so, Cola, at the age of nine, thought about how she could be a help to them. Eventually, she reached an answer. During the reunion with her mother, Cola whispered, I was reminded about many friends I made back in our place, and didn't want to leave them. Cola forced a smile, so I left. In silence, Hina and Bastille looked at each other, stoically. The steel gently placed his hand over Kola's head and muttered to Hina, Will the world that Smoker pictures truly come Dara? It isn't about whether it can or cannot, said Hina, firmly, it is the matter of must. Sighing in bitter sweetness, the steel stood up and exited the room in the ship. Hina returned her attention back to Kola and whispered, It's gotten late into the night, Kola. And you've been through a lot today. Why don't you get a good night's sleep? Okay. Kola complied with Hina's words, and went to the back of the room, where a small wooden bed was prepared. Before Hina blew off the candle that lightened up the dark room, Kola managed to get a glimpse of herself in the mirror. In the mirror, there was a girl full of tears, forcing a stiff smile on her face. Water 7, Paradise Tom, a large cowfish fishman shipwright. For the act of building the Pirate King's Oro Jackson, he was arrested by the world government. During his trial, he appealed to the judges that to mend his sin, he would build a magical machinery called Sea Train in 10 years. It has been 10 years since. Tom has not accepted a single commission related to ships, and poured the entirety of his 10 years in keeping his promise. And alas, here it was today. I introduce you, shouted Tom as he pointed his hand to a train standing on top of a train rail, that somehow floated on the water. The world's first ever sea train puffing Tom people from all across the world was standing in front of Tom today, excited to learn more about Tom's creation. Amidst the crowd stood a man in a black suit and purple hair spandum, otherwise known as the newly appointed leader of CP9. Crossing his arms and standing in front of other Cipherpol agents, he seemed to be irked by Tom's success. And on the other side of the crowd, there stood two men and one woman who were wearing sunglasses and fake mustaches. Aramaki, Senor Pink, and Robin. Today's the day that Tom's trial ends, said Robin. This means that Tom can start building ships again. Fuck yeah, grinned Aramaki. I've been friggin' tired of weak-ass ones we've been using. Like seriously, how are we supposed to sail when they burst the moment they submerge into the underwater? If only you were a shipwright, things would have been so much easier, remarked Senor Pink. You even have the perfect ability for that. From far away, Tom shouted in excitement, and now, we'll begin the showcase of Puffing Tom. Iceberg, get the engine started. Frankie, move out of that rail if you don't want to get rammed. Crossing her arms, Robin said, anyhow, don't try to yawn. That's right, girl, nodded Senor Pink, 
stay chill, and be ready to clap when that machine thing works. The steam began to come out of the working puffing Tom. Aramaki stared at it dully, before mumbling, it's definitely something new. Yet, why am I not impressed? Because, Robin, remembering all she's been seeing for the past four years, chuckled, we've been seeing things much more ridiculous than this, huh? In the sky, the papers have begun raining, interrupting Tom's showcase. There was a shout of a man, new bounties have arrived, one particular bounty paper slapped right onto Aramaki's face. Aramaki detached it from his face and took a look at it, Demon Air Douglas Bullet. Wanted dead or alive? 1 billion 800 million, Bealy. Yuck, why is his face red? Remarked Aramaki, before throwing the paper away. Fishman Island within the span of the past four years. The feats of Demon Air Douglas Bullet spread throughout the world. The destruction of three kingdoms, seven towns, and countless civilizations that Marine didn't manage to identify. This man wreaked havoc without any shred of humanity in him. A bulldozer? Some commented from their safety zone, for Bullet's feats reminded them of a drill grinding through the ground without any resistance. It was fun while it lasted, kid. Red hair pirates were found unable to combat any further with each of them having accumulated far too much damage. Fisher Tiger was nowhere to be found, but judging by the ongoing noises from a far distance away, he was still in combat against Burndy World. Neptune, his three sons, and the additional merman soldiers they too, were unable to go on any further. It's time to finish what I came here for. Bullet said stoically as he began to march toward the Ryugu Palace above only, to find resistance on his ankle, someone was grabbing onto it. You, I am not letting you go. It was Shanks, who glared at Bullet as he mustered every strength he had in every inch of his body. Bullet frowned and lifted his foot up, crunch. Bullet's deadly stomp landed right on Shanks' left arm. That held onto his ankle. Shanks didn't have any haki remaining in his reserve, and the result was the splash of blood, followed by the detachment of Shanks' left arm from his body. Shanks' eyes widened, having met with an intense pain that threatened to knock him unconscious. Take my final token of generosity, growled Bullet, you'd be better off without an arm than a life, won't you? Leaving the bleeding Shanks by himself, Bullet resumed his march clang. Ash before a bullet struck Bullet's haki imbued head. In an evident annoyance, Bullet turned around and met the chuckling form of Ben Beckman, the vice captain of Red Hair Pirates. Bullet, with a dark expression, lifted his right hand up and clenched it into a fist. Flies, they always pester me. Generating noises, flying around, and disturbing me overall. And the most annoying thing is, they always escape your grasp and continue to annoy you over and over. Bullet turning his way around began walking toward Beckman. What? Are you saying that I'm a fly? Beckman remarked coolly, before shooting once more, clang, clang, clang. Bullet swatted bullets away with his hand as he walked. Eventually, he arrived in front of Beckman and snorted at Beckman's rifle that was pointed right at his forehead. And what differences are there between you and a fly, except for the fact that you, unlike fly, cannot escape from me? Beckman chuckled once more before his eyes sharpened, point-blank range. Throughout the entirety of the battle, none of my shots had an effect on that monster. Thanks to that, his guard is down, and judging by his overall body gestures, he truly views me in the same standard as a fly. Perfect. From the start, Beckman estimated that the chance of victory against Douglas Bullet was extremely slim. The point was to make one single which he believed to have a chance to kill Bullet, which was to have a guard down Bullet without armament Haki to protect himself, standing right in front of Beckman himself. Bullet's lifted up fist now descended toward Beckman, planning to crush Latter into the ground bang. From Beckman's rifle exited a dense bullet unlike any other, that struck right onto the forehead of Bullet. This particular bullet, having been filled up with armament haki, emission from its core all the way to its edges, wasn't something that could be blocked by human flesh without any reinforcement. From this sudden impact, Bullet's face was knocked back, now facing up to the sky, his descending fist lost its momentum and fell powerlessly to the side. Not letting his guard down, Beckman fired once more to Bullet's exposed neck this time around, clang. Only for an abrupt spread of armament haki onto Bullet's neck to block Beckman's bullet. Beckman's eyes widened, and Bullet slowly lowered his head back. Bullet exhibited a rage unlike any other as a trickle of blood flowed down from his forehead to his face. Beckman couldn't help but speak hollowly. 
Are you a human? Boom. The ground behind Beckman exploded as Bullet blasted a hard punch right onto Beckman's abdomen. Beckman fell unconscious, and Bullet stood back up. I command you for that, pirate, stated Bullet as he touched his forehead and plucked out the bullet. Unfortunately for you, I've seen bullets far too many times for it to affect me even if it were to be done right in front of me. Dusting his hands off, Bullet left the scenery for this time around. There was no one to stop him. Hongo, Yasup, with a cold sweat, said seriously. Get Red Force working. Evacuate everyone from here and escape. I'll try to hold that man down as long as I can. Damn it, Hongo cursed in helplessness, before storming toward the back. Hongo W what is going on you to screamed in shock as Hongo lifted her up by his shoulder as he hurriedly ran. What are you doing? Hongo let me go. Shanks and everyone else are still down there ignoring you to shout. Hongo cried, Queen Atoam, Princess Shirahoshi, we have to move, Bullet is on his way to here. In the now empty banquet hall, the huge Shirahoshi was found trembling in fear. Atoam, much smaller in terms of size, was trying her best to calm the princess down. Upon Hongo spoke, Atoam said gloomily, yes. I am aware of the ongoing situation below. Turning around, Atohum placed her hand over her chest and said resolutely, If Hongo-san can take Princess Shirahoshi to safety, our Fishman Kingdom will forever be in gratitude. Confused by Atohum's statement, Hongo asked, What about you? Queen Atohum closed her eyes and took a deep breath. I'll stay here and try to convince Douglas Bullet to stop. But if my king fought till his very end, then isn't it natural for his queen to follow in his footsteps? Hongo tried to reason, still. Bullet isn't someone whom, however, Hongo couldn't finish his words. The doorway into the banquet hall broke, and what flew past Hongo and Yuta was the bloody form of Yasup, whose nose seemed especially injured to an extent where it looked elongated much longer than usual. Yasup, Hongo and Yuta cried, before Hongo's breathing stiffened as he heard an echoing footsteps from below. Shit. Placing Yuta down, Hongo turned around and faced the grinning Douglas bullet. Boom, boom, boom. Pluton, Poseidon, Uranus. The three ancient weapons are known to possess the strength that can destroy this world, said Bullet as he locked his eyes onto Shirahoshi and Kahawa. Imagine my surprise when I recently came to learn that Poseidon is none other than a mermaid. Gritting his teeth, Hongo snarled. What do you plan on doing with Princess Shirahoshi? Why, isn't it obvious? Bullet spread his arms out wide and proclaimed, I will open a war big enough to shake this entire world. Only the victors, ones proven to be worthy, will survive. A cold sweat slowly dripped down from Hongo's back. Hongo then said with a shaky smile, run, Yuta. Then, Yuta saw in her eyes, boom. Hongo getting smashed by the abrupt punch by Bullet, who managed to travel to Hongo's front in the blink of an eye. Hongo slash Hongo-san Yuta and Atohum screamed in horror but there was nothing that they could do. Bullet snorted at Yuta, who was tearing up in front of him, and without any care, raised his hand up in an attempt to throw her away from his sight. There was nothing that Yuta could do but close her eyes tight and inwardly shout to Shanks to save her. Then, as Bullet's hand descended, A-H-H-H-H boom. A man whose size was half a Bullet's mane suddenly came crashing down from the top right onto Bullet. Bullet was slammed down to the ground, and Yuta unconsciously released a breath that she didn't know she was holding. Smoker you fucker Maynard then screamed, causing Yuta, Shirahoshi, and Atohum to flinch. Why did you throw me out of the boat all of a sudden boom? On top of the livid Maynard came crashing down the small boat, effectively shutting the man down. On top of the said boat was Smoker who had his chin resting on top of his hand. Damn, this boat really is a strong one, Smoker exclaimed. A Atohum, with widened eyes, whispered, who? In response to it, Smoker directed his eyes at the Queen, and while grinning, took out an envelope from his jacket. Am I late to the party, Queen? Water 7 shit. Shit, shit fuck this all within the mind of Spandam. The new chief officer of CP9, chaos was ongoing. It's who's who plus Rob Lucci were talking about here. How the hell were they defeated by white hunters no name lackeys? The wipeout of all Cipher sent to force out by the abrupt appearance of Douglas Bullet, along with the defeat of elite CP9 members by Hina and Bastille, placed Spandam in a tight position. After all, many considered him as incompetent, and that the reason why he was placed in such a high rank was that his father was none other than Spandine. 
the previous leader of CP9. Spandam needed to prove himself. This, this has to be my only chance. Tom, the shipwright under trial who were to be executed if he failed to fulfill his promise of building a sea train within 10 years. Spandam was recently given an order from the above to bring Tom's attempt to a failure. In other words, the world government viewed Tom's life to be more worth than his soon-to-be creation. In a dark expression, Spandam secretly signaled with his left hand. An agent to his left nodded. And, here we go tilde as Iceberg began to get the puffing Tom started. Said agent pointed his index finger at Iceberg and blasted a silent Tobu Shigen. However, Puck, both Spandam and the agent found themselves shocked as a vine suddenly wriggled out and blocked the Tobu Shigen from reaching Iceberg. Simultaneously, Puffing Tom emitted steam from its top and began to move, which earned amazement from the audience. Who the fuck? Spandam cursed as he quickly looked around. His eyes then found one individual one with long and wavy green hair, much taller height than the others, and a muscular physique that indicated that he wasn't an average human. Ha! Huh, said man, Aramaki, raised his eyebrow at Spandam as he felt the stare on him. Sir, he the agent next to him, upon realization, said, that man is Green Bull Aramaki, the known henchman of White Hunter himself. What? At the same time, Robin sighed, we've been found. Aramaki chuckled, are you mad? Robin shook her head, before glaring at the CP agents, you did what you have to do. If anything blame those scums. Nicely said. Senor Pink nodded in agreement, then what? Spandam and CP agents began walking out of the showcase, toward the back of the alley. Noticing their intent, Robin smiled darkly. We do what we always do something that we're notorious for. Ryugu Palace Neptune, his sons, and Merman Army, unable to fight. Likewise, the entire Red Hair Pirates, in need of dire treatment. If the current battle was a game of chess, Shirahoshi would have been a king. All pieces have been wiped out from the board, and if everything went according to the rules of the game, Bullet should have accomplished his goal already. You. And yet two men interrupted him. Bullet could confidently say, that he at the current moment was angrier than he ever had been. Boom. A punch soared through, attempting to strike Maynard who was directly lying on top of Bullet. However, Smoker, by quickly grabbing the boat and Maynard with his two hands and Juta with a third hand that he generated using the white smoke, evacuated to safety in an instant, avoiding Bullet's fist. As Smoker released Maynard, Yuta, and the boat by his sides, Maynard unconsciously held his breath as he saw the impact of Bullet's punch. He found himself sweaty upon thinking of what would have happened if he was hit with that. Yuta's heart shivered in fright as Bullet stood back up to his gigantic form. His shadow, stretching all the way from his feet to where Smoker, Maynard, and Yuta stood, brought goosebumps all over her. Shanks Yuta couldn't deny it any longer. This monster must have been the one who defeated Shanks. Whoa. Unable to hold it in, young Shirahoshi exploded into tears. Though she was young, she had an idea of what happened to her father and brothers. She tried her best not to let out a sound, but the fear brought by Bullet's presence made her lose control. Surprised, Atohem tried to calm Shirahoshi down, but her attempt had no effect on the huge mermaid princess. Crack. The floor generated cracks as Bullet stood back up. His eyes flashed in hostility as they locked onto Smoker, promising violence. Then, he laughed, Kahahaha. I'd never have expected to meet you here of all places, White Hunter, White Hunter. Atoem's eyes widened in realization, finally coming to learn who Smoker truly is. Yuta too, took a step back from Smoker's side, flinching upon hearing the moniker from Bullet. Within the span of four years, three names were heard the most frequently. First, Blackbeard Marshal D. Teach. Freely sailing through the war-filled new world with an unknown motive, he has been recruiting pirates all across the sea, and increasing his fame. Second, Demon Air Douglas Bullet. Destroying and ruining everything that he came across, Bullet was a name that invoked fear in all civilians. Third, White Hunter Smoker. Previously considered the future Admiral of Marine for his astounding progress, the fact that he abruptly disappeared along with the countless number of other used-to-be Marines, and the fact that he mysteriously appeared in random locations all around the world before disappearing once more brought many's attention. And now, two of them were staring at one another in caution. Yuta felt that breathing itself had become stringent from this bizarre and intense atmosphere that she had never experienced before. Then, Maynard's eyes widened as the hairs on his body stood up, sending warning signals, 
Here he comes vroom. Conqueror's Haki emitted out a bullet, spreading throughout the entire Ryugu Palace. The palace shook, and the supporting pillars threatened to crumble and fall at any moment. Maynard choked, while Yuta and Shirahoshi swayed. Atohum, though sweating profusely from the pressure, held her ground with her hands clenched into fists. Smoker's eyes grew colder as they stayed focused on Bullet. Then, as his cold eyes gave off a gleam, a counterwave came, shoosh. And in the blink of an eye, Bullet's conqueror's haki was no more, causing the ongoing vibrations all around to fall silent. What just having experienced something novel, Bullet voiced confusion. Taking a step back, he was clearly shocked by the fact that his conquerors beats mine. It happened within a split second, but Bullet knew. Just now, Smoker. He exerted his conqueror's haki at its full might and overwhelmed Bullet's. Bullet grimaced. The fact that the haki of this strength was focused on him only without affecting Maynard, Yuta, Shirahoshi, and Atohum meant one thing. That Smoker has an astounding degree of mastery over Conqueror's haki. Maynard. As Maynard wiped sweat he didn't know he had, Smoker's voice broke the silence. Fisher Tiger's fighting down in the Fishman Island against someone. Go help him out. What Smoker, casually grabbing Maynard by the back of the latter's shirt, threw him forth. Smoker. Maynard broke through the wall and proceeded to fly through the bubble dome that surrounded the Ryugu Palace, then through the dense layer of water, then through the bubble layer of Fishman Island. Yuta, Shirahoshi, and Atohum stood stoically, clearly dumbfounded. Kahaha. Bullet then proceeded to laugh, trembling in excitement, your rumors didn't lie. Smoker readied himself as he saw that Bullet's haki began to spike once again, entertain me white hunter boom. A shockwave boomed throughout the palace as Bullet was found in front of Smoker at the next moment, clashing fist to fist. Kaya Yuta yelped as she was thrown off of her feet from the sheer air pressure. Eventually, she landed right into Shirahoshi's grasp. And this was just the beginning. Boom boom boom. The walls crumbled down and floors left cracks, as Bullet brazenly threw armament haki coated punch after punch, destroying anything in his path. Smoker, with an equally haki coated arm, met Bullet's strikes with his own, knowing that dodging them would bring those behind him in trouble. Bullet's eyes flashed in red, indicating the operation of observation haki. His eyes busily moved before he suddenly turned back and swung his arm, half. His arm severed Smoker's clone, one that puffed back into a mass of white smoke boom. Ash then, Bullet found a fist to his face, which sent him crashing into a nearby wall. Ha! Huh. Standing back up right away with a grin on his face, Bullet blocked an incoming punch from Smoker with his hand, white blow. Boom! And an incredible mass of smoke exploded out of Smoker's fist, which blasted Bullet out of Ryugu Palace. The light was entering from the hole generated by Bullet's flight just now. Smoker, staring at the exit, spoke to Yuta, Shirahoshi, and Atohum, who were watching him in awe, don't worry. Though the situation below seems quite detrimental, I still feel that many are alive. Judging by particular presences that are more noteworthy than the others, Red Hair Shanks and King Neptune haven't died, and the situation isn't as bad as it may seem. Turning around, Smoker gave a confident smile. I'll be back in a while. Shirahoshi's eyes sparkled in wonder as she gazed at Smoker. To her timid self, witnessing Smoker's fearlessness against that monster gave her the courage to overcome the immense fear in her. White Hunter. As Bullet outside cried Smoker's moniker excitedly, Smoker's expression turned serious, before his form disappeared from the palace leaving Yuta, Shirahoshi, and Atohum along with the unconscious Yasup and Hongo. Jeez, I've just fought two admirals earlier. Go easy on me. Smoker, now standing outside, said as he rolled his shoulder against Bullet, who exhibited a wide grin mixed with excitement and rage. Kaha. I've also been fighting for a while now, if that helps. At the next moment as if they promised one another, the two of them vanished simultaneously, as before the intense black lightning zapped across the entire area as Bullet and Smoker's fists met once again. Water 7 Spandam is petty and cowardly. He is incapable and unfit for his position. However, he isn't an idiot. All of you, go in that direction. I'll use you as decoys to escape from this scene and quickly contact Marine for a backup. And you, you'll stay with me and continue the current mission of guarding me. The agents whose eyes were shadowed by hats on their heads, nodded stoically before dashing off into the back alley. Spandam and one remaining agent also began running in the other direction. Spandam knew that they stood no chance against Green Bull Aramaki. 
He also knew that White Hunter Smoker and his group did not care about the threats of the world government and marine. Why are they here anyway with a trivial thought? Spandam raised his wrist and spoke into the mini Den Den Mushy strapped on it. Can you hear? Well, I'm assuming that you can. Listen, I need a backup. There's, before he could finish his sentence, a hand suddenly grew out of Spandam's arm and skillfully unstrapped the mini Den Den Mushy. Then, the hand grabbed said mini Den Den Mushy and threw it toward a teenage girl who came out from the side, Robin. First and foremost, she ended the call. Then, she, with narrowed eyes, quickly calculated the situation. Though I intercepted in the middle, the call has already been sent. However, Sifapol is in shortage of force, due to the failure of the operation at full shout. The likely incoming backup is Marines. Aramaki and Senor Pink purposely followed decoys to divert this man, CP9 Chief Spandam's attention. Due to Aramaki's name value, if we are unable to leave before the arrival of backup, they're likely to target Aramaki first. Robin reflected on the conversation she had with Smoker beforehand. Smoker said back then in a thoughtful manner. Then, as if having realized something, he muttered Tom, Walter Seven, Spandam, Aramaki, Senor Pink, and Robin came here with two goals in mind. One, put in a request to the shipwright Tom to build a ship strong enough to survive in the new world. After all, the small number of marine warships that they stole four years ago, are currently in use for worldwide operation after remodeling, and the recent marine warships that Marine uses today had Vegapunk's newly developed tracking technology implemented. Smoker said back then, and said second goal, therefore, is, damn you White Hunter's minions Spandam shrieked loudly. However, his eyes held confidence as they faced Robin, for she was a girl whose appearance seemed to pose no threat in his perspective. You, Spandam ordered the agent next to him, it's just a girl. Arrest her, kill her, whatever. Do it quick. Without any words, the agent complied with Spandam's order. The agent crouched his posture, ready to dash at Robin through the operation of Soru. However, he found himself unable to leap from his position, and noticed just then, that a pair of arms that sprouted out of the ground, held onto his ankles and prevented his movement. And unfortunately, the agent due to being occupied with those two arms failed to notice a third arm that grew out of his shoulder which had its index finger pointing at the agent's neck. What happened next was the swift and sudden operation of Shigen at point-blank range, dealing a deadly blow at the agent who fell, dead. Spandam's eyes widened in terror, and as his mind was busy registering the situation, Puck, an arm that grew from his back delivered a chop at his neck, sending him into unconsciousness. Upon watching their incompetency, Robin couldn't help but think dryly, are these really the same Sifa poles as eight years ago? Fishman Island dust blew as two men faced one another, filled with hostility. There was no doubt that a harsh fight was ongoing. Barororo, how does it feel like to lose everything you hold dear? Fishman, Burndy World, he had no signs of exhaustion and was barely scathed. In contrast, Fisher Tiger, with multiple wounds across his body, had his breathing quickened. I haven't lost them yet. Yet, Fisher Tiger gritted his teeth. Yes, he knew that world was falling around, that he was yet to reveal his full strength. But Fisher Tiger knew that he had no choice. Bullet alone is more than sufficient enough to wreak havoc. If even world were to be set free, or have you? World snorted as he picked up a rubble nearby his right foot. Douglas Bullet, you have no idea what that man is capable of. World's eyes momentarily gazed at the distance, thinking over what he's gone throughout his life. Then, his face wrinkled, expressing a rising anger within him. That damn world government. That damn marine. Taking everything away from me, the only thing that they deserve is destruction. And there is no one better than Bullet in this aspect. World then laughed maniacally. Aroro, don't you get it? Fish man, your family, your friends, consider them gone. Everything that you've been doing for the past few hours all has been futile. Fisher Tiger's fists clenched trying to hold his anger. As a veteran, he knew that losing his temper and resorting to rashness against someone stronger than him was a suicidal act. No response. World snorted once more. How boring. Before throwing the rubble in his hand, more and more hundredfold gun. The size of a mere rubble while maintaining its velocity, abruptly enlarged to a giant boulder that caused Fisher Tiger to grimace. Quickly, Fisher Tiger jumped up to evade said boulder that crashed and generated a huge cloud of dust. 
that covered up the view. Fisher Tiger, knowing that this is just the start, landed on top of a broken boulder and backpedaled Boom. Ash at a quick speed, Weld suddenly appeared in front of Fisher Tiger and punched him in the stomach, which was possible due to Weld enhancing his speed with the ability of his more more fruit. Fisher Tiger vomited blood as he crashed to the ground. His body was slowly running out of strength, and he knew that he couldn't go on for longer. However, he stood back up in a wobbly fashion. Snorting, Weld didn't cease his attack. He blew the floating dust speckles in front of him toward Fisher Tiger. More more tenfold shotgun. The specks of dust became the bullet-sized objects that flew at the speed of a gun. With no strength to dodge, they landed directly on Fisher Tiger and spilled further blood, earning a grunt out of Fisher Tiger. I'm not yet. Fisher Tiger didn't fall. With a clear rage in his eyes, he growled. Handing my homeland to you scums. All bark and no bite. Typical signs of losers. Grin world. Morals. Friendship. Justice. None of them matter because they are the values set by the strong ones. That's right. The one and only truth of this world is that strength dictates everything. If anything, blame your weakness, Fishman. Fisher Tiger watched as world took hold of a sword that was lying nearby, which he immediately recognized as the weapon of one of the red hair pirates. More, more hundredfold, chop, clang. Fisher Tiger's tired eyes widened as he saw the abruptly enlarged sword in World's grasp being blocked by a normal-sized sword held by Eumanid, one whom Fisher Tiger recognized as the Marine Vice Admiral who has clashed several times with the Sun Pirates. Why? Why, if it isn't the pest that's been following us for a while? Frowned World, evidently annoyed by Maynard's appearance. He applied more pressure on the gigantic blade, to which Maynard, while gritting his teeth, barely let it slide by tilting his sword, and moving away to the front of where Fisher Tiger stood. You, it's a complicated story, but I'm on the same side as you this time around. Trust me, Maynard then cursed? Damn it, I swear, devil fruits are ridiculous as always. How the hell did I manage to survive that just now? Fisher Tiger found himself relieved. With no strength remaining in him, his eyes began to close. So yeah, Burndy Weld is hella tough. Ain't no way I'm able to beat him alone. So help me out, oi. Why are you falling down? I, Fisher Tiger, lost consciousness, leaving Maynard just by himself against World. I'm fucked. Maynard found a cold sweat on his back as he saw World grinning maliciously at him. The specks of dust flew. The ground cracked. The vibration affected the nearby Ryugu Palace, which signified just how intense the ongoing battle between Smoker and Bullet was. Boom. Bullet wildly threw punch after punch, aiming to destroy his sole opponent who weaved around his attacks, clearly unfazed by their ferocities. Kahahaha. Boom. The ground burst into several pieces, as Bullet's missed punch directly crashed into it. Without any delay, Bullet then swung his other fist at Smoker right in front of him which was once again evaded by Smoker with a minimal movement of tilting his head. Boom. Just from the sheer pressure of the punch, the bubble dome of Ryugu Palace rippled, which Smoker frowned upon noticing. Boom. Then, as Bullet threw yet another punch with a burning excitement in him, Smoker, instead of dodging this time around, grabbed it with his hand. Bullet's grin flinched, and then a frown of realization came, unable to believe that his punch was blocked so easily. I just realized, Smoker then exclaimed. Why must I fight you when I can throw you to the ocean just outside? Bullet's eyes gleamed viciously as he growled. Because you aren't able to from Bullet's fist came forth a strong wave of armament haki. A mission intending to destroy the innards of Smoker through the hand that was in contact with his fist. Your conqueror's haki is quite remarkable. However Bullet thought, what about the armament haki boom? Bullet found himself caught off guard as his arm, at the next moment, was suddenly flown backward powerlessly. What? Bullet realized that his armament haki. A mission met a strong resistance, one that surpassed the capacity that he could exert. Then, as he stood dazed boom, Smoker's shoe found its way right onto Bullet's exposed face, sending the gigantic man flying out of Ryugu Palace through the bubble dome then into the Fishman Island right below. Shit, muttered Smoker as he scratched the back of his head. I put in too much strength there. He then proceeded to crouch down before blasting himself out of his position through the bubble layer, 
the ocean in between, and the bubble layer encasing Fishman Island toward the Fishman Island. Ha! Huh. Bullet, lying down in the pit that was generated from his crash, expressed disbelief as he watched Smoker's casual arrival at his front. Boom. Slamming his fists against the ground, Bullet utilized the generated force to lift his body back up. With a wide grin on his face still, he charged at Smoker again, engulfed by the joy of fighting. It will be different this time around. White Hunter Smoker watched as Bullet's cocked back hand, in an instant, became reinforced by the floating pieces of metal that came from the ruins nearby. Clank. Along with the metallic noises of said metals joining together, Bullet threw the gigantic armed fist forth, Armada Faust, the size of the armed fist was thrice the size of Bullet's fist. Large enough to cover the entirety of Smoker's size, Smoker watched as the fist flew toward him with intense air pressure, calmly. Raising his head in this urgent situation, Smoker gazed at the sky of Fishman Island. That was encased by the bubble layer. There existed no cloud, meaning that the operation of his fruit ability, to some extent, was limited. Not that it matters chuckled Smoker before he clenched his haki imbued right hand into a fist, black blow. Boom. Bullet's metallic, armament haki, emission imbued fist collided against Smoker's black smoke covered fist. The black smoke then combusted into the intense fire that charred the metal it was facing. Having learned from the last encounter, Bullet quickly withdrew his fist while assembling the metallic reinforcement in his other hand, and proceeded to throw that fist at Smoker. Smoker, having foreseen the attack, met Bullet's second punch with his own. Then, Bullet's punches began to accelerate, which Smoker met with incredible accuracy. Boom 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 boom. The dust and smoke flew as two pairs of arms moved at a blinding speed. The ground surrounding them broke into numerous pieces as if experiencing an earthquake. Then, the contest of strength abruptly stopped with Smoker swatting Bullet's first fist away with his kick and pulling the latter's second fist toward him. Smoker's left hand, at the same time, was sitting right on Bullet's chest, and before the latter had the time to react, Black Impact. Boom. An explosive and penetrating blow was dealt, causing a trickle of blood to drip down from Bullet's agape mouth as his body emitted smoke. Bullet then wobbled before falling to one knee. Smoker stared at the downed man impassively. As Bullet quickly tried to stand back up, he simply raised his foot and, boom, brought it down to the back of Bullet's head causing Bullet to kiss the ground. Black Impact you Union Armada then. Before Smoker could injure Bullet any further, Bullet, for the first time, shouted in an urgent tone, before the broken ground around them glowed in dark blue and churned bizarrely. Smoker was forced to move out of the sight as the ground, metal, and numerous other objects compiled into dense and hard layers of solid materials that condensed into a gigantic island-sized golem. Huff huff huffing with a rapidly beating heart inside, said golem was Bullet who wiped the sweat he didn't know he had. He then grinned in a shaky and crazy manner. You, you got to be the one, White Hunter the one, Smoker heard from the outside. The distorted voice of Bullet that was loudly heard as if speaking through a speaker. The one who will lead me to an even greater strength, damn, mumbled Smoker. That's pretty cool. Not gonna lie. And at the same time, quite inefficient thought Smoker as he saw the golem's fist began to descend toward him. Ultimate roared bullet, Faust time to get a little serious. Smoker formed a small smile as he held his right hand out, Arcane Drive. After a short lasted darkness, Shanks regained his consciousness and opened his eyes. Did we lose? His blurry vision slowly became clear as they focused on a gigantic golem that stood in the middle of Fishman Island. Its humongous fist was descending ferociously, and Shanks lamented Captain Roger. I still have a long way to go. He fought with all that he had. He thought that he's gotten a lot stronger than before, that he was ready for whatever was about to come to him. However, what happened after? An utter defeat. The island Fishman Island was the hometown of his friends. Just as how his previous captain, Goldie Roger, and Whitebeard Edward Newgate protected this island up until today. He too wished to give an aid. Therefore, Shanks used all remaining strength in his body to stand back up. But his body simply didn't respond. The gigantic golem Shanks knew that it was Bullet's doing. The moment that descending fist touches the ground, the entire island will be wrecked. Considering how this island houses countless number of individuals, a single punch will be enough to give a rise to a high number of casualties. One that Fishman race may never be able to recover from. If only you were here, Captain Roger Shanks could do nothing but watch helplessly. Then, his eyes sighted at the last moment, 
Who is that? One man standing right under the descending fist of a golem, shrouded by a grey smoke. This man, seemingly unafraid of the ferocious fist, held his hand up. Then, Shanks came to witness a miracle. One by one, the injured and unconscious fish man who were hiding from the behemoths peeked out from their hiding and viewed the approaching fist of a golem in fear. Why embedded deep in the rubbles, Arlong roared in rage, why is IT always you damn humans? Slamming his fist against the rubbles, Arlong glared at the distant golem, taking everything away from US. Go to hell, inferior monkeys huff huff with severe injuries and an evident exhaustion. Neptune stood back up, thanks to the support of his equally injured sons. He stared hollowly at the golem, and let a dry chuckle. Is this the end of Fishman Island? The sons followed their father's gaze with dark expressions of their own. Barororo. World laughed maniacally as he repeatedly slammed his gigantic blade against Maynard, who was barely surviving through. World purposely targeted the unconscious Fisher Tiger whom Maynard was trying to protect, such that Maynard had no choice but to block his attacks. Clang. Smoker. Maynard's eyes trembled as they moved back and forth between World who stood right in front of him and Bullet's Golem. E everything is fine, right? Do something. My man in Ryugu Palace above, Atohum watched the scenery with a pale expression. Her statements from the past replayed in her mind as she spectated how the humans were destroying their home. Shanks. Yuta screamed in panic while Shirahoshi covered her eyes up not wishing to watch the scene any longer. In this sense, Douglas Bullet truly deserved the moniker of Demon Air. His act of killing and ruining lives of the others had no motive other than that of selfishness. You know, Bullet Smoker, watching as the gigantic fist of the golem flew toward Hyam, thought, I've been questioning your past actions for a while. In the canon, Bullet kept himself hidden after a successful escape from the Impel Down. Only when he believed to have a proper plan in achieving his goal, did he reveal himself to the world. Your acts of destroying towns and kingdoms in four blues and paradise. It was as if you were asking others to look at you. As if you were trying to divert the attention for someone. The smoke surrounding began to swirl into a singular point in front of Smoker's right hand. That had its index finger stretched out as if using Shigen. The smoke particles collided and upon collision, the generated energy was transformed into heat. The heat blazing in a form of a sphere was currently condensed into a form of a dense ball by Smoker ready to be fired at any moment. But I guess that doesn't matter as much. Let's put an end to your unreasonable wrongdoings, shall we? Before the golem's gigantic fist termed ultimate Faust by bullet, landed on Smoker and the ground below him, Smoker released his technique, Arcane Shot. The dense ball of energy, resembling a miniature sun, blasted forth in the form of a laser at a blink of an eye. There was a blinding light that caused everyone to shield their eyes upon the collision of it to the golem's fist. And when the light faded, boom. The golem's fist was found detached from it and crashed on the ground, having been melted and formless. ESSSS the smoke was generated from the quickly solidifying pile of metal. Similarly, the remainder of Gollum's arm was emitting smoke generated by the sheer heat. Smoker, raising his hand up, clenched it into a fist. Swoo the levitating smoke mystically changed its direction and entered the gaps of the gigantic Gollum. Noticing this phenomenon, Bullet, with a deep frown, began reconstituting the Gollum's damaged arm while readying another punch with its fine arm. And then, Arcane Storm. Boom! The entire golem exploded from the inside, as the ferocious swell of grey smoke ground its way out from the inside. The storm continued expanding as the broken parts of the golem swirled along in a disastrous manner. In the eye of the storm, the core of the golem where Bullet is situated was revealed, to which Smoker's eyes gleamed upon noticing. Swoosh! White Hunter Bullet roared as he collected the flying metals amidst the storm, and quickly assembled a much smaller robot that encased him. However, his attempt was of no use as Smoker was found right in front of his robot with his glowing palm, in contact with the midsection of it. Bullet's eyes widened, and then Smoker launched his attack. Arcane impact. There was a force unlike any other, one that completely shattered Bullet's robot-like object and reached all the way to Bullet himself. Bullet quickly reduced the magnitude of the impact through the shielding of his body via armament Haki. Emission and prevented a critical injury to the body. But the force was enough to blast him out of the storm to the ground. Boom. The smoke storm vanished in an instant with the metal parts reduced into sprinkles of dust. That glittered as they fell from the sky. Smoker, 
who stopped the operation of Arcane Drive, slowly flew down from the sky to where Bullet crashed, unscathed. Upon landing, Smoker found that Bullet, who already recovered from the attack, was flying at him. Bullet, with a roar, encased his fist with armament Haki. Emission and swung it at Smoker, who sidestepped and placed his palm over the side of Bullet's outstretched arm. Boom! There was a potent impact generated from the combustion of black smoke that knocked Bullet's arm to the side and caused said arm to bleed. Ignoring the pain, Bullet turned around and attempted an elbow smash, which Smoker evaded by leaning back before counter-attacking by placing his hands on the ground and placing the tip of his shoe on Bullet's chin. Boom! Bullet coughed blood as the rigorous blast of black smoke penetrated his skin and dealt an internal blow. A few of his teeth flew out, but setting his bloodthirsty eyes on Smoker still, Bullet attempted to grab Smoker's outstretched leg, which failed as said leg simply dispersed into white smoke. Raul, Bullet, with gritted teeth, landed back with a stomp, and caused the ground to break. The terrain that Smoker stood on top of suddenly sank, causing Smoker to jump up to avoid losing his balance. Seizing this chance, Bullet assembled the pile of flying specks of dirt over his haki imbued fist, and created a gauntlet in an instant, before launching himself at the airborne Smoker. Not afraid to face it head on, Smoker countered Bullet's attack with his own haki imbued fist boom. There was a shockwave along with the intense black lightning, and Bullet's gauntlet immediately shattered into pieces, before Smoker intentionally loosened the strength behind his arm and let Bullet slide past him. Revolving his body around, Smoker then attempted to slam his heel at Bullet's cheek, which Bullet blocked with his huge palm. Boom! Then, a combustion of black smoke came forth once more, blasting Bullet to the unstable ground below. Huff huff with his nose bleeding freely and his eyes bloodshot, Bullet stood back up, breathing heavily. Engulfed by the intensity of the battle, he relentlessly charged at Smoker again and punched Tap. How? Bullet gazed in disbelief at his fist that was blocked by Smoker's palm without any damage. Without any response, Smoker pulled Bullet's fist causing Bullet's body to stumble forward and, boom, slammed his other fist right onto Bullet's exposed face, causing the spillage of blood. Bullet wobbled a few steps back, trying not to fall down. Smoker, casually shaking his wrist and walking up to the wobbly Bullet, punched him in the face again. Boom. Bullet, unable to withstand this time around, fell to his knees. With his vision hazy and his visage bloody, he weakly stared at Smoker who stood in front of him impassively. Boom. Then, Smoker sent a powerful sideway kick that landed on Bullet's cheek, which sent Bullet's head crashing into the ground. Without stopping, Smoker then slammed the same foot down toward Bullet's neck, to which Bullet managed to respond by crossing his arms together at the last moment. Boom! An explosion of black smoke came, and Bullet's arm sprayed blood before falling to the sides without any strength. Pulling his head out of the ground, Bullet willed his legs to stand up even under the immense stress, and laughed. Kahahaha, <laughs> Huff Huff Smoker didn't respond, but Bullet didn't seem to mind. Bullet tried to raise his hands up, but they didn't move. Clicking his tongue, Bullet assembled the lying rubbles nearby around his legs, and coated them with the little of haki that remained in him before launching himself at Smoker again. Boom. Smoker, with an equally haki coated leg, met Bullet's kick with his own. The air exploded from the collision, before an intense shockwave was generated from the combustion of Smoker's black smoke, which blasted Bullet's leg back, broken. With only his left leg remaining intact, Bullet placed his entire weight on it. With his crazed grin still intact, he bent said leg down, planning to attack Smoker again. Both of them instinctively knew, that this would be the final clash. Bullet placed his focus on his left leg, then propelled himself from the ground. That Sturkus Bullet couldn't continue. With his grin frozen, he slowly lowered his head and saw a big hole on his chest. Arcane shot. Smoker stated with his index finger stretched out, which had its tip emitting a grey smoke. Thud. Bullet fell to his knees, unable to continue. He laughed weakly, ka ha ha ha, it's your victory white hunter. As the dust settled down, Smoker walked up to Bullet. Both of them knew that judging by Bullet's rate of bleeding, he didn't have much time remaining. Strength rules over all, said Bullet weakly, and Victor deserves everything. Bullet read Smoker's intent. Then, sticking by his principles, Bullet opened his mouth, speaking his final words. After my outbreak four years ago, I have been defeated twice only. Apart from now, the other one who managed to win against me was Bullet stared into the thin air, watching the replay of his past. 
You've gotten stronger since then, a bullet. Unbelievable. Impossible. There existed nothing but disbelief in Bullet as he looked at his wounded body that didn't respond to his will. Next to him was Burndy World. Having lost his consciousness, raising his head up, Bullet gazed at the fellow whom he viewed as an unworthy nobody in the past, Blackbeard Marshall D. Teach, commonly known as Blackbeard today. Zehahaha. Why looking so surprised? Is it really that strange for me to have hidden my strength? Nothing made sense from Bullet's perspective. In the past, he vividly recalled that Teach being an apprentice of Whitebeard Pirates whose age seemed similar to Shanks and Buggy, was stoic and non-responsive in character. Mysterious but uninteresting that was the sole conclusion that Bullet made before setting his eyes off of him. And today, here he was, laughing in a way Bullet had never seen before, with his eyes burning brilliantly harboring an ambition of their own. With a deep frown, Bullet glared at Teach, though he knew that it was futile. A loss was a loss nonetheless, even if on Teach's side stood Shiyu, cleaning his blade without meeting Bullet in the eye. Teach played dirty to attain his victory. What do you want? Upon hearing Bullet's words, Teach's grin widened. Then, he held his hand out to Bullet while crouching down. Sahaha. Now we're talking. Bullet stared at Teach's outstretched hand in confusion. Teach said, say, Bullet isn't your goal to become the strongest. To stand on the very top of the world. I gotta say, I really like the sound of that. Grabbing Bullet's floppy arm and shaking it forcibly, Teach narrowed his eyes viciously. How about we form a temporary truce? Cause you know, I aim to host the biggest war there ever has been in this world. Letting go of Bullet's arms and standing back up, Teach spread his arms wide open and shouted with vivid excitement in his tone. World government, marine, revolutionary army, pirates, and all powerhouses belonging in this world will be forced to join, and only the strong will survive Teach's eyes twinkled, and Bullet knew that Teach was being genuine. Bullet couldn't help but ask, how will you do that? As if having expected such a question, Teach grinned wickedly ever heard of ancient weapons. Fuck. Standing in front of the dead body which used to be called Douglas Bullet was Smoker, experiencing a headache from the newfound information. Blackbeard. I knew that he was a man of many secrets, but still, to what extent does he know? The plot has already deviated from the canon. Blackbeard has reached his primary goal much sooner than he was supposed to, and is currently doing something under the eyes of the world. And in addition, Dragon told him before, the world has surprisingly been unmoving for the span of four years with the exclusion of Smoker and Bullet's feats, along with Teacher's rise. During this time, Smoker's time was spent finding a way to escape the eyes of the world government, evacuating his group altogether, preventing the ongoing wrongdoings in Four Blues and Paradise of the Grand Line, and further raising his combat capability to prepare for the upcoming future. In the process of doing so, New World was naturally left outside of Smoker's scope of view. And Smoker's instinct told him that something big was about to happen, one that would shake the entire world. It's the time to enter the New World, thought Smoker, before he shifted his eyes elsewhere, to the direction in which Maynard was busy fighting Burndy World. No, 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 this can't be. World, in the middle of dominating Maynard with strong attacks built by his fruit ability, snarled in a shaky tone, bullet how the hell sweating profusely from the anxiety. He swung the gigantic blade he'd been holding at Maynard. The moment Maynard met the blade with his much smaller own, world enhanced his speed and flew at the unconscious Fisher Tiger, engulfed by panic, rage, and violent urges. Maynard's eyes widened in panic, shit boom. One individual, Jin, suddenly revealed himself, blocking world's punch with his arms. The sounds of Jim's bones cracking were heard, but Jim didn't flinch, and instead, glared at World with determination. You aren't touching a single hair of Big Brother T. Damn fish, World cursed before he was forced to turn around and raise his haki imbued arm to clang. Block an incoming saw-like blade, held by Arlong who held a motorous intent. Zai, human. Arlong screamed before recklessly swinging his blade once more. World, not holding back grabbed Arlong's saw-like blade with his bare hand, and broke it with sheer grip strength. Then, before Arlong could react, slammed his other hand onto Arlong's saw-like nose, causing the nose to bend unnaturally. E-A-H-H-H-H. As Arlong expressed pain, World coated his forehead with armament haki, and slammed it against Maynard's approaching blade. Maynard was knocked back from the sheer strength, and seizing the opportunity, Jim attempted to use his fishman karate, only to fail because of the severity of damage he took on his arms. Not 
Jin gritted his sharp teeth and tried raising his trembling arms again. Not yet. Nothing world shouted at this state, nothing ever goes as I wished boom. Well punched Maynard who guarded with his sword, only for his sword to break, and him to be knocked back, due to world's punch suddenly accelerating. Not stopping, world turned around and blew air, more more hundredfold strength. Before said air suddenly became a strong wind that blew Jinb off his spot. World then proceeded to jump and stomp onto the lying Arlong. Boom. Kirk causing Arlong to fall unconscious with his eyes whitened and his agape mouth spilling blood. Without stopping, World lifted a sword that he dropped previously and swung in an attempt to behead Arlong. Clang. Only for it to be blocked by Shanks, who held his sword with his sole remaining hand, while huffed in fatigue but albeit with a smile. Dahaha scared. Click. Simultaneously, World heard a clicking sound nearby him. Turning to the direction where the sound came from, he saw Lucky Roo, leaning on top of a hard ground with a deep wound on him, aiming his rifle at World. Bang. World slapped the bullet away and growled in frustration. Looking the other way, he saw Neptune, his sons, and the slightly recovered guards coming his way. On the other direction, the fallen red hair pirates were rising back up, one by one, although weakened notably. Bullet, why the hell did you decide to come here in the first place? In this state, World cursed his already fallen companion. If only you decided to continue doing what we've been doing, I wouldn't have ended up in this situation. World raised his head and stared at Ryugu Palace above in a separate bubble layer. With his sight enhanced through the use of his fruit ability, he saw the huge mermaid princess, Shirahoshi, trying to hide her form behind a pillar. That's right, it's because of you world's eyes lit up in hatred. At the next moment, before anyone could react, he boosted his body before blasting himself off toward the Ryugu Palace. Shit Shanks flinched, and Neptune quickly realized what world was about to do. Stop him Prince Fukuboshi. The eldest son of Neptune screamed desperately. However, they had no way to catch up to World. From Ryugu Palace, Atohon saw the hatred in World's eyes. Upon watching, she, instead of becoming afraid, came to wonder. Why? What have we done to you? Atohon Shirahoshi Neptune shouted as he quickly boarded his flying whale, trying to catch up to World who was already high up in the sky. There are good people in the world. I know very well. But there also are bad ones, ones so evil that a mere sight of them makes me puke. With a smile that promises violence, World revealed a rock in his hand. Cocking it back, he then threw it. More more hundredfold or tried to throw it, before Smoker appeared right above him, and crushed his rock holding wrist under his grip. There was a crunching noise, and World's eyes widened in pain. Ah, before World can scream, Smoker slammed the rock into World's mouth, effectively shutting the man down. Smoker then released the man, causing him to fall an incredible height all the way back down to the ground. Boom. The dust arose, and into the dust flew Neptune, who was riding his pet whale. His eyes, blazing in rage, promised pain as his form disappeared into the dust. And as the dust cleared, everyone came to see one thing. Neptune stabbing World's chest with his trident. Is it over? Maynard asked, thinking that the situation had become clear. Igra then, World began moving again, raising his fist above Neptune's head with an intent to crush it boom. Dash and then, a punch came in from World's side and slammed his cheek so hard that his face became disfigured and his brain exploded into a liquidy soup ending his life. The owner of the punch was Smoker, who retracted his hand back and said to Maynard, Shut up, Maynard. The battle has come to an end. Fisher Tiger. He found himself in the middle of his past, watching as he was tortured and ridiculed by celestial dragons, the vile humans who knew no boundaries. What about my homeland? The Fishman Island? How did I end up here again? Fisher Tiger's mind drifted as he watched his past dully. Then, at one point, he jolted in realization, Douglas Bullet Burnie World. He anxiously looked to his left and right, as the scenery around him shifted from the accursed Marriageois to Fishman Island, one that was in ruins. Fisher Tiger remembered that he had been fighting World until Maynard's arrival. He began to think consciously, what happened after? Is King Neptune and Queen Atohum alive? I his eyes then opened, and found a wooden ceiling looking back at him. With heavy breathing, he sat up from the bed he was lying on. Wiping his sweat and calming his breath down, he checked his surroundings before standing back up by supporting his body against the nearby wall. Huff huff anxiously, he opened the door. Outside, 
There were, Big Bro T, Big Bro T, You're Awake, Jim, Along, Aladdin, Chu, Gyro, and other members all were present. In addition, there also were Fisher Tiger, Are You Feeling Better, Neptune, Atohum, other merfolks, and Red Hair Pirates. It was the first time Fisher Tiger saw such a large gathering. But that wasn't what Fisher Tiger was surprised by. You. Fisher Tiger's eyes locked onto a human sitting among them. Smoker. Smoker, as he stared back at Fisher Tiger, said playfully, It's been a long time. Eh, long time my ass, grumbled Fisher Tiger in response. Fisher's Tiger's mind was filled with turbulent emotions as he faced Smoker. The hardships that he's gone throughout his life replayed in front of him, being caught and sold as a slave. Witnessing how other minor tribes were brought as slaves to receive unjustifiable treatments. Then, a lucky escape due to an incident that made people believe that he died. In the ocean, Fisher Tiger grew hatred for the humanity. He couldn't tolerate their vile tendencies, and driven by the rage, returned back to Meriajwa by his own will, and by using the knowledge of Meriajwa's layout that he attained throughout the years of experience as a slave, he freed others and made a miraculous escape with them. He established the Sun Pirates. He covered up the hoof of the soaring dragon with the sun-like tattoo, such that no one will know who was slave and who wasn't. It was for this reason that Fisher Tiger never believed in a Toem's dream. Fish mankind coexisting with humans. His perception has already been set, that humans are dangerous to them. Even the Pirate King, Whitebeard and Red Hair who had good relationships with the royalty's Fisher Tiger refused to trust them, for he's seen far too many cases of humans betraying other kinds for their selfishness. This was frankly the reason why Fisher Tiger told Smoker to lay his interest off of Fishman Island even though he understood that his act will hinder Atohum's goal. Then, right after Kane Bullet's invasion, one who fit the very image of humanity that Fisher Tiger imagined. Bullet, a force to reckon with, was a powerhouse whom no one in Fishman Island was able to face against. Once again, the humanity has decided to oppress them, Fisher Tiger thought. He believed that today would have been the final day of his life before his death. And at the final moment, he was saved by a human. Why humans ruined their lives. At the same time, humans saved them. Fisher Tiger despised this helplessness, this feeling of having his entire life being dictated by humans. Why did you come White Hunter? Fisher Tiger, far too emotional to hide his rage and hatred, snarled at Smoker. Have I not told you to stay away from us? Did you come here, thinking that saving us will grant you a reward of some kind? Do you feel some kind of pride for yourself? That you fulfill the so-called noblesse oblige? By saving us lowly fish men, the audience instantly fell silent. Jim and Arlong, in particular, expressed shock, not having expected Fisher Tiger to react in a violent fashion. It is always you humans. Fisher Tiger roared, and Smoker looked at Fisher Tiger, seriously. Maynard, who was by his side, seemed irked by Fisher Tiger's statement. Those who claim themselves as good people, how many of them do you think I've been seeing up until today? Atoem, standing up rigidly with a stoic expression, tried to stop Fisher Tiger. Fisher Tiger, please calm down first. Why do you force us to trust your folks? After slamming up down in this deep ocean, can't you at the very least leave us alone? Though not spoken, the majority of fish men and merfolks resonated with Fisher Tiger's words. Their faces darkened, showcasing the pain that the entire race have accumulated over hundreds of years. Smoker, sitting still, closed his eyes to collect his thoughts. As Fisher Tiger gritted his teeth with quickened breathing, Smoker opened his eyes back up and gazed at Fisher Tiger with a clear resolve in them. The red-haired pirates curiously watched Smoker, and Smoker finally said, Is Fishman a human or not? That's when Fisher Tiger's eyes widened in realization. By humanity he meant the humans living above the water. However, by doing so, he unconsciously discriminated themselves as the inferior beings. In case you don't know, let me tell you. Smoker clenched his right hand tightly to an extent that blood began to drip out of it. The blood being red in color made Fisher Tiger take a step back, for the blood seeping out of bandages wrapped around his body had the exact same color. Fishman is a human, Smoker said, innocent humans of weakest strengths suffered from the despicable humans of greatest strengths, that's the essence of Fishman tribe's case. Smoker remembered when he found young children in the filthy slave ships. 
The fact that those kinds of wrongdoings were occurring all around the world it clearly showed that world government viewed humans as nothing but bugs. Nothing is absolute in this world. There are good people, and at the same time, bad people. Those people, in terms of race, may be humans living above the ground, ones living in the sky, or ones living in the underwater. But one thing is for sure, Smoker shifted his eyes and viewed Arlon, who frowned in a mix of caution and anger, an individual's act shouldn't be attributed to the entire kind. The parents' sins shouldn't be crossed over to their children. Similarly, the responsibilities for Celestial Dragon's doings should solely be tied to them and them only. The moment that hatred of yours start getting directed to innocent ones, weaker ones those who didn't contribute to your pain, you become the same as your nemeses. Arlong opened his mouth trying to refute. However, he couldn't find anything other than the usual curses that he throws ones. That didn't get to be voiced by his vocal cords. Jinb, in a thoughtful manner, lowered his head to the ground and listened in silence. Smoker continued, Tom, the shipwright, was born here. Yet, he lives in the world above with humans without any discrimination. Though celestial dragons continue to conduct evil acts, the victims of said acts are not only limited to fish mankind, but all kind of races across the world. In the end, Smoker pointed his finger at Fisher Tiger. You are discriminating yourselves against the world. Though you feel miserable from your lives, you refuse to make any changes out of baseless fears. Smoker paused momentarily, wetting his dry lips. Then, he repeated, Let me say this once more. Nothing is absolute. This time, he looked at Atovam and said, If Fisher Tiger and the majority of fish men are excessive towards one end, Queen Atovam is far too optimistic. Though accepting humans for the sake of coexistence matters, you need an ability to discern well of who may be your allies and who may be your enemies. Throughout four years, Smoker saw the rise and fall of many kingdoms, cities, towns, and other gatherings of people. He learned that in this harsh world dictated by world government, people have to become cunning. Ayatohan remembered the number of times their kinds were enslaved and killed. She believed that those things happened because people didn't understand that they too are humans just like them. However, she came to learn today that there are some who commit wrongdoings out of pure selfishness. You can't expect them to understand anyone. And even so, even after fixing your ways, not much may change. Perhaps Smoker was being unreasonably pessimistic. Maybe he was being far too nosy. But he regardless continued, knowing for sure that he is heading in the right direction. This world, as long as it is ruled by world government, will continue to suffer. Those celestial dragons. They would want to keep their position, won't they? If so, what do you think they are the most afraid of? With a thud, Fisher Tiger sat down. He, with his eyes trembling, said after letting out a shaky sigh, unity between the pests, namely us. Smoker grinned to that, exactly. Posidon being the mermaid princess. Pluton being the large battleship built and made by ones living on the ground. Uranus a creation linked to the sky, Smoker speculated. Said dragon back in the past, and... If Dragon with limited information speculated this smoker grimaced, Blackbeard, who seems to know more, may have reached further. Looking around the crowd around him, Smoker could only hope that his words managed to change their thoughts. He made a concluding statement, discard your biases and think for yourselves of what is the best way to progress towards the peace and prosperity that you seek for. That's the reward that you'll be giving me for saving you. Then, losing all sense of seriousness in him, Smoker casually walked back and slapped the back of Maynard, jolting him out of his daze. Get up, we're leaving. Maynard cried, A already, I got a schedule to keep, have to go now, said Smoker, before picking his ear with his pinky finger. And it's not like you are going to live here, right? No party or anything. Man Maynard grumbled, but nonetheless complied and began walking by Smoker's side. Watching as the two of them walked away, Neptune was left speechless. Without getting any words of thanks, after getting yelled at for things that he didn't do, there he is, leaving. How can he forget? He knew just how many fishmen Smoker saved in the past. Today, he added yet another debt that made Neptune's mind heavy. Are you really someone whom we can trust? Neptune turned and looked at a Tohum, who seemed far too occupied with her thoughts to ask for the votes of Smoker and Maynard. He knew that they had many things to think about. Sphinx, New World, the effects of poison is evident. The magnitude of Whitebeard's actions for the past years have been decreasing gradually. 
Considering that he's the man who chose rationality and didn't go after Kaido who killed Kazuki Odin, this was the only way to pull him out of his turf. Sipping a cup of coffee, Achoku briefed to the members of the group who were sitting on a round table, stuffing down loads of foods and drinks. Mem, K. Anyway, you got any more of this wine? Asked John as he pointed at his empty glass. Shut up and listen John. Jeez, annoying as always. Remarked Shiki, frowning at John's antics. Shiroro, joining you guys was the best choice I ever made in my life commented Caesar the mad scientist, as he laughed boisterously while stuffing down a burger in his hand. Hum, Shiyu, with a cigar bitten between his teeth, eyed Caesar impassively. Sitting still with his arms crossed was a man wearing a heavy-looking armor, silver axe, weakened white beard with his commanders. Though their number will be vast, Achoku narrowed his eyes while looking around Sphinx, which has become a barren land where skulls rolled across the charred and ruined ground. Standing on top of this island were millions of regal pirates who laughed while drinking their respective alcohols, wildly. In terms of manpower, we won't lose. Looking around the executive members sitting on the table, Achoku then said, in terms of experience and strength, we don't lose either. And Whitebeard himself. Turning around, Achoku looked at the enormous man with a black captain's hat and a messy black beard. Sitting with women around his arms, Zehahaha. Achoku smiled shrewdly, What's there to worry when we have the one who managed to subdue Whitebird at his prime? The captain, the ruler, the commander of all these forces, gathered in Sphinx Blackbeard Marshal D. Teach. The executives knew that the true identity of this man was none other than Rox D. Zebek, their past captain who has fallen in God Valley, only to rise again. Then, Teach said with a dark grin, eat while you can. Everyone subsequently flinched, having noticed a strong presence that entered their senses. Teach, standing up and turning his head around, said, Zehahaha here he comes. Teach a rage-filled roar boomed across the air. Everyone knew that this voice belonged to none other than Whitebeard. Teach whispered, the time has come for you to hand me that power or jaws. Up high in the air was Whitebeard, dropping with his Najinata surrounded by the intense Black Lightning Conqueror's Haki. Infusion and the white aura that represented the power of his Tremor Tremor fruit. His eyes were red in nothing but hatred aimed at Teach, wishing for nothing but the blood of his worst foe. Achoku urgently said, quickly, get out of the way. As soon as he said so, Teach's darkness-covered hand met Whitebeard's Najinata, and then, the sky and the island below broke into two before the large burst of black lightning exploded signaling the start of Sphinx War. In the quiet forest of Fishman Island, Smoker and Maynard waited for their small boat to be coated by a fishman named Den. With there being nothing to do but to sit by, Smoker was enjoying a moment of peace for himself. He couldn't help but recall the serious words that Sengoku said to him in the past. Smoker gazed up at the bubble layer that prevented the entry of water outside. Though many living here may not know, he knew the sight of stars during the night, of how brilliant they are. What do you plan to do from here now on, Smoker? The world government discovered the connection between you and the Revolutionary Army. Their efforts to annihilate the Revolutionary Army became vastly greater. Smoker thought to himself, at this rate, the Revolutionary Army won't be able to grow as strong as it is in the canon. Simultaneously, Teach has already risen as a threat while many restraints for Teach, such as Shanks and Luffy, are not stronger or older enough to fulfill their roles. In a way, I was the cause of this situation. However, if he were to question whether or not he regretted his decisions up until today, the answer would be no. Smoker has seen far too many smiles of joy on people's faces. He's come far too much to start worrying about the distorted future. To build a better ending, isn't this why I started all this in the first place? Many told him that his goal is impossible to achieve. That it is akin to trying to touch a star that is untouchable. And he said to them in return, that he will make the impossible possible. Smoker. Then, Maynard spoke to him, causing Smoker to wake up from his thoughts. Maynard pointed his finger ahead, he's coming toward us. Just as Maynard said, Smoker sensed a man who harbors no malicious intent walking closer to them. With a light sigh to refresh his mind, Smoker stood up and muttered, Red hair. Haha <laughs> surprised. Red hair shanks. The man of many mysteries. 
In the canon, he was one of the four emperors who somehow had connections with celestial dragons, even with the identity of a pirate. In case you didn't know, I'm Shanks. Nice to meet you, said Shanks as he held his hand out to Smoker. Well duh. Maynard rolled his eyes, which Shanks chuckled at. Smoker couldn't help but crack an amused smile. I used to be a marine in the past. What's with this hospitality? Well, you don't seem like a bad guy to me. Shanks laughed before taking a serious turn. But regardless of that, I came to talk with you. Shanks, biologically a celestial dragon with the surname of Figerland. In terms of status, currently a notorious pirate who leads his red hair pirates. In terms of history, he was an apprentice of none other than Gold D. Roger himself, the pirate king who was considered to pose the biggest threat to the world. In other words, he had connections with most of the behemoths in this world. And that means that he may be one of the most knowledgeable fellows in terms of the current state of the world. Smoker narrowed his eyes to talk about what? About? Shanks sighed as he sat on the grassy plain, before saying, The devil fruit that we recently discovered to be in the process of being transported by CP0 agents. Gum gum fruit, rubber rubber fruit. Get to the point. I don't have much time. Shanks' expression darkened, collecting his thoughts. Then, he resumed talking with a sigh. Let me tell you, Shanks looked at Smoker with a grimace, about one big secret of that devil fruit. One that the world government fears and desires simultaneously. Water 7 what the hell, mumbled Aramaki as his eyes twitched in annoyance. Watching at the coast of Water 7 were Aramaki, Senor Pink and Robin. They watched as numerous marine warships sailed toward the island with their cannons open and ready to fire. Chelop lying on the ground near them beaten up to a pulp was Spandam, crying relentlessly. Unfortunately, none among the trio gave attention to him. This... Isn't good, exclaimed Robin as she stared at one particular individual at the frontmost marine warship, Fleet Admiral Sakazuki, one who used to be called a Kanu in the past. Why would the marine spend this much effort for the three of us? Robin felt a cold sweat on her back as she remembered what that man had done to Ahara. Her hands trembled unknowingly to her, engulfed by her trauma. Damn it, Aramaki cursed, before sighing. He ran his fingers through his head to calm himself down, before talking to Senor Pink. Yo, Pink, you mastered Geppo, right? Senor Pink raised an eyebrow, like ages ago. What else would you expect from a true man? Aramaki snorted. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Can't care much about what you say right now. Narrowing his eyes at Sakazuki who glared at him with his arms crossed, Aramaki said, Get Robin and that wimp over there out of this place. Smoker Sans Group Sans Smoker San is coming this way, so locate them in the middle of the ocean and change the direction. You're here. As Robin stood petrified, unable to focus on the conversation, Senor Pink frowned, confused. What about you then? Aramaki grinned as he massaged his neck. I've been itching for a proper fight for a while. Aramaki couldn't finish his words as at the next moment, boom boom boom. They saw the marine warships firing multiple rounds of cannonballs into the sky, even though there were millions of inhabitants who didn't evacuate to safety. Sakazuki's facial expression didn't change. With a cold stare that did not contain a shred of emotion, he saw that the cannonballs didn't manage to land on the island. The clouds of smoke arose as cannonballs hit. Then, as the clouds cleared, huff huff are you insane? The damaged and burnt trees, vines, and all sorts of plants were found hovering above the island. They, formed by Aramaki in an instant through the use of his maximum capacity, successfully absorbed the impact of the cannonballs. Aramaki shouted angrily, there are people living here, unrelated to us. How can you call yourselves justice after doing this? If it is a sacrifice necessary to purge the evil such as yourself, I will gladly do so, whispered Sakazuki, which didn't reach Aramaki's ears. As Aramaki glared at Sakazuki, he simply directed his hand forth. Boom boom boom. Aramaki watched as the second round of cannonballs came flying. Ha! Huh. As Aramaki snorted in disbelief, Robin opened her mouth and said in a shaky tone, He knows that you won't let them get to this island. He is using your morality against you. Sakazuki believed that capturing Aramaki was more important than the lives of people in Water 7, Robin came to deduce. Furthermore, Robin estimated that he may be thinking that there is a connection between Tom and them. It's our miscalculation, whispered Robin just as Aramaki blasted forth numerous pieces of wood from his arms. 
that struck each and every one of the cannonballs, causing them to explode midair without harming anyone. The reason why the three of them weren't afraid of having their whereabouts leaked was because they were mingling in the crowd of innocent people. They believed that even if forces from the Marine and World Government came, they would be on a small scale to avoid harm to those who were not involved, or that they wouldn't go to an extent of willingly hurting the citizens. However, what came instead was a blatant buster call that wasn't afraid to kill the commoners. Bastard, Aramaki growled, before saying to Senor Pink, run. This may be an opportunity for them, but that doesn't mean we can give up ours. Senor Pink, with a grim expression, gazed at Robin who was drenched in sweat, and K Kai A R W wait and spanned one s stop fiery spandum, who was screaming at his might as fear took over him. Senor Pink then snorted, causing Aramaki to frown questioningly. Then, Senor Pink slapped Robin on the cheek, causing her to fall to the side. Wake the hell up, girl, till when will you be standing there stupidly? Robin, holding her cheek that stun, looked at Senor Pink. Who snarled at her. Listen. Senor Pink pointed his finger at Spandam who was cowering. Take that guy and leave this island. Find that ship of our peeps that's coming here. You know Geppo better than me anyway. I I Robin's eyes shook as her brain rapidly searched for the most optimal solution in this scenario. However, Senor Pink then yelled. Go Robin jolted up before grabbing Spandam by the back of his shirt. Though the latter was bigger than her in size. Her years of training enabled her to lift him up just fine. She then began running away from the site by Geppo, which Sakazuki noticed. Do you think I will allow that? Sakazuki's arm began bubbling in a dense magma that sprouted out instantly. Feeling the heat all the way back from the coast, Aramaki said to Senor Pink, Faka, why didn't you leave as I told you? Senor Pink smirked as he adjusted his sunglasses, cause that's impossible. Aramaki grinned even while sweating profusely. Subsequently, Sakazuki fired numerous clusters of dense magma into the sky, meteor volcano. Splash! Robin, gritting her teeth, barely managed to dodge the first cluster of magma. Said magma fell into the water, generating a steam that is capable of causing severe burns upon contact. Boom! Dodging the second magma cluster, Robin continued to exert Geppo at her full might. Spandam, who's gone unconscious and was dangling on the third arm that she sprouted on her back was of no concern to her at the current moment. After all, there still were many magma clusters that were coming her way, resilient wood. At the next moment Aramaki's right arm turned into numerous trees that grew so tall that they covered up the space between Robin and magma clusters. Upon collision, the woods burned and cracked, but none of them fell onto Robin, allowing her to pass through safely. Meanwhile, Senor Pink was found stomping his foot on the ground, generating a crack on it. Rawaya. Senor Pink let out a war cry as he grabbed the crack and pulled it up. His muscles bulged up, and shockingly to many, the huge chunk of ground broke off from the rest, and was now held by Senor Pink, which he threw at Sakazuki. Boom. The fist of magma shot through the chunk of ground, instantly destroying countless pieces that fell into the ocean. Very well, Sakazuki stated coldly, directing eyes from Robin to Aramaki and Senor Pink, you will be constrained first before that girl. Huff huff leave him to me, said Aramaki to Senor Pink. You make sure that none of those ships go after Robin or civilians behind. Hey, not one of them will get past, you hear, replied Senor Pink. Then, two men dashed from their positions to the sea where Sakazuki and his marine soldiers awaited, with nothing but an intent to protect with all that they had. One week ago the reluctant, Dragon stated, Dragon slammed his hand on top of a round table. Around the table sat a vank of Kuma. Sengoku, Suru, Smoker, and last but not least, Garp who was holding a rice cracker party with Kuzan by the side. Smoker didn't speak out in particular, but continued listening as Dragon opened his mouth once more, questioned Suru. Dragon, as if having expected a question, replied. Sengoku murmured, Dragon held a baton, and pointed it at a rough map by the side. As everyone's eyes were locked onto the map, he said, Dragon's eyes narrowed as he stared at the drawing of Sabadi Archipelago in particular, cut the major food supplies that are being transported to Meriadjoa. Whispering to himself, Smoker then asked, 
When I was down this time around, I eavesdropped confidential information from a CP8 agent that I came across. It contained information regarding the approved plan to screw up the shipwright Tom's showcase of his sea train under development. The reason for them doing this is to check if Tom does possess the rumored blueprint of the ancient weapon, Pluton. He gazed at Water 7 on the map, Dragon closed his eyes to think. Then, he answered in sync with Sengoku and Tsuru, said Sengoku. Ask Kuma. Softly, said Dragon, in response to that, Kuzan, who was busy chugging down a load of rice crackers, spoke up all of a sudden. He, with a confident grin, then exclaimed loudly, refuted Sengoku, to which Kuzan shrugged in return. Aramaki and Senor Pink watched in shock as Sakazuki's fist which was boiling in a hot magma, sat in front of them. Between said fist and them lied a familiar man letting out a cold breath. You haven't changed at all since then, Sakazuki. Kuzan, whose left hand was holding onto an evidently confused Robin, who wondered why she was back at the site all of a sudden, was countering Sakazuki's magma enhanced fist with his ice covered hand. Add me one marine soldier was about to let out a shock filled shout, but quickly covered his mouth. Kuzan, Vice Admiral Bonga, a tall man with thick nose hairs that protruded out of his nostrils, grimaced. ESSSS the loads of steam flew off as the constant supplies of magma and ice endlessly collided against one another. From the heat alone, Robin, Aromaki, and Senor Pink had to shield their faces. And unknown to them, the unconscious spandam nearby was slowly being cooked. Traitor. Sakazuki growled coldly and Kuzan returned with an equally cold expression of his own. Not going to lie, that was a close call, said Kuzan dryly. I stayed far away from here to ensure that no observation Haki detects me, and then I see the magma made meteors raining down from the distant sky like holy fuck. Do you think your presence will make a difference? We've never tested who's the better one among the two of us. Have we? Snorted Kuzan, Sakazuki Senpai. Two individuals were skidded back from each other as they simultaneously expelled a greater burst of their respective elements. Staring Kuzan in a mix of anger and cautiousness, Sakazuki's entire body began to bubble in magma. Letting go of Robin, Kuzan's surroundings became extremely cold, causing his breath to become visible to the eye. Quickly manifesting his ability, Aramaki covered Robin. Senor Pink, and spanned him with vines that grew out from his body. Then, he evacuated to a distance away, while shielding them against the gunfires of the surrounding marines. Don't let them escape especially the Green Bull Aramaki shouted Vice Admiral Doberman, knowing that the battle between the suddenly appeared Kuzan and Sakazuki was out of their control. Hold your position and fire. Bang, 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 ECH, Aramaki who was in a state of exhaustion, frowned as he quickly formed a hard wood made dome around them. Bang, bang. The wooden dome shook as it received blows, but nonetheless sustained although Aromaki was clearly drenched in a sweat inside. Watching those acts of marines from the outside, Kuzan scratched the back of his head. Then, he mumbled to himself, it should be about time. No. Sakazuki caught onto that. What do you mean by all marines froze as Sakazuki's mini Den Den Mushi? The Den Den Mushi that directly connects to the Fleet Admiral of Marines. The only ones capable of such a feat were elders, spoke Sakazuki with a deep frown. I beg your pardon, let's see. Kuzan opened his hand and began counting. While we are here, wasting our time in the nearby sea of Sabaudi Archipelago, the ones who targeting the supply ships are Gupsan, Dragon, Evankov, Kuma, and, hum, shifting his eyes at Sakazuki, Kuzan made a cocky smile. Should we let you folks leave, Sakazuki? Sakazuki's eyes trembled unknown to himself, as he came to realize that it was him who was trapped in Water 7 now. Hina and Bastille, in addition to Kuzan's watch on Water 7. Those in Sabaudi Archipelago should be fine, even if they are to encounter the Five Elders. Though the deaths of Sifopole agents by Bullet's abrupt appearance were unaccounted for, it technically led to yet another advantage for us to take. An abrupt yet huge and simultaneous attack by the Revolutionary Army and former Marines was what they ultimately planned out from the start. It was in the middle of this situation that Smoker decided to travel underwater and engage in a fight against Douglas Bullet and he knew that he had to return fast. As Smoker returned his attention back to reality and focused on Shank's words, Maynard was busy trying to process his confusion. Devil Fruit, one that world government fears. Gum Gum Fruit is peculiar, spoke Shanks. It was recorded in the Devil Fruit Encyclopedia. Since approximately 800 years ago, 
as one of the weakest and the most basic fruits to ever exist. In other words, it was and is a fruit so weak that its users died without managing to awaken it. And, devil fruits are said to have souls of own or zone ones at the very least. But we're talking about Paramecia here, exclaimed Maynard. Souls of their own? Huh. Smoker, on the other hand, recalled how Hina attained her devil fruit. In addition, if he were to think of how he came to attain smoke smoke fruit, he did believe that the chance of devil fruits having wills of their own was definitely possible. Shanks, staring at Maynard in seriousness, said in a low voice, unknown to the public, the true name of this fruit is human human fruit model. Nika. Human zone wait. What, Nika? Maynard, out of a sense of familiarity, squinted his eyes. You mean that belief about the warrior of freedom, who will save the slaves and all that? Without answering Maynard, Shanks shifted his eyes at Smoker. Isn't it strange? The mysteriousness of devil fruits, where did they come from? In what process does the acquisition of power happen following the consumption? Why does it taste awful? Why is it that a person can't eat more than one fruit? Smoker was already aware of Gum Gum Fruit's identity. He read it in the manga after all. However, he could tell that what Shanks was going to speak from here on was something that even he was unaware of. In the past, I was an apprentice in Pirate King Goldie Rogers crew. At one point, we traveled the world deciphering all the poneglyphs that we could find to reach the final island in the Grand Line, Laugh Tale. And they recorded the shocking information about how advanced the ancient kingdom was in terms of scientific technologies to an extent where they were able to conduct the artificial synthesis of so-called god fruits. Smoker's eyes narrowed. Artificial. Smile. Not knowing what is in Smoker's mind, Shanks held three fingers out. In this world, there only existed three fruits termed god fruits in the long past. They were said to be found only by the ones worthy of them and upon consumption. Grant them the mystical powers unlike any other. Based on the abilities that those chosen individuals received, the ancient civilization personified the images of gods that embodied the following ideals. Freedom, peace, and order. And the most recently discovered from among the three of them is none other than gum gum fruit, which was eaten during the void century by one man called Joy Boy. From what was mentioned by the Poneglyphs, he, through his rubber-like power and seemingly limitless stamina, developed numerous followers who considered him the god of freedom and the sun. The true name of Joy Boy was none other than Nika. EFFF. Yeah, as if, snorted Maynard, before he paused upon noticing Shank's seriousness. A. Nika. The first to ever awaken the full potential of the fruit that no one ever knew was possible. It was only after the creation of devil fruits that they managed to learn that something called the awakening existed. Shanks said to Smoker, And why do you think I'm telling this to you? Smoker raised an eyebrow. You said that CP0 is transporting gum gum fruit. Yes, and the truth is, I haven't told you the full story. Nodded Shanks as he took a deep breath before sowing. The CP0 guarded transportation of gum gum fruit was hijacked by the beast pirates of Kaidu of the Beast around a week ago. What? Upon hearing that, Smoker found himself losing his calm for the first time. Any information regarding the gum gum fruit is and should be the top confidential information for the five elders to conceal. In accordance to it, the information regarding gum gum fruit was something that even Dragon's revolutionary army was unable to gain. Yet, here was Red Hair Shanks who managed to attain this piece of information as the status of a pirate. Before all else, Smoker couldn't help but sharpen his eyes. Who are you? Red Hair Shanks. Smoker did have a thought of it in the past. If Shanks steals gum gum fruit as he does it in the cannon, and if Luffy is no longer in Fuchsia Village, then what will be the fate of the fruit? With such a thought, he always looked for any evidence that could tell him when the gum gum fruit would be discovered by the world government. However, all his attempts ended in failure, just for Shanks to resolve all his inquiries in one instance. Da ha I knew you'd ask that. Shanks made a bittersweet smile. He then looked up at the sky and said, Let's just say that I have a connection with a celestial dragon a tad more humane than the others. Celestial dragon. Smoker's eyes narrowed, but he didn't say any more. Instead, he processed his thoughts. If Kaidu stole the fruit instead of Shanks, to whom will he use it to Yamato? Smoker recalled that Kaidu held a curiosity over Joy Boy. Though he wondered where Kaidu managed to hear the name Joy Boy from, 
What mattered was the fact that Kaido probably figured out the connection between Gum Gum Fruit and Joy Boy. This brought two possibilities. 1. Kaido managed to attain a way to read Poneglyphs. 2. Kaido heard this information from someone aware of this very few in this world. Either way, this meant Big Mom and Kaido aren't in a war against each other, proving Dragon's hunch to be true. And in addition, there was one more thing that irked Smoker. You said that there are three original fruits with each representing freedom, peace, or order, said Smoker to Shanks. God of Freedom, Nika, is also known as the God of the Sun. There are four gods that the civilizations of this world worship upon. Sun, rain, forest, and earth. If there are four elements yet three domains. As Maynard formed an O shape with his mouth, shocked by the fact that Smoker pointed out, Smoker asked, between the chance of there being a hidden fourth fruit, or one of the elements being based on nothing but people's imagination, which one is more likely? Shanks gave a slow nod with a complicated expression, I am well aware of this. The entire Pirate King's crew questioned this. However, in our journey, there never came the information regarding this mismatch, and the vice captain of the crew, Rayleigh, concluded based on this, that the fourth fruit must have been something so unusual and dangerous that even the ancient kingdom tried to hide it. It was a hunch from Smoker, but the moment he heard this from Shanks, a particular word from the One Piece canon came up in his mind, Dark Dark Fruit of Blackbeard Marshall D. Teach. Slowly but surely, Smoker's expression was getting more and more stoic. Kaidu, Big Mom, and Blackbeard all of them currently, how far away are they from One Piece? Beyond that, what exactly is One Piece in the first place? If One Piece is something dangerous enough to threaten the entire world TCH, Smoker stared at Shanks and said, You must be telling me this because Shanks nodded. So you also understand how dire the current situation is. Looking Smoker directly in the eye, Shanks spoke with confidence. Though I've only seen you for a brief moment, your feet don't lie about who you are. I know I'm certain that you are someone whom I can trust in this aspect. So please, White Hunter, let's save this world together. Without responding to Shanks, Smoker turned around and tapped the dazed Maynard on the shoulder. Maynard, we're going back now. Get ready. Ahead of them stood Den, who seemed to have finished the coating process of the boat. Watching as Smoker and Maynard left the island, Shanks grimaced. You haven't told them everything, have you? Coming out from the back was Ben Beckman, who was biting onto an unlit cigarette. No, he already has the world government to deal with, and now, Kaido to consider also because of me. If I were to add any more burden on top of that, I would feel like someone useless you know. Dahaha, Shanks lowered his gaze and stared at the grassy plain. The truth is, it was written that the ones who carved those messages on Poneglyphs were the Kazuki clan members of Wano. However, they simply were messengers of already compiled texts. The true authors of those Poneglyphs were none other than a mysterious man named Rox D. Zax. Rox D. Zax. Rox D. Zebek. The mystery involving Dark Dark Fruit one that Marshall D. Teach ate. And Marshall D. Teach if I remember correctly. Beckman, what was the name of Blackbird's ship again? Beckman, closing his eyes and thinking for a brief moment, immediately replied, Saber of Zebek. It may have been that Shanks was being paranoid. However, those connections suggested to him that Blackbeard he may know what One Piece is, was perhaps someone more dangerous than the world government. E-S-S-S-S-S-S. Water 7 was flooded with a vast volume of steam as the ice and magma endlessly clashed against one another. Sakazuki seemed to be in urgency, knowing that the critical supply lines heading to Meriujua were receiving an attack of their own. However, Kuzan's ability simply was the polar opposite of Sakazuki's, and he knew that this way of fighting may extend their fight up to a week even. Absolute justice crumbled under the order of his leash owners. The best solution that Sakazuki drew out of this was, do you wish this entire island to turn into an unlivable place, Kuzan? The extent of boiling magma around Sakazuki began to intensity. Kuzan noticed that the ground around Sakazuki began to wriggle. Don't tell me that you, you know very well what the awakened ability of mine does, don't you? The awakened ability of a loja type changes its environment to its most optimal state. For instance, the awakening of swamp swamp fruit turns the entire surroundings into a large, muddy swamp. If so, magma magma fruit turns the environment into volcanoes ones that consistently blast a flood of magma over and over until the entire civilization has been eradicated. Ah, 
You using the lives of the people here as hostages. The fleet admiral himself. Kuzan said in his coldest tone. For the greater good, don't make excuses. Red Dog unable to hold it back any longer. Kuzan stated with a rage-filled expression. Sakazuki closed his eyes, and on his face, a pang of guilt was present for a split second. However, as he opened his eyes back again, there was nothing but a cold gleam. My suggestion still stands, Kuzan. What will you do? Kuzan breathed out the icy breath as he glared at Sakazuki. After a while, he said, go. One week after, new world in one span of a day. The revolutionary and past marines, those who were rarely seen for the past four years, simultaneously revealed themselves. The casualties on the world government and marines were vast, ranging from numerous cipher poles to marines lost while trying to guard the supply lines. By big news Morgans who refused to listen to the orders of five elders. The news regarding this event was spread far and wide, and the entire newspaper had nothing but the specifics of all the events that happened within a day. The clash between White Hunter and two admirals. The obliteration of Cipher Pole agents by the sudden appearance of Demon Air. The defect of former Vice Admiral Maynard. The head front clash between the combined forces of revolutionary and former Marines versus the Marines led by Admiral Tokakik, followed by an utter defeat. The defeat of Demon Air by White Hunter. As evidenced by King Neptune of the Ryugu Kingdom, the world was busy talking about this shocking information, and people came to wonder if the tide was about to shift once more by the same man who changed the state of the world four years ago from now. I'm currently reading all these from a newspaper was Vice Admiral Dole currently, the commander of the Marine Base G-14 of New World. She, having been away four years ago during Smoker's fight in the Impel Down, has come to decide that remaining in Marine for a time being and collecting the information would be more helpful than leaving and aimlessly looking for Smoker and others once, whom she had no idea where they've gone to. Heh, seems like you've been busy as always, Smoker. Forming a light smile, Dole stood up and walked out of her office room. But if possible some attention to here, New World, would be nice. I mean, you didn't forget me, did you? For a New World, the outside view of the base was quiet and peaceful by far too much. You see, something is happening thought Doll as she gazed at the outside through the window. We have come to deduce that there is a high chance that Big Mom and Kaido are simply putting up the show. In addition, our information network is slowly being cut off. It took us three days to find that Whitebeard and Blackbeard have begun engaging themselves in a war against each other. World government and Marine were deteriorating, and the world was slowly falling into chaos. World government has gone many wrong feats. But these pirates come first, Dole thought, with a slight desperation in it. So please, come. Home sweet home Dara, exclaimed Bastille as he jumped out of the ship and landed on top of a soft cloud. Bouncing around in joy, he turned around and motioned others to take off also, come on. A fresh air Hina elevated. Landing next to Bastille was Hina, without any foolishness in her reserved movement. Oh let me go, you bastards ugh do you know who my father is her tied in a rope and held by the lazy looking cousin was Spandam, on the verge of urinating out of fear. Frowning in despise at Spandam, Aramaki, Robin, and Senor Pink bypassed Kuzan and landed on the cloudy platform. Kuzan took a glance at Spandam before saying, Arara, why don't you try to stay quiet for one second at the very least? And when I return, I will make sure to kill MMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMMM
And you also gotta be able to fly. I can't believe this. Forget the Sky Island, we've been looking at calm belts for years Maynard felt like an idiot. But nonetheless, Smoker motioned Maynard to follow with a grin. Come, I'll show you how nice our place is. Discarding this hollow feeling in him, Maynard put on an appreciative smile and began following Smoker. You've seen the awakened abilities of my devil fruit. As Maynard and Smoker walked by, Smoker said, The density of smoke changes in accordance with my will. It can phase through anyone, or it may prevent the entry of even the smallest grain you can see. Akin to a paramecia, a non-living object can be turned to a smoke at my will. Akin to a loger, the environment shifts such that the climate is in the most ideal condition for me to exert my full ability. Then there is the zone-like part that enhances my strength and regeneration, but that's irrelevant here. Stopping on the spot, Smoker said, You see, there is one more ability in this fruit of mine. Smoker's hair began to grow long and flutter against the blowing wind as he operated the awakened ability of his fruit. On his hand swirled the grey smoke, one that didn't seem any different than average smoke in Maynard's eyes. Swoosh. Then, before Maynard could perceive, Smoker slashed a light wound on Maynard's arm. Maynard, not bothered with the stinging pain, questioned Smoker. What are you doing Smoker's smoke slowly traveled and wrapped itself around Maynard's wound. Maynard then saw his wound slowly but surely closing up. This is yes, explained Smoker. The smoke when I'm in my awakened state has the capability to heal only. If I decide to do so, Maynard was left flabbergasted. He couldn't help but think if this isn't the power of God fruit, then what is? This healing factor not only applies to people, but also plants, you know. Smoker then grinned as he gazed at the distant cloud full of green plants, reminding Maynard of a farm. In other words, my smoke is one of the best fertilizers you can find. And if I wish, the clouds rain. If I wish, the clouds move such that the sunlight shines down on us. The biggest reason why we were able to stay hidden for the last four years, Smoker said, as they continued walking, was because we were self-sufficient. Maynard was left in awe. He looked to the left and right and saw numerous people, probably Marines and their former families, harvesting crops. As they passed by, they gave a nod of respect to Smoker, to which Smoker returned with his own. Maynard could feel it, the peace and happiness that emanated around this island as people mingled with their families and enjoyed their daily lives. If this isn't the utopia, then what is? Maynard couldn't help but mumble, and Smoker shook his head. This is just a temporary solution to keep our friends and families safe. There is no such thing as Utopia. Smoker. Just then, Smoker and Maynard heard someone's voice from behind. Turning around, they saw Drake. Drake, now 19 years old, fully grown to a height even taller than Smoker, seemed to be filled with nothing but an eagerness as he came to see his idol. You're finally back. How was the situation down there? I wonder. I saw Gutsan and Kuzan San leaving, and I heard from Tsuru San that the Revolutionary Army also joined. I was in a training routine by Zephyr Sensei. So good to see that you're more lively than ever, chuckled Smoker as he patted X Drake's back. Come. All your questions will be answered soon enough. And therefore, X Drake joined their group. Nice to meet you, Maynard. Right. I heard about you in the past. Ah, nice to meet you, Drake. Maynard asked warily. Who told you about me? Bastille did. He said that you're a loser. Maynard was deeply hurt but couldn't say anything against it. Smoker. Smoker's name was heard again, causing the three of them to come to a stop. This time around, it was three children who were running at Smoker like little monkeys. Ace. Luffy. Baby Five. Holding his arms wide open, he embraced Luffy and Baby Five as they jumped on him. Where have you gone to? Ace, who huffed with his arms crossed, complained at the back, you promised to teach me how to use that Sharusaru. Sorry you mean, commented Maynard. Ace immediately voiced his annoyance. Huh? Who are you? I'm Maya Loser whom Bastille mentioned, replied X Drake instead. Ooh, Ace then snorted. So you're that marinara guy? What has Bastille talked about me? Like seriously Maynard couldn't help but growl in frustration at this rate, promising a vengeance on Bastille for lowering his reputation to such an extent. Gah, won't you get off of me? You two on the other hand, Smoker said with a deadpan as Baby Five, and Luffy took over his arms and hung onto them like little monkeys. Nope, she 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 she. 
Wahaha, watching their heartfelt laughs and attachment to him, Smoker couldn't help but laugh along in the end. By the way, Cola has gone off looking for you three. Have you seen her yet? Ha, ah, I bet that that's a lie. Pouted Baby Five, she always goes to law. Haven't you seen that Ace then shouted impatiently? Anyway, answer me Smoker. When are you going to teach me? Smoker rolled his eyes, seriously. What's so hard about Soru? Just kick ground like ten times and it works. Ace stomped the cloudy platform in frustration. Ugh, that's not what I meant guys. Where have you gone off to then came along their caretaker? Ah, uh, Rosanante. Baby Five and Luffy shouted. Oh, Rosanante's eyes widened before he exclaimed brightly, Smoker san you're back. Hey Rosanante, lifting up the arm that Luffy was attaching himself to, Smoker waved at Rosanante. Just as it always has been, seems like everything has gone all fine. Smoker's smile became a little rigid upon hearing Rosanante's optimistic words, but he immediately concealed said crack in the expression. With a suddenly inflated group slightly overwhelming Maynard they headed to a slightly larger wooden building that sat in the middle of the island bore ha 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 dash suddenly. A huge burst of laughter was heard from the inside of the building, causing the group to sweat drop. What is Garpsen doing this time around Rosinante couldn't help but sigh. The children on the other hand paled up, having experienced Garp for a good amount of time by now. Baby Five and Luffy got off of Smoker's arms, and everyone started distancing themselves from him. Huh, what's happening? Maynard asked in confusion, before Smoker Garp suddenly broke through the fragile wooden door, and came and flying towards Smoker, with his huge fist ready to punch. Smoker, without any surprise in him, grinned as he threw a fist of his own, been a while, Gut Sensei. Boom. Everyone was knocked back as two fists collided against one another. Gramps has gone crazy screamed Luffy. UNN and shouted Baby Five. Before those two went running away. Ugly oh, wait, you two. Rosinante, groaning in fatigue, chased after them, much to others' pity. Why are they fighting? Cried Maynard. Because only Smoker can match Gutsan's craziness in this place. Hina sighs. Said Hina by Maynard's side all of a sudden, causing Maynard to jump with his heart momentarily having stopped. Gah, when did you come here? Hina dully gazed Maynard for a while, before commenting. You need to hone your observation, Haki. Maynard felt a dent in his pride. Maynard, driven away by the others, was currently settling down on the island. Smoker, on the other hand, was in a concealed room with Hina, Bastille, and Aramaki, sitting in union with Garp, Sengoku, Suru, Kuzan, Zephyr, and Momonga, ready to discuss and calculate their gains from their works this time around. At the center of them was a round table, which had a Den Den Mushi sitting on top. The Den Den Mushi, Currently in its active phase, relayed the voice from the other side. Scuffling noises were heard, before Dragon took over the Den Den Mushi. Said, Den Den Mushi gained a serious expression and a tattoo-like scar around its visage, resembling Dragon's appearance. Aramaki stared at Kuzan, who looked back at the former lazily. Groaning, Aramaki opened his mouth, Akainu arrived after we caught Spandam of CP9. We didn't get a chance to come in contact with Tom. We were about to die before Kuzan Sen appeared out of nowhere to save us. Afterward, Akainu received a call from those old fuckards and left. We waited for the Hina, Bastille, and Cola's ship to arrive and join them. Later on, Smoker Sen returned with Maynard Jude and we came back here. Done. Sakazuki is losing patience, I see. Quite an unexpected action from him. It is an evident sign that Marine is in a tough position currently. Sengoku pointed it out. Everyone's eyes were then focused on Smoker, who knew it was his time to speak. I fought Borsalino and Tensei. Hina and Bastille dealt with CP9 agents. Was about to head to the Water 7, before I learned from Maynard that bullet appeared out of nowhere, killed all the awaiting CPs, and headed to the Fishman Island. Judging that y'all should be fine, I headed down and stopped him. From this event, the Holy Knights will return to the Marriageoir. We've cut the supply lines, which means that if the world government doesn't broaden its security to secure the necessities in a few months, it may collapse beyond a return. After all, in a state where communication cannot be made, money loses its value. However, I believe that we still hold the advantage. If we can surround the red line and attack them two way from Paradise and New World, 
then they will be forced to divert their attention. Hold on there, I haven't finished yet. Redirecting the attention to himself and silencing Dragon, Smoker spoke what he learned from Shanks. Red hair Shanks. Though I have no way to discern whether the information was true or not, he revealed to me that gum gum fruit is the human human fruit. Model Nika. Nika Nika as in the warrior of freedom. Everyone expressed a shock. After all, Nika wasn't an unfamiliar name to them. And unknown to us, gum gum fruit was found and was under transportation by Cipherpoles. Impossible. How can a mere pirate crew know what we weren't able to learn? Sengoku whispered in suspicion. Gup snorted at that, you talk as if our information network is perfect. Sengoku. Gup casually pointed it out. The gum gum fruit and nicker thing was probably learned. While that red hair brat was in Roger's ship. Dragon mumbled, seemingly overwhelmed by the thought. Smoker continued in this state, and during the transportation, gum gum fruit was hijacked by the beast pirates. That's when the Den Den Mushi's eyes widened, showing Dragon's evident panic. What did you say? Without answering, Smoker continued, There is no way that someone of Roger's crew leaked the information to Kaidu. Kaidu should have been busy facing a war against Big Mom. What I drew from this was that Kaidu and Big Mom are acting, and that they, or Kaidu at the very least, may potentially have a way to decipher poneglyphs. Thanks to their efforts, the influence of the world government substantially weakened over the past four years. However, they at the same time ended up contributing to the growth of dangerous pirates in the New World 1 that the majority of people in the room realized just now. How close are they to One Piece now? No one in the room had a way of telling. However, we cannot afford to divert attention from the world government. They still stand as the more dangerous threats with mysteries that are unknown to us. Regardless, we must, Smoker stood up, I'm going to Wano. And thus, Smoker declared, everyone could feel, that after four years of peace, turmoil was about to rise once again. New world, whole cake island, whole cake island. It was the central island sitting in the middle of Toto land, which was currently ruled by Big Mom Charlotte Linlin, one of the three catastrophes. For the past four years, she was known by the public to be waging a war against Kaido of the Beast for an unknown reason. The world government speculated that underlying cause of the war was due to Big Mom's action to steal a copy of Kaido's road poneglyph during the latter's absence. To some extent, the world government wasn't wrong. Big Mom and Kaido were battling against one another with nothing but a rage for a year. Only, that is, Mayamamama. Linlin, sitting on her favorite seat huge enough to support her size and weight, was currently enjoying her favorite cake made by none other than Strusen, her executive chef. As her mouth greedily consumed the delicacy in front of her, her eyes revealed a glimpse of the past Charlotte Dudding. He was the man of Three-Eyed Tribe and the current husband of Linlin. In canon, in the year 1508, he was supposed to impregnate Linlin with Charlotte Pudding before losing his life at the hands of Linlin herself. However, a year-long experience of war brought a sudden miracle upon the man, and he gained the ability to decipher poneglyphs. Linlin was shocked, and then rejoiced. She quickly came to understand that it wasn't the time to fight Kaidu and waste resources. Therefore, Linlin herself approached Kaidu and made a deal with him, in return for taking a copy of Kaidu's road poneglyph. Linlin gave a copy of her own to him. Linlin said, Kaidu simply frowned. Linlin decided to reveal her card. Yesterday's enemy has become today's ally. Two catastrophes formed an alliance, and they used Dudding to read whatever poneglyphs they had in possession. There, they came to learn, they began moving. While throwing a performance to trick the world, they secretly attacked the civilization on top of a living giant elephant named Zanesha, Zu. The third poneglyph was attained, and now, they were only one road poneglyph away from reaching One Piece the greatest treasure of all. I swear after finishing her cake, Linlin murmured. I swear that I saw that in the Fishman Island. But when we checked that place a year ago or so, there was nothing meaning that someone must have taken it. And I know just the one who would do that. Linlin's eyes sharpened, Achoku, she has recently received intel that Achoku's group has recently begun a war against the White Bid Pirates. And she knew that now was the time to act. Mama, mama, but no need to rush. I will first enjoy the biggest tea party that will be held in history before the expedition to conquer the One Piece begins. However, with her guard down and her observation Haki not up, she failed to notice that there was a rat who managed to get his way into her home ground. Three poneglyphs and able to decipher. 
The name of this fearless man was unknown. What was important was the fact that he was one of the spies whom Achoku, whose other identity is the world's most influential underworld broker named Id, implanted in Linlin's rank far long in the past, when Big Mom Pirates was first established after Zebek's loss. A week after why didn't you intercept back then, Garp, sitting with a frown and expressing his concern was Sengoku, with a deep sigh. He said, it's Wayno that was speaking of Kaidu's lair. I am well aware that Smoker's strength has reached the level of an admiral, but a catastrophe is an entirely different case. Wohahaha! Expressing a clear amusement at Sengoku's words, Gup laughed, which seemed to have raised the annoyance in Sengoku. What are you laughing at? Your intuition has become dull. Sengoku, Gup softly replied as he gazed into the setting sun. Couldn't you see? That astounding growth in Smoker. We haven't had information on how strong the Kaidu became over the past years. And you are well aware of how bizarre Smoker's devil fruit is he hasn't awakened that fruit's full ability yet. In silence, Garp stared at his huge hand and tightened it into a fist. As he reminisced the past, his fist trembled slightly. I made a promise with him, Sengoku. If he were to pull off a win against me when I am at my full capability, I was to support him in whatever decision he were to make. Sengoku paused there. Six months ago, Garp and Smoker disappeared from the island, on their own. Then, two of them returned, severely injured, all of them wondered what happened, but decided not to ask out of respect for them. And today, Garp revealed, Smoker won against you. Wohahaha! Garp laughed, I'm such an amazing teacher, aren't I? I bet that Zephyr can't do what I managed to do. Sengoku found himself at the loss of words. His eyes then shifted to one edge of the island. Although he did not have good eyesight, he knew very well that at the current moment, Smoker should be Sengoku's body posture slouched as he let himself relax. Gazing at the horizon in a dull manner, he mumbled, is it really coming? Garp, the world that all of us wished for. With an equal seriousness, Garp said, of course, Sengoku. And it is inevitable. In the sunset, one silhouette was found moving through the cloudy platform. It was none other than Smoker who was holding a small sack as he walked. If you wish to do so, who are we to stop? Said Dragon back then, a journey by his own. Smoker didn't mind though, for he was expecting this from the start. But still, it sometimes is exhausting when I think of how much I had to do to reach this point, and how much more I must do to create a world that all of us dream for. Stopping in front of a moderate-sized wooden ship, Smoker thought. Yet, I told myself ever since that day, that I won't let myself lose against the fatigue. To achieve peace, I must persevere a cancer. The sun has set. Smoko raised his head and gazed at the stars that were sparkling above the sky. After making a nostalgic smile, Smoker lowered his head and began walking into the ship. Wait, stopping on his way, Smoker turned around. You guys. Hina, Bastille, Aramaki, Rosanate, Senor Pink, Robin, X Drake, and Maynard. The eight of them stood, each with a unique expression of his or her own. Smoker couldn't help but express his surprise at the sight, and Hina then frowned. Why are you leaving alone again, Smoker? Hina disapproves. Throughout the last four years, you've been going in and out by yourself, placing yourself in danger without anyone by your side, Dara. The steel growled. Aren't we your friends? Didn't you say that you'll rely on us? Why do you keep on acting alone? Even that last time when you went down to the Fishman Island. Did you know how afraid we were from the thought of losing you? Rahahaha Aramaki then grinned. No need to listen to these two scarity cats, Smoker San. But, he pointed a thumb at himself. There is no way you're leaving me out on this expedition. What do you mean scarity Dara? Huh? You want to have a go, wooden stick. Rahaha. Say that after you become strong enough to fight a Kanu in one versus one, weakling. Who are you calling weakling Gar? Calm down, Bastille. You're losing your mind again. Let me go, Rosanate, until I punch that guy in the face. I'm not going to be satisfied, Hina sighs. Ha! Huh. Watching as his friends began ranting him about trivial things, Smoker's heart began to warm up. Perhaps he reverted back to his old habit of trying to burden everything by himself, Smoker thought. With a smile, Smoker ended up asking, Then will you guys help me out? As if having waited for that response, everyone grinned back at him in confidence. Robin said, finally, We were waiting for you to say that, Smoker. The journey into the new world, for the purpose of investigating the circumstances in Wayno and the whereabouts of gum gum fruit, was about to start. 
Under the starry night, nine people the next generation of true Marinus boarded the ship in optimism and a speckle of excitement. Because even if they knew that the tide in front of them may be harsher than it has ever been, they had each other to rely on. At far back was Sengoku and Garp, sending the younger ones off with a toast. Make sure to come back in one piece all of you. Wahaha go and beat that fat dragon's ass. And thus, the ship left the drifting cloud toward the new world, signaling the start of a new chapter. You in a gruesome battlefield, Whitebeard Edward Newgate was found genuflecting, as he tried to calm his breath down. The blood continued flowing out of his wounds, and he knew that his life was almost over. The Whitebeard Pirates had lost in a war. Who are you? Newgate glared at the enigmatic individual. One who used to be his son in the past, Blackbeard Marshall D. Teach. Pops screaming in desperation at the back was Marco, who was trying to fly his way through the Blackbeard Pirates. Ones who were laughing to mock the fallen Whitebeard Pirates. Huff huff how is this possible? With her grip over her sword having become shaky, Whitey Bay was facing the wild slashes from numerous enemies all around. Jozu, Thatch, Vista, Izo, everyone, it was a total annihilation. Against the old legends, Achoku, John, Shiki, and Silver Axe, as well as the new faces including Shiyu and Caesar, Whitebeard pirates couldn't put up a fight. Currently, the alive executive members of Whitebeard Pirates were Newgate himself, Marco, Rikuyo, and herself Whitey Bay. And it was at this moment that Teacher's atmosphere suddenly shifted as he leaned down to the exhausted Whitebeard and whispered, Do you still not recognize me Newgate? Newgate's eyes widened. He, the strongest man in the world, felt a shiver down his spine. And... There was only one person in the world who could make him feel as such one who shouldn't have been alive. Zebek. Zehahaha the lightning crashed down, and the wind screeched as they blew wildly. Within this stormy weather Echo teaches maniacal laugh, and he shouted, Yes. T is I, Newgate I've come back from the dead standing up proud. Teach spread his arms wide open. Then, he remarked shrewdly, And I've been hiding under your nose for years. Do you know how sad I was to see how my previous first mate was unable to recognize me? I thought we were family. Family. Family Newgate, filled with rage, roared in his lungs. Don't you dare belittle me, Zebek. That's when Marco, Rakuyo, and Whitey Bay froze in absolute shock having heard a name that they weren't supposed to hear. And then, before Newgate could speak any longer, Ichoku, John, and Shiki stabbed him simultaneously. Staring down at Newgate coldly, Teach then snapped his fingers, we're doing it now. What is about to happen? Marco thought as he tried to fly over the persistent interruptions by Silver Axe and Caesar. A number of pirates closed in from the sides, holding onto a large piece of black cloth. Marco gritted his teeth as his heart thumped rapidly. He flew past the vile gases that tried to engulf him, toward where Newgate was, until Newgate, whose eyes sighted Marco, shouted with all his remaining strength, run Marco then, the black cloth was draped over Teach and Newgate, leaving Marco in despair of his own. Whitebeard pirates have fallen against the hands of Blackbeard pirates. Three days after above the thick layers of cloud, one wooden ship was found flying with a moving cloud platform of its own underneath it. This wooden ship, which is carrying Smoker and his group, successfully crossed the red line by hiding above the clouds as it flew around and avoided the direct flight above the Marriagewire. However, there was one thing that they failed to think of. Where the hell are we right now? Just as Senor Pink grumbled, they indeed didn't know where they were in the middle of the new world. After all, hiding above the cloud meant that they were also blinding themselves. Even worse, the new world ver. Log pose, strapped around his wrist, had all three needles spinning endlessly. At this point, Senor Pink couldn't help but shout, Everyone, listen carefully. We're officially lost in the middle of nowhere. Ha 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 in the middle of the new world sea that has momentarily calmed down. A man standing on top of a huge ship with a luxurious appearance was found laughing like there was no tomorrow. Look at this, folks at last, we're reaching our goal. This man was big worm guy too. The pirate wanted dead or alive for 230 million Beely mostly not for his strength, but rather for the cruel deeds that he committed. After years of sailing, he and his crew were finally close to the end of their journey. Kaidu-sama, don't you dare reject me when I kneel in front of you to become a part of Kaidu's crew. Anyway, to make sure. Turning around, Gaitu pointed at his navigator, 
Say our destination once more. The navigator dead end. Can we stop? We've been doing this for hours. Say IT, Hardress Rosa. That's right. Nodding vigorously, Gaitu began sprouting. Much to his navigator's face palm, Dressrosa O, oh, the land of weaklings unfit to belong in the new world. Speaking of peace and all that shit. Well, that changed around a year ago thanks to the almighty Kaidu-sama, who sent one of his all-stars to conquer the kingdom Kuuyin. Unable to hold back anymore, several members of the crew yelled, Shut up, W-Wa-Gaitu, with his eyes widened in disbelief, cried, What have I done for you to yell at me? The navigator groaned. He was about to say something in response. However, was cut off by another member who spoke up. Hey hey, why don't we all calm down? Captain, you quit with your endless shit talk. And others, show some respect to him. This man, being the vice captain of the crew, had a huge belly. He, no by the Dariki guy, rubbed his belly and said, Anyway, before we enter Dressrosa, let's have another accurate measurement of our strength. Physical strength only, you mean, grumbled the navigator. Forgetting the brief quarrel, Gaitu perked up. You mean that Dariki thing? No by was another reason why the crew was able to reach up to this point. By knowing their objective strength, they avoided and only faced those whom they believed to be weaker than them. Alrighty THEN Tilda Gaitu clenched his fist and punched it right into Nilbai's belly. With a grunt, Nilbai fell to the ground and said, 1020. The crew members gasped. I can't believe it Captain's Doriki passed four digits. Considering how an average soldier's Doriki is 10, our captain is amazing. Ahem, that's right all of you. Praise me more. Placing his hands on his waist, Gaitu raised his chin up proudly. Standing back up while rubbing the belly in pain, Nilbai said. All right next Nilbai couldn't finish his words, but freeze upon seeing something bizarre. What is that? Raising an eyebrow at Nilbai's sudden change in behavior, Gaitu turned around along with others and raised their heads up. They then saw a long wooden pole protruding out of the thick layer of cloud above. At the bottom of the pole, a huge eye was blinking, staring right exactly at them. Then, the wooden pole shrunk, disappearing back into the cloud. Devil Fruit Gaitu's eyes sharpened as he mumbled, who's above there? They haven't come all the way to the new world for nothing. Honed by years of experience, they were sufficient fighters ready to face anything that was to come in their way. They knew that in this sea, there was a high likelihood of a fight arising. They were pirates after all, and pirates take whatever they see fit. Do Doriki test later. What's important now is, Gaitu shouted, whether those people are stronger than us or not. From the sky right above the pirate crew, a much smaller wooden ship, sitting on top of a cloud platform that began to descend slowly, was seen. The patch of sea next to the pirate crew's ship was shadowed by the wooden ship's appearance. And eventually, as said wooden ship landed on the body of water, and the cloud platform disappeared with a puff, a girl. The first thing that Gaidu came to see was a girl with long straight black hair, who seemed to be around 16 in terms of age. Said girl, Robin, was staring back at them dully. And one of the pirates couldn't help but gulp, see Captain She's cute, gone was the cautiousness. Instead, there existed a vile excitement in them especially Nilbai, who was breathing rapidly with a vivid blush on his cheeks. Senor Pink and Aramaki, who were ignored by the pirates, shrugged at each other. Then, they saw Nilbai launching himself at Robin like an animal. See come to Papa, with a disgusted frown on her face, Robin kicked Nilbai in the balls, causing all men to wince. A kick falling to the deck of the wooden ship and holding his leaking balls, Nilbai said in the midst of his pain, to Ricky 450, to Ricky. Standing by the side was Rosanante, who seemed to have recognized the word, isn't that the unit that Sifa poles use to measure their physical strength? Measure physical strength. That's when Aramaki and Senor Pink turned, holding mischievous grins. Aramaki turned, Oi, everyone come and test out this new toy bam. The door that leads to the inside of the wooden ship was slammed open the next moment, before Bastille and Maynard revealed their huge forms hurriedly. Toy, what toy? It better be fun, bastard two of them seemed to be hungry for entertainment. Oh, you wait, and it was at this moment that Gaitu realized something. With his eyes locked onto Aramaki, isn't he green bull Aramaki? His face paled up, knowing full well that they were screwed. However, with his form having gone rigid along with his crew members in fear, they couldn't dare to speak even one word. Fuck 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 fuck. 
This fatso apparently measures, uh, do Dorara. Doriki you mean, Rosanante corrected Arumaki. Ah, uh, right, Doriki I mean. The steel and Maynard grinned knowingly in return. Oh, Doriki damn. I've always wanted to do this. Those superpole assholes. How come only they get to test out their strength? 450 only on the other hand, Robin stared at her hand in a blank expression. However, those who have known her for a while would have recognized right away that she was disappointed. And that wasn't the end. What's with all this ruckus? Hina can't sleep, then revealed a pink-haired lady. Hina. All pirates' eyes immediately shifted at her in awe, momentarily forgetting the fear in them. And Hina, noticing the eyes on her, snorted. Do you want Hina to pluck out your eyes? All pirates immediately diverted their eyes to the side. Aramaki then asked Hina, What about Drake and Smoker-san? Hina simply pointed her thumb at the back, just as the two of them revealed themselves from the open door. And it was at this moment that Gaitu, Nelbai, and all crew members' hearts stopped. White Hunter Smoker. There was no one in this sea who wouldn't recognize his face. I, I should have realized it when the ship was floating on the cloud. Gaitu's eyes trembled. But there was nothing he could do but wait for his fate in despair. This better be worthwhile. Grumbled X-Drake being unaware of the pirate's despair. Smoker, on the other hand, seemed to have woken up just now. Staring at the blank space, he blinked his eyes before looking around. I lowered us back to the sea. After you guys told me to do so, and where are we now? We got no idea. But, Senor Pink answered pointing at the pirate crew. They do. Huh. Walking up to the still fallen Nilbai, Aramaki lifted the obese man by the hair, not bothered by the pain that the former was in. He then stated, we think about that later. For now, let's measure Doriki. One by one, everyone gets to punch this dude once. Hina revealed a dark smile at that, now that sounds quite interesting. Me first Maynard immediately began moving, however, was quickly stopped by Bastille, who said, weaklings go first. We have to make sure that the fatso stays awake. Bastille turned to X-Drake by Smoker's side and said, Oi, Drake, you first Dara. What? X-Drake grew a tick mark on his forehead. If anything, you should go first Erg. Fine, I'll instead show you that I'm stronger than you walking up to where Nilbai stood. X-Drake rolled his right shoulder before slamming his fist right into the former's stomach. Nilbai groaned with his eyes closed tight, and his mouth automatically spoke to Ricky 810. X-Drake muttered, is that good or bad? Aramaki shrugged, you beat Robin at least. She got 450. Straight turned around and saw a black cloud raining down above Robin, who was staring down to the deck. Taking a seat next to Robin, Smoker reached for his pocket and took out a small notebook. Flipping through the pages, he said, I think I recognize you. Gaitu knew right away that Smoker was talking to him. He couldn't breathe properly as the infamous White Hunter's attention was locked on him. Ah yes, there it is. Big Worm Gaitu, the known fan of Kaidu of the Beast, and has received a substantial bounty because of the incident in the Dart League, a town in the West Blue Right. Smoker then frowned in a vivid rage as he stopped flipping through the pages, and Gaitu unconsciously shivered. You are that guy who decapitated the heads of all the civilians in the island, and displayed them by plucking them on the metal sticks. Do Doriki Huff Huff 2100, above 2000 very manly, said Senor Pink, liking his measurement. Rosanante then stepped up and punched with a sigh. Kirk Doriki 2020 Rosanante scratched his head, not caring much about the number. Just after he stepped back, Maynard then stepped in with a laugh. Ha ha ha. I was a vice admiral before you know. As he punched, the response from Nilbai was evidently different. His eyes became bloodshot, and a trickle of blood came down from his lips. In a shaky tone, he muttered in a hoarse voice out of instinct, Do Ricky 4500 hair. Maynard turned around and snickered at Bastille, who seemed to be in a confidence of his own. Oh, you have no idea Dara. Bastille stepped up and tightened his fist. Then, the atmosphere around him changed, and then Park. Warg Nilbai vomited blood, and his breathing stopped momentarily. After his body's function returned, he whispered, 8,200 watt. Maynard screamed, and Bastille laughed. Seems like someone wasted his past four years. Dara 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 Hina isn't as strong as Bastille in physical strength. Hina stepped up this time around, and punched as Maynard and Bastille began arguing against one another. Park. Nilbai's vision was spinning at this point. 
It seems that all functions have shut down in his brain except for one. The ability to measure Doriki. 5,600 all right Aromaki then pointed at his hand that was holding onto Nell Bai's hair. Oi, Drake, come hold this dude so that I can test out mine. Drake grumbled to himself but nonetheless complied. As he took hold of Nell Bai, Aramaki grinned as he clenched his fist. From his arms, the vines began to grow and reinforce no cheating dash before. They had to retract back as Bastille and Maynard roared at him. Aromaki clicked his tongue, TCH, fine. Then, without any hesitation, Aromaki proceeded to punch Nilbai. Boom. Nilbai's eyes whitened out. The wound on his stomach was vivid, bleeding profusely as his entire body trembled in pain. At last, his mouth opened, and words came out, 10,435 digits guided couldn't help but think how such a number was possible. The SSS and then, Smoker who was watching the scene, spread out the black smoke that encased the blood on the deck of the ship, and evaporated it, filling the air with the metallic scent of it. Smoker then stood up as all his friends' eyes turned to look at him. Is it my turn? With an impassive expression on his face, Smoker casually approached Nilbai. After briefly gazing at the obese pirate in a cold manner, Smoker then blasted a punch at the latter's wounded stomach. Boom. The tensile hair that Drake was holding onto was ripped off, and Nilbai was blasted away to the sky. The pirates watched in shock at what just happened, and with Nilbai gone from sight, Smoker asked. So, what's my Doriki? Snickering by the side, Hina replied, Zero. Way no boom. One step from a man with horns protruding out of his head was enough to rumble the floor as he stood up from his seat. Kaido of the Beast. One of the three catastrophes. More and more people have started to call him the strongest creature in the world recently, and such a title didn't seem to lie, as he stood proud in his huge, muscular, and frightening form. Currently, he had a frown on his face as he chugged down a bottle of sake before smashing it on the nearby wall. King. Then, this man shouted aggressively as he walked past a masked man with large black feathered wings on his back. King the Conflagration. When is Queen coming back? By tomorrow. According to what that fatter says, replied King, and Kaido growled. Lin Lin, you old hag, do you really think that I am stupid enough to believe in you? Kaido and Big Mom formed an alliance under the facade of war. However, their truce, having been born from a potential of seizing one piece through Big Mom's husband, meant that Big Mom was the superior one in their relationship. Frankly, Kaido hated this. You threaten me to send troops to continue faking a war, while you spend your own troops to take over Whitebird's territories. If not for Gra drunk and engulfed by his rage, Kaido began destroying his surroundings be it his servants, pirate goons, buildings, whatsoever. Then, he swayed in the middle of the ruin and sighed. Huh, but it is true that I was losing the war against her. Why, why? Why is IT that you get those children of yours, while I get these weaklings as my underlings? Kaido was desperate regardless of One Piece or the outside situation. What he wanted was the strength to dominate the world to open the greatest war, where he will face the epic death of a warrior. Being forced to join hands with Big Mom under the name of One Piece truly hurt his pride. Therefore, he decided to start a project. The Enhanced Warrior Project. Kaido grumbled. It better work as you said. Queen, I provided you everything you said you need be at the Tontata tribe or the biggest brain of the world, Dr. Vegabank. While world government was occupied, while Blackbeard's pirate alliance was busy dealing with Whitebeard pirates, and while Big Mom's attention lied on the opportunity to expand her force, Kaido was devising a plan of his own. Things won't go as you think, Lin Lin. You may think that taking over Whitebeard's lands will make you strong enough to completely subdue me. But it will be the exact opposite where Aurora laughing hysterically, Kaido dusted himself off and shouted, bring more sake King simply stood by the side without any response. On the other hands, the still alive underlings were simply cowering in fear. And all this was happening in Anigashima, the region of Wano that originally was the summit of Mount Fuji, prior to the Beast Pirates invasion. Dressrosa, I see, taken over by the Beast Pirates. I thought this was the world government affiliated country that we're talking of. This is simply the sign that the strength of world government has deteriorated to an extent where catastrophes began to disregard them. Queen the Plague, wait, I remember that guy. Wasn't he a scientist who used to study with Dr. Vegabank? With Gaitu pirates tied and disarmed, Smoker's group was chattering among one another. Smoker, sitting in the middle in a contemplation, then asked, a year passed since the invasion, you say, Gaitu, 
Full of fright, nodded frantically. Why yes, that's our right. By Queen the Plague. Smoker's face wrinkled up in anger. He gritted his teeth as his right hand was clenched tight into a fist. Huh, why would Queen, one of the All-Stars, have a time to come to the world government-affiliated island if Beast Pirates are in a war against Big Mom Pirates? Two truths could be drawn from this information. One, world government has no control and no eye in the new world. Two, Kaidu not only retrieved the gum gum fruit, but also attacked Dressrosa for something in particular. He is planning something. Standing up, Smoker walked up to the huge ship adjacent to the ship that belonged to his group. On the huge ship, the tied-up Gaitu and his crew members gazed at him in fear. Smoker simply pushed the huge ship away with his foot bringing said pirates to a confusion. He then said, I will go into the Dressrosa along with Maynard and draw the attention. Take the food supplies of these pirates. Head straight to Wano and infiltrate unnoticed. Gather the information regarding the size of Kaidu's forces and our potential allies, and find out what the hell Kaidu's planning about. Hina pointed at the pirates, and how should we deal with them? Smoker gazed at said pirates in silence. Gaitu's eyes widened before he pleaded, W wait. Haven't we told you everything Gaitu's voice was muffled as white smoke began to surround him and his terrified crew members. Eventually, the smoke completely engulfed them, and Smoker proceeded to flick his finger up. Everyone then watched as the cloud of smoke that contains all pirates in the scene, shot up into the air, before gradually becoming black in color, and boom presenting deaths by an explosion to the helpless pirates. As the remnant smoke from the explosion traveled up and joined the cloud above, there was no blood, no piece of flesh, nothing whatsoever. That works, chuckled Hina. In a serious expression, Smoker said, now that we are back on the track after having identified where we are at, we will proceed with the plan. Any question? Robin raised her hand up. After Smoker nodded in approval, she suggested, we will have to disguise ourselves upon entry to an extent where some of us may be unable to identify one another due to our lack of proficiency in observation haki. Therefore, I suggest that we form a code among ourselves. Good point, Rosanate agreed. Everyone looked at Smoker, who seemed to have lost his serious vibe. Smoker shrugged, sure. What do you want it to be? No one opened their mouth in response. In this situation, everyone heard a munching notice. They realized that someone, instead of paying attention, was busy eating instead. The steel. Really? Depp and Robin. W. What Dara? I was hungry. Sumachuk Bastille snorted X Drake to which Bastille growled at underneath his metal mask. Maynard squinted his eyes. What are you eating? Jude. In Bastille's hand was a food known as Onajiri. Upon noticing it, Smoker's eyes gleamed in an idea. And turning around, his eyes met Hina, who seemed to be thinking the same thing. There we go, mumbled Hina. Dressrosa. It was one of the original 20 kingdoms that founded the world government. Therefore, this kingdom was quite significant to an extent where its collapse can be attributed to the fault of the world government. A year ago, the world government had a choice either to send a reinforcement or not to aid Dressrosa's attempt to protect themselves from the beast pirates. In the end, they didn't, assuming that not only will it require a substantial amount of force to rescue the kingdom, but weakening Kaidu will end up helping Big Mom which they assumed will further tip the already tipped balance. As the result of it, Dressrosa was no longer the land of passion. The previous buildings were wrecked down and replaced by the dull-looking, metallic factories. The civilians, being treated as nothing different from slaves in Meriagwa, were imprisoned in those factories to work even children were of no exception. Huff Huff lifting up a gun part with frail arms was a young boy who had dark bags under his eyes. His withered clothes were stained with blood as he wobbled side to side. Seeing that he was slow in his work, a nearby watcher, wearing the standard uniform of beast pirates, roared as he harshly swung the whip in his hand, don't slack off. Kid move, the boy cried in pain as he fell down. His knees bled as they slammed against the hard ground, and his back received a gruesome gash. Eventually, the cry died down, and seeing that something was off, the Watcher approached the boy and inspected him. The Watcher then frowned before calling an adult civilian, who seemed full of exhaustion. Hey, you. The Watcher pointed at the fallen boy. Throw this corpse in the incinerator at the back. The civilian's eyes trembled in horror. 
He then closed his eyes tight as if trying to escape from the reality move dash before he winced as the roar was blasted right at him. He began moving his trembling body, forced to face the harsh truth that was unveiled in front of him. EFF ha 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 watching this miniature dystopia from the back was one man, one who laughed in amusement. He, sitting comfortably on a couch with a glass of wine in his hand, was the member of Beast Pirates tasked to take over Queen's job and manage the Dressrosa factory. Weaklings if anything, blame your weakness. Cheers to your incompetency. With vile eyes, this man with spiky red hair and equally red-colored eyes drank down the wine in the glass. He was one of the Tovaropo the six executive members of Beast Pirates whose statuses lied just under the three all-stars. To the world, he was known as Hibiki the Carnivore, wanted dead or alive for 415 million Beely. Hibiki-san then came in one member of Beast Pirates, ruining Hibiki's mood. Hibiki growled in displeasure, and said member, although gulping, continued, two strangers were sighted to have arrived out of nowhere. What should we do, and so what? Hibiki shouted, putting the goon to a stop, must I tell you what to do for every single thing? Paling up, the goon shook his head in nervousness, and no, we'll get them dealt with right away. Clicking his tongue in annoyance as the pirate quickly left, Hibiki sighed before reverting his eyes back to the tortures that beast pirates were inflicting onto the civilians of Dressrosa. Shortly, the matter spoken by the goon was forgotten, and the twisted joy returned back in him. EPFF and little did he know that this matter in which he ignored will be the one that will come back and bite him on. And so, here we are. Maynard gazed at the view in front of him with a grim expression. He mumbled, in the past, I heard how Dressrosa is a land full of passion. Its flower fields, mitre-looking battle colosseum, and the legend of fairies. Though I didn't get to visit here during my time under fleet at Sakazuki. It doesn't take much wit for me to know in front of Smoker and Maynard. There existed nothing but grey. Grey factories, grey gases, soils that lost their richness, and remnants of the old Dressrosa. That something is wrong here, Maynard sighed. He then turned towards Smoker, who impassively examined the situation around them. If one of the 20 countries that established world government is in a state like this, then what of much weaker ones at the next moment, a bullet suddenly came in flying toward Maynard. However, with an angered expression, Maynard caught the flying bullet with his huge hand. Shh, huh? One member of Beast Pirates who was holding a smoking pistol expressed his shock before Maynard threw the bullet right at him. With widened eyes, this individual fell to the ground with a bleeding hole right on his forehead. However, this pirate was simply one of many. Away from Smoker and Maynard, numerous members of Beast Pirates, all wearing the iconic demon-like black uniforms, revealed themselves with their respective weapons. They're simply two guys, while we are many one pirate standing among them shouted with a devious grin on him. Holding his blade up, he said, catching a bullet. In New World, anyone can do it. Don't let yourselves be intimidated, and said pirate's voice became smaller and smaller during his talk. His eyes wavered as they found Smoker. W. White Hunter. Boom. Then, Maynard, jumping all the way from Smoker's side to the group of Beast Pirates front, towered over them with his gigantic form. Having realized just how dangerous two enemies are, the Beast Pirates all froze on their spot, unable to move as Maynard's huge hand reached out for one pirate. You will tell me. Grabbing the frontmost pirate's face with his crushing grip and lifting him up, Maynard growled everything about what happened in this kingdom. Seems like Dressrosa is tightly guarded. For them to have located us this fast thought Smoker, as he watched Maynard's action, he should be fine by himself. Smoker directed his gaze at the distant building, before his body morphed into wisps of smoke. This smoke traveling and merging with the cloud of dark smoke that was fumed out of factories, sneaked its way into the central factory, that seemed bigger than others. Factories, arms. Kaidu is preparing for a war. The plan is to draw the attention. At the same time, he needs to ensure the safety of civilians. To do so, Smoker deduced that collecting information is a step required prior to the draw the attention phase. Silently, Smoker's body reformed at the dead bottom of the factory. Surrounded by crates, Smoker operated his observation haki. One, but negligible. Casually, Smoker began walking without making any sound. And now surprisingly, as he began to walk, he turned invisible from head to toe until he was completely gone from sight. 
The particles that compose me during my gaseous form reduce their sizes to an extent where there is enough gap for light to pass through instead of being scattered. It required an extremely fine control over the ability of smoke smoke fruit. However, for Smoker who achieved the nigh-perfect mastery over this fruit, this task was no longer impossible. Walking out of the corner, Smoker's eyes roamed over the civilians in tattered clothes. With their bruised bodies, they all partook a role in building firearms that were stored in crates. With a grimace, Smoker continued moving. Hey, you! One member of Beast Pirates then shouted with his whip lifted up high in the air. The person in which said pirate was glaring was none other than an elderly man who seemed nearly at the end of his life. Haven't I told you to move move, idiot huff huff, the elderly man, malnourished and scrawny, stared at the pirate. He didn't seem to have any energy to speak back. This world is all about strengths. And for you weaklings disobedience means death A. Eh? One woman suddenly entered the scene, standing between the pirate and the elderly man with her arms open. With disheveled pink hair and multiple bruises across her exposed skin, there was no doubt that she was one of these workers in the factory. Her body seemed to be trembling from the underlying fear, but her eyes firmly glared at the pirate. Do you have no shame? This woman gritted her teeth. He isn't in a state to work, can't you tell? P Princess, the elderly man, with widened eyes, whispered in a hoarse voice. He seemed to be trying to shake his head in denial, but his body didn't respond. Huh? Who are you to order me around, bitch? The pirate, obviously annoyed, didn't hesitate to slam his whip onto the woman except that the whip which he was holding onto was no longer existent except for the handle, which the pirate realized after swinging his arm. What? Turning around, the pirate saw that there was a trail of smoke in the air, one that seemed to resemble the shape of a whip. In panic, the pirate then looked to his left and right, as his left hand reached out for a pistol that was in a holster. However, he froze right after, as his eyes met another pair of eyes hazel-colored that gazed back at him. Thud. With whitened eyes and mouth foaming, this pirate fell down to the ground, unconscious. The pink-haired woman, elderly man, and many other civilians around them were rendered confused. What just Princess Scarlet one civilian quickly made her way and held the pink-haired woman's hand, Thank goodness I thought Scarlet. Smoker, still invisible, raised an eyebrow. Where have I read that name before again? It's got to be somewhere in the Dressrosa arc, but mom. Then, a small, pink-haired girl suddenly revealed herself from behind one machine and ran toward the woman named Scarlet. Smoker immediately realized Rebecca. Rebecca, go back into hiding right away. Scarlet cried. Have you forgotten what I told you, Scarlet? The woman who feigned his death to marry Kairos, who is civilian born, the daughter of King Riku Doldo III and mother of Rebecca. In the book, Scarlet died because of Don Quixote Pirates. But here, it seemed that Beast Pirate's invasion ended up revealing that she is alive and living. Then the question is, where are Riku and Kairos? Dead, captured and taken elsewhere. Smoker couldn't sense any presence that lacks malevolence, but is packed with sufficient strength. Nonetheless, one thing was certain. That Scarlet likely has all the information he needs. Huff cough cough, the elderly man suddenly coughed out blood, causing people nearby to flinch. Scarlet immediately leaned down with Rebecca next to her. Ronnie, the elderly man made a slight yet genuine smile Princess Scarlet. Cough, it seems that. His eyes were lingering on the trail of smoke above the unconscious pirate, one that began dispersing. The God of Justice did not leave us, and he spoke no more after that. The group of civilians who gathered were placed under silence, as the elderly man closed his eyes peacefully. However, the peace did not last for long, for the other pirates, who found the scene strange, began approaching the civilians. Ho! Oh, what is going on over there? Scarlet, with a pale expression, quickly stood up and looked at the approaching group of pirates. She looked down and saw that Rebecca was holding her leg tight with her body trembling. The other civilians too realized that they were in a tight situation. The approaching beast pirates saw the unconscious state of their crewmate. What the fuck one pirate growled as he stopped in front of said unconscious member. In anger, he drew a pistol from his holster and aimed it at the group of civilians who were slowly backing off. WHO did this. Smoker, standing right in between the group of civilians and a group of pirates, scratched the back of his head. In horror, the civilians backed off until their backs reached a wall. Pirates, numbering around 50 at minimum, seemed eager to draw blood. One pirate among the group then spoke up. 
How about we play a game? A game where one person dies every second until the culprit confesses. Then, abruptly, said Pirate Suede, expressing dizziness. Immediately after, his eyes whitened out and he flopped to the group, face first. Shh, huh? In confusion, pirates cried. In panic, they looked around their surroundings, only to see nothing. The civilians too had their eyes widened in shock, unable to believe that miracle happened once more. Fuckers. Then, out of nowhere, a man smoker's voice was heard. You disgust me. Pirates, engulfed by the fear of the unknown, began their retaliation against the invisible threat. W who is this guy? Where are you hiding, coward? Reveal yourself bang. Then, one pirate abruptly shot a bullet toward a civilian with a shaky grin on his face. It's got to be one of them. Did you think you can trick me? The bullet bizarrely slowed down during its flight, and by the time it was right in front of Scarlet, it was nothing but a harmless lump of white smoke. Thud. One pirate within the group then fell, much to the fear of other pirates. W hat. As if the souls left their bodies, the pirates, one by one, lost grip over their weapons and fell without any resistance. Shibiki san a pirate cried out as he shivered in terror. This cry garnered the attention of everyone in this factory. The aggressive voices of other pirates died down in an instant and all pirates who were monitoring the factory gathered around the scenery. The civilians were left bewildered. They had no idea what was going on. However, with a gulp, they gained a hope that perhaps this torturous life full of despair would change. The beast pirates, amounting to hundreds, placed themselves in a caution. With a bam, the door of the office within the factory was kicked open, and the man with spiky red hair, Hibiki the Carnivore, revealed himself with an annoyed expression on his face. And now, what the hell is going on? growled Hibiki as he made his way to the center of the scene. Smoker, on the other hand, was left in amusement for Hibiki stopped right in front of him. Hibiki-san, our crew members suddenly fell down without any attack. This all began ever since those civilians grouped up, so we thought this has to be their doing the pirate who explained the situation to Hibiki fell down, unconscious, giving a demonstration of what he just explained. Idiots. Hibiki Bart, before pointing his finger at Scarlet and other civilians. If that's the case, what are you doing? Kill them already why yes, Hibiki-san. The remaining pirates all complied with Hibiki's order, or they tried to. At the next second, their bodies suddenly became flaccid, and they fell on top of the already unconscious members of the beast pirates. Hibiki, even he was left in confusion about this phenomenon. Taking a step back, he revealed his sharp teeth. This isn't the feats of Conqueror's Haki. I couldn't and didn't sense anything. My observation Haki tells nothing either. So what even Hibiki couldn't think any further, as he felt a crushing sensation on his face. Although invisible, there surely was something in front of him, holding onto him. Carbon monoxide. Seems like a success. Eight. Then, in everyone's view, a man materialized. White-haired and hazel-eyed, it was within seconds that everyone managed to recognize who he is. White Hunter Hibiki's eyes widened as Smoker, holding onto the former's face, chuckled. This is... A huge volume of carbon monoxide was being directly injected into Hibiki's face from Smoker's palm. Hibiki's heart began to race. His vision started to get blurry. His head hurt. He knew that something was happening from Smoker's hand that was in contact with him, and he had to do something to get out of this situation. Gra. And therefore, he, before the situation worsened for him, morphed his body into a gigantic form of a Tyrannosaurus Rex, breaking through the ceiling of the factory and standing at his full might. Kaya, boom. One by one, the crumbles of the ceiling struck the ground below. Civilians quickly ducked and covered their heads, but in contrast to their worries, no harm was done to them thanks to the mystical white smoke that freely swam around and cushioned the falls of those crumbles. But that was that, and this was this. The mighty form of Hibiki as a T-Rex was enough to invoke a fear of death from civilians. They knew that his sharp teeth, gleaming against the sunlight, was sufficient enough to tear them apart with one bite. Two strangers Hibiki, having recovered from the effects of carbon monoxide, growled in this state, seemingly lamenting over his previous laziness, to think White Hunter will be here out of all places. But so what? Lifting his head, Hibiki roared. The entire factory tremored from the sheer force behind the roar, and civilians covered their ears in an attempt to protect them. Then, looking back down and glaring at Smoker, Hibiki formed a complacent grin. With this power that is personally given by Kaidu-san, I am invincible. Even you, 
White Hunter, are nothing but an average human in front of the ancient creature. The huge head of T-Rex descended at Smoker and the civilians behind him with its mouth wide open, revealing sharp teeth. In Grimace, Scarlet hugged Rebecca tight. The other civilians curled up and tried to pretend as if the threat in front of them didn't exist. In this state, Smoker was the sole one standing without any hint of fear whatsoever. Then, the T-Rex's agape mouth reached Smoker and engulfed him, with Smoker showing no resistance boom. There was a muffled noise of an explosion within T-Rex's mouth. T-Rex, e or Hibiki, then began bleeding from all the holes in his body, as his mouth was opened back up, emitting loads of smoke and Smoker who seemed unscathed. Hibiki then began falling toward his left as his body shrunk back into his normal, human form, and thud. Everyone was in a state of disbelief, for it took less than an hour for the lives of Dressrosa civilians to take a 180 degree turn by one man. What did you say? In a shaky tone, Dol, currently the Vice Admiral and the Commander of Marine Base G-14, spoke into the Den Den Mushi in front of her. Dr. Vegapunk disappeared. E-14 was a marine base that is located in proximity to Egghead, the island where Vegapunk has been dwelling for the past years. The fact that Vegapunk disappeared under their nose like that doll was shocked beyond belief. In a grimace, Doll eventually came to deduce. It must have been during that time when I temporarily left the base to investigate the clash between Big Mom Pirates and Beast Pirates in Winter Island. Ending the call, Doll collapsed into her seat. Massaging her forehead, she bit her lips. World government has completely let go of New World. They placed their full attention on the Revolutionary Army those who were responsible for cutting the food supplies into Marriagewar. With them holding the current Marines' top powerhouses in the bay, it is virtually impossible to stop catastrophes from wreaking havoc here. Sighing, Dol shifted her eyes toward a large map that was spread on a round table. Think, Dol. Although the validity hasn't been proved based on the intel that I managed to gather just three days ago, I know that it is no longer likely for Big Mom Pirates and Beast Pirates to still be at war against one another. Under the facade of war, they are preparing for something. Since Whitebeard Pirates and Pirate Alliance are in a full-out war against each other, it is unlikely for them to be involved in the abduction of Dr. Vegapunk. The reason for taking Dr. Vegapunk is to use his vast pool of knowledge for their own. The only noteworthy pirates who don't belong to any of the three catastrophes or pirate alliance in today's world are the red-haired pirates. But given their behavior as peace mains, it is highly unlikely for them to be involved in this case. If so, this leaves Big Mom and Kaidu. The reason why Dol was able to deduce that Big Mom and Kaidu were no longer fighting one another was because she found out how widespread Big Mom's force currently was, busily raiding and plundering the civilians. War required supplies and force, and it didn't make sense for Big Mom to be able to deploy so many outside of the war zone, while going toe-to-toe -to -toe against Beast Pirates. This also meant that Big Mom Pirates were easily tracked relative to Beast Pirates. In comparison to Kaidu's headstrong personality, the Beast Pirates were elusive. Furthermore, Egghead is nearby Wano. Based on this thought, Dol came to conclude among all possibilities, Kaidu is the most likely one to have taken Dr. Vegapunk. Dol found herself laughing dryly. So what if that was the case? What can she do? Fight against the strongest creature in the world. As if that's possible, she would get herself killed for nothing. But, the transmission to Marineford she gazed at the resting Den Den Mushy. For some reason, the transmission to Marineford has been cut off for quite some time. She deduced that there was a force that managed to catch onto the signal and intercept it. She came to think in certainty that these two are the doings of either the Big Mom Pirates or Beast Pirates. In silence, Dol stood up and looked at the outside through the window. She mumbled to herself, I feel as if standing in the eye of a storm. Just how many are suffering as we powerlessly enjoy the peace? How come the Marine has fallen to this extent? Dol reminisced. The training under the instructor Zephyr, the confidence that she felt, the pride that she had upon being called the future of Marine she found a hollow smile on her face. Only after coming to the new world did she realize that she was nothing but a frog in a well. I feel helpless as I do nothing but simply hope for your arrival, Smoker. Smoker, her friend who flipped the entire world four years ago. As time passed by, she gradually came to understand just what sort of feats he managed to achieve. A life worth risking for, she remembered. 
Smoker used to say this from time to time. What is life in the first place? Doll, she was born one day, grew up, and was trained to be a marine officer. She took the belief in justice to heart, simply because it was a doctrine taught to her since her adolescence. When she first joined the Marine, what was her dream? The reason to persevere through all those hardships that she's gone through. Dr. Vegapink is a noble man. He desires to use his intelligence for the good of the world. There are countless who were saved by him. Dole whispered, if his intelligence is used for the personal gains of pirates, the disasters that will follow as the result I can't imagine. It was against the logic, against the sense. Doll, who believed herself to be a logical woman, found her body shaking, as she came to realize what she was about to do. Beep. Doll pressed a button nearby, activating the emergency protocol. Live or die, I don't care anymore. Ah, the fall of mighty Hibiki the Carnivore, the dictator who knew no mercy, the torturer, the demon. He, Elisabello II, the current king of the Kingdom of Provence couldn't believe his eyes as the frightening T-Rex that ruled over Dressrosa was defeated within seconds. Elisabello's eyes wandered over the small figure far away from him. Smoker, a fellow with white hair and hazel-colored eyes, approximately two meters in terms of height, most importantly, known as White Hunter by the public. This moniker was given to him due to his striking resemblance with the folktale of Devil Hunter Dante the wanderer who was said to exist thousands of years ago. Once someone has become his target, be it a street thug or king, said target never survives. And those targets of Smoker all had one thing in common. They were legitimately the malevolent personnel who disrupt the peace of innocence. The rumor didn't lie, thought Elisabello as he slowly approached Smoker with an inexplicable expression. White Hunter, and he wasn't the only one. Numerous others, the kings, nobles, knights, all of them came towards Smoker. The remaining members of Beast Pirates couldn't do anything as the workers left their sights, for they were oppressed by Smoker's presence. W. -E. The truth is, this work site in Dressrosa consisted of not only the people in Dressrosa, but also those in other kingdoms and islands nearby. Initially, they, upon the invasion of Beast Pirates, decided to reach out to Dressrosa one of the original 20 kingdoms upon, noticing that no help was arriving from the world government. Upon their arrival, they were caught in the middle of yet another invasion in Dressrosa, resulting in the current state. At the loss of a word, Elisabello, without any pride as the king remaining in him, knelt in front of Smoker, and so did others. The tears began pouring out of his eyes as he opened his mouth. We my people died, and are still dying today. The world government neglected us, and we don't have any strength left in us to fight against those pirates. Those despicable pirates, they took everything from us, the lives of our loved ones, our belongings, everything all were gone in one day. It was a cry born out of sorrow. There was no hope left in us as we came to learn that even Dressrosa, one of the kingdoms that established the world government, was reduced to this state. We lived every day simply because our bodies moved, because our eyes opened the day after. Then then today, you came. Elisabello, he was known as the Fighting King. His strength was abnormal. Not only was he a strong one, but also an optimistic one. Or that's what he used to be. Now, with both his hands severed from his body, he developed a fearful and timid nature. Will there be tomorrow for us? With tears freely flowing out of his eyes, Elisabello asked on everyone's behalf. Everyone waited in silence, waiting for Smoker to respond. Smoker slowly looked around his surroundings, filled with those who were malnourished and exhausted. Closing his eyes, Smoker thought to himself, I suppose the moment I decided to investigate Kaidu, this was bound to happen. First, the facade of war against Big Mom Pirates. Second, the elusive yet bold act of attacking one of the 20 original kingdoms. Third, the action of stealing gum gum fruit which Smoker interpreted as Kaidu, having managed to attain a way to decipher the Poneglyphs, Kaidu of the Beast. To Smoker, he was the biggest threat that must be taken care of. Against the strongest creature. Ah, opening his eyes back up, Smoker spoke, do you wish for the food, the place to sleep in, the home that you can rest without a worry all those that you used to possess in the past, but were taken away by the pirates? Most importantly, Smoker's eyes flashed dangerously. Do you wish for revenge? Smoker knew that he wasn't a saint. In fact, he was far from it. He doesn't forgive anything that appears wrong in his eyes. Though he understands that nothing is absolute in this world. 
that doesn't mean that he won't tolerate what he can prevent. If someone kills or commits wrongs on innocent individuals, he or she shall be murdered countless times worse. Smoker considered himself a paradox, a lawful killer. Scarlet stopped breathing for a moment. In her eyes flashed the memories of her father, King Riku, and her husband, Kairos. Upon thinking about the doings of beast pirates, she found her face wrinkling up in rage that had accumulated over time. My Scarlet muttered, my family was captured and taken away. If if I can rescue them and she growled, make them pay for it. Clenching her hands, she said, I'd give my life for it. Revenge. Someone whispered. People's eyes widened as the option that they never considered possible was spoken out of Smoker's mouth. Slowly, the hope out of rage spread among them. One of the last remaining beast pirates, hiding behind Stash, gulped as he slowly dialed for a call through a Den Den Mushy in his grasp. Holding his hand over Den Den Mushy's mouth, he muffled out the noise that the snail generated. And finally, the one who responded on the other side to the pirate's surprise was Kaidu himself. A Kaidu Sana right now. In here, the pirate couldn't finish his words. At the next moment, a dense bullet of white smoke came in flying from the side and penetrated through his forehead. His eyes instantly became hollow, and the Den Den Mushy left his grip. Thud. It didn't take much for Kaidu to speak in confusion, as Den Den Mushy was gently surrounded by the stream of white smoke that brought it all the way to Smoker's grasp. Upon gaining the hold of the dial of Den Den Mushy, Smoker grinned. A Den Den Mushy. One civilian said questioningly. Smoker then spoke into the dial. This is Smoker speaking in Dressrosa. What? The facial expression of Den Den Mushy became stoic. Then, it revealed an anger as Kaidu shouted from the other side. Everyone's jaw dropped as they realized just who Smoker was talking with. One of the three catastrophes. The captain of Beast Pirates. The strongest creature in the world. And the past member of the legendary Rocks Pirates. A Kaidu. Elizabello, standing back up unconsciously took a step back as his body sweated profusely. Kaidu of the Beast, it was someone whom none of them could even fathom facing against. Were Aroro, yeah fuck you too. And unfazed by this man, Smoker snorted impassively. With a grin intact, Smoker cut Kaidu's sentence. I'm coming to kill you right now. So sit tight and wait, alright? Then, as Den Den Mushy began roaring loudly, Smoker casually ended the call. A bomb has been dropped. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.